I'm just going to read the, a, a statement before we open the inquiry and then we'll move to the swearing in. So don't take a moment. Okay, I'd like to officially open this inquiry and welcome everybody to it. Welcome to the second hearing for the inquiry into animal welfare policy in New South Wales. The inquiry was referred to this committee by the Minister for Agriculture and Western New South Wales and relates to the New South Wales Government's draft Animal Welfare Bill 2022. Before I commence, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which the Parliament sits. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from which all meeting participants join us today. I pay my respects to the elders, past, present, emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal people watching. Before we commence, I would like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. Today's hearing is being held virtually and in person and is being broadcast live via the Parliament's website. A transcript of today's hearing will be placed on the committee's website when it becomes available. In accordance with the broadcasting guidelines, media representatives are reminded that they must take responsibility for what they publish about the committee's proceedings. While parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses giving evidence today, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of their evidence at the hearing. I therefore urge witnesses to be careful about your comments you may make to the media or others after you complete your evidence. Committee hearings are not intended to provide a forum for people to make adverse reflections about others under the protection of parliamentary privilege. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. There may be some questions that a witness can only answer if they had more time or with certain documents to hand. In these circumstances, witnesses are advised that they can take a question on notice and provide an answer within 21 days of receipt of the transcript. I now welcome our first witnesses, um, according to the program. Uh, and I would ask each of you to uh, state your name, position, title, and swear either an oath or affirmation, starting with uh, Dr. Maastricht. Good morning. My name is Susan Maastricht. I'm the Director of Research Integrity and Ethics Administration at the University of Sydney. And I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Uh, Professor Bellov. Good morning, everyone. I'm Professor Kathy Bellov from the University of Sydney. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor Global Engagement and Professor of Comparative Genomics. Mm. And I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Professor Roche. Good morning. My name is Sven Rogge. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor Research at the University of New South Wales. Uh, I solemnly and sincerely truly declare and affirm that the evidence now given, about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Rohr, my apologies for pronunciation. I'll listen carefully. Good morning. I'm, <laughs> I'm Dr. Ted Rohr, um, Director of Research Ethics and Compliance Support at the University of New South Wales. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, do we have Professor Dunn? Thank you. Okay. I do have Professor Dunn on the schedule, but he doesn't appear to be available. Oh. Just here, Chair. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. On the camera. <laughs> There's something blocking me here from seeing that. My apologies, Professor Dunn, <laughs> please. Yes, I, I, I am Professor Kevin Dunn. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of Research and Professor of Geography at Western Sydney University. And I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Help me God. Thank you very much. Um, would would um, University of Sydney like to make an opening statement? Yes, please. 
Yes, so we would. Please thank you. Um, so thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Professor Kathy Belov, um, Professor of Comparative Genomics and Pro Vice Chancellor Global Engagement at the University of Sydney. I have extensive knowledge about animal welfare issues as a researcher working to protect Australia's unique native species, including the koala and Tasmanian devil. And Madam Chair, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for all the great work you're doing for our koalas. I'm joined by Dr. Susan Maastricht, the University's Director of Research Integrity and Ethics Administration. As we stated in our submission to the Committee on the Draft Animal Welfare Bill, the University of Sydney has a strong commitment to animal welfare and welcomes the opportunity to assist this inquiry. We have engaged with the Department of Primary Industries policy reform process since mid-2020. Today, we wish to reinforce the key points we have stressed in our submission on these reforms. These are, first, in the 1980s, New South Wales led the way in establishing legislation dedicated to protecting animal welfare in research and teaching. The proposed repeal of the Animal Research Act and its replacement with the Draft Animal Welfare Bill will dilute New South Wales' well-recognised standards and risk reducing community confidence in our approach to protecting animal welfare. Our preferred position is to retain the Animal Research Act, which aligns closely to international best practice approaches taken by many European countries. Second, we understand that the government's intention is to provide detail by regulation. If the committee endorses this approach, we're keen to work with the department on the detailed regulations. Animal research must have dedicated sections in the new Act and regulations, as is the case in other Australian jurisdictions. Third, animal research and teaching are currently um, more rigorously regulated than any of the other proposed activities given specific exemptions from prosecutions under the draft bill. The Animal Research Act embeds the Australian Code for the Care and Use of Animals for Scientific, for scientific Purposes. It sets whole of life animal welfare standards, respect and personal responsibility for animals, mm -hmm and supports the social licence given to those conducting animal research. Animal research requires a specific section in the draft bill. Otherwise, we fear that public confidence in research will be eroded. The University of Sydney has a long history of working with New South Wales government for the benefit of the community, including by delivering scientific findings that offer protection for humans, animals and the environment. We reiterate our commitment to animal welfare and care and urge the committee to carefully consider the merits of repealing the Animal Research Act. If the committee endorses the government's proposed approach to consolidation, we ask that it recommend to the government that it works with the university sector to develop specific animal research sections for inclusion in the draft bill and regulations. Thank you and we're happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, University of New South Wales. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Professor Sven Rogge, and I appear on behalf of the University of New South Wales in my capacity as Pro Vice Chancellor Research together with virtually Dr. Ted Rohr. Dr. Rohr is the Director of Research Ethics and Compliance Support and leads the Animal Care and Ethics team at UNSW. With this statement, we would like to outline the core points of our submission. First, the current animal welfare framework presented by the New South Wales Animal Welfare Act 1985 clearly articulates the expectations of which bodies conducting research involving animals operate and how regulatory bodies operate uh, to oversee compliance. It has been proven to be effective in maintaining a high level of animal welfare and allows for due diligence and appropriate parliamentary oversight. Second. The replacement of this act with a broad uh, draft animal welfare bill 2022 risks the loss of carefully established standards of regulation for animal research and progress that uh, produces outstanding results such as in significant advances in cancer research and development of COVID-19 vaccines and treatments. The animals undergoing procedures are subject to close monitoring using stringent veterinary and endpoint criteria to address animal welfare. All these aspects are considered by the Animal Ethics Committee on an individual project basis and are subject to close monitoring during the lifetime of the project. Third, the bill uh, 
proposes to delegate powers of the regulation to establish detailed um, details relating to animal research licensing schemes, including a role and function of the animal ethics committees, without any detail on what is and what, what this is and would look like. It is understood that this is to allow for flexibility in adjusting to emerging issues or changing evidence. However, there is considerable concern regarding these um, consequences to the consequences of these challenges in parliamentary oversight. Fourth and final. The University of New South Wales maintains a strong compliance framework amongst researchers using animals because of the power of the Act. The framework places penalties against non-compliance while encouraging self-regulation and how institutions encourage compliance and the uptake of uh, values in enshrining animal welfare considerations and all research involving animals covered by the Act. All these points um, towards the value of the current act and regulation as a tool for, for the research sector to lay the framework for animal welfare considerations and put us at the forefront of, animal, of the national but also international efforts uh, re re to uh, regulate animal welfare. Our uh, priority is to retain the current act and regulations to ensure high standards of animal welfare and a robust regulatory framework for animal research is maintained. Thank you, and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, and Professor Dunn from the University of Sydney, Western Sydney. Yes, th thank you very much, Catherine. Um, look, our view too is that the, uh, the current An Animal Research Act is effective and bespoke legislation. Um, its repeal could leave gaps in regulation that could undo what is what we perceive a very robust and effective animal protections that we have for research at the moment. Uh, without those, we think there is the risk of uh, unnecessary adverse events and unacceptable practice. And it is our view that the most straightforward way is not to repeal the Animal Research Act. However, if in the interests of consolidation um, the Act is repealed, then we have submitted that uh, we need substantive and detailed clauses uh, either in the Act, the merged Act, or in regulation um, uh, uh, so that uh, those important protocols are still covered. Um, our third point is that uh, we need close consultation with the university research sector on those um, regulations and other important relevant stakeholders. And our fourth point is that there are some key things that need to be in the merged bill or the regulations. The principle of the three R's for research, uh, key among them, but also clear guidance on the accreditation and licensing regime. Uh, and the like, and represent community representation, I think, as well. Uh, and our fifth point is that uh, that there be no gap, so that if there, when the when the when the uh, the, act, the bill becomes an act, that the regulations are in place, um, uh, and that there be no gap in cover. So, prefer no repeal, need the regs if you do. Consultation, please, on those. Um, there's a couple of key things that need to be in there, and no gap, please. Can I just, uh, I'll, I'll call Mr. Veach in a moment to ask a question, but am I understanding this correctly that the evidence is essentially it's not broken, doesn't need to be fixed? Everybody would agree with that. Okay, thank you. I'll ask um, Mr. Yeah. Veach. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think others are going to talk to you about the regulations, so I'm going to leave that to the others. Can I, uh, um, Professor Dunn, Western Sydney's university submission, if I can just quote from that, it says, uh, also under recognised research purposes, veterinary and behaviour so behavioural sciences have now been combined under and are listed as veterinary behaviour. This is alarming as it discounts a large portion of research pursuits that would routinely fall under the umbrella of veterinary and behavioural research. Um, clearly you're quite concerned by this. How does the, if, if this draft bill is to proceed, how could that be rectified? Um, and can you just give us some examples of why that is so alarming? Well, um, we would recommend an overt reference to research, um, I guess is the clearest way forward, and that uh, in the merged bill that um, much of the protocols that are in the Animal Research Act are present. But again, it goes back to our original proposition. If there's no repeal of the Animal Research Act, this is not an issue. Okay, and also in your submission, uh, you talk about the fact that, uh, in addition, the draft bill does not cover the conduct of animal research and teaching by accredited research institutions with ethical review and oversight by the AEC, which you view as a concern. Um, so, again, same, same question. Why is this a concern and how should it be rectified or how could it be remedied in the draft bill? 
Uh, well, inclusion of reference to the, the broader research that's undertaken in regard to animals, not just the university sector, but others, I guess, would be a key recommendation. Again, um, regulations could cover this sort of thing, I guess, but there needs to be a clear indication in the bill towards those regulations. Okay, and then my last question is to all of you before I hand over the chair to someone. Um, so you, you, what we're hearing is that uh, the current framework is, uh, my words, hunky-dory, uh, but it meets it's fit for purpose essentially. Um, but if there were failings in the current system, what are they? I might start with uh, Professor Roggi. I think I reiterate it's working well. If anything, um, the interpretation basically is left to the institution. Um, I don't think that's a failing. Um, there, there's a clear oversight in that. Uh, but sort of the local interpretation is a challenge, but I think we keep cope well with that. Okay. Yeah. Um, what about uh, Professor Bello? Yeah, I think um, we're actually world leading with our current Animal Research Act. I think it's quite clear and easy to follow. Um, I guess the only things that I would be thinking about in terms of potential changes is on the reporting. I think there are some issues with the way we report compared to the way others report um, that perhaps gives a sense that overinflates the number of animals we use in research. So for instance, we report on use of animals and that could be the number of bats flying past a camera or a number of chickens in a commercial hen yard, um, whereas others would only specifically report on biomedical research, on the number of mice or rats used in cages. So I think there are ways we can finesse that to better improve reporting and transparency of the types of work we do, perhaps by breaking it down into biomedical, wildlife, um, and and other types of research. But that's a detail, you know, I don't think that's particularly relevant for this conversation, but we'd be keen if there were refinements to the Act down the track to contribute to those and to help refine those. Yep. Professor Dunn? Um, that's a, I didn't come prepared with an answer on that question uh, today, uh, Mark, but the, oh, Mick, sorry, but the, I would think the, uh, the key thing is uh, to protect the cross-references to good practice and the code because um, that's the real strength here, is the cross-reference to the National Code. Um, as a practice, I generally like more regulation than legislation, because, you know, it's more adaptable. And so, you know, that's why Western are somewhat comfortable with regulation as a, as a response. Uh, and that might give some flexibility for the sector then to change and adapt. And it may well be the case that the Animal Research Act at the moment does fossilise practice to some extent. Um, and make it more difficult to make changes. And so we accept and concede that as, as, as one potential failing. However, it has not, to my mind, unreasonably fettered research in the university sector to date. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Mm, that question, thanks. Yes, the Honourable uh, Emma Hurst. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, we've talked a little bit about regulations and Professor Dunn, you just sort of touched on, on that then as well. Um, when we heard from New South Wales Farmers Federation and from other groups, there was concern about moving large parts of the Act to regulation because of uncertainty going forward and the fact that it is much easier obviously to change regulations than it is to change an Act um, and the, the fact that it doesn't have to go through both Houses of Parliament or, or a political party room. Um, are there concerns about certain parts of the Act becoming regulations and uncertainty going forward and things changing? Is that a question to me? Um, yeah. uh, everyone, so, yeah. Um, yes and no, of course. Um, the issue with uh, regulation as opposed to legislation, of course, is that it is uh, amenable to change, which in the research sector uh, would be a good thing where we need to adapt to cutting edge thinking um, the three R's generate new ways of reducing our need to use animals, refinement, etc., replacing the use of animals. And so there's lots of things that happen in science, which means um, we don't necessarily want to be fixed into certain forms of practice. Uh, however, then there's also the issue, though, that things can change in a way that might not be preferable and not, might not give certainty to the sector. Um, I guess that's a trade-off. Um, I think, in, for, speaking from a university 
where we would like to be see some adaptability to the science. Um, we're not overly concerned with regulations as long as they're well written. Does anybody? Ah, oh, yes, I see people online with their hands up. Um, I might go to uh, uh, Professor uh, Bolov. Thanks, Ms. Hurst. Look, I, I guess I disagree with that. I think to me, animal welfare is so crucial that we need to maintain and protect it the best way we can. And I think the best way to do that is to have it in the Act itself, have all the protections there to minimise um, the amount of changes that can happen through regulations with changing governments. We know that um, you know, big changes can come about through those minor changes in regulation. So I'd be wanting more of it in the Act rather than in the regulations to really clearly signal that the animals we use for research and teaching, animal welfare comes first and it really needs to be protected. Um, and, and Professor, while I've got you, you also talked about your concerns around um, the social licence. Um, being eroded, is that kind of related to too much of it being in regulations? Yeah, I think it's really critically important for the public to understand um, the strict regulations that we work under, the fact that we as universities take animal welfare really seriously and for us to be as transparent as possible. My worry is when, you know, the you know, the reference to research is woven through a large document, not clearly defined, you know, with words like exemptions listed around animal research. You know, people people might think that we're going to be less careful about the types of research that we do. So I think the more we can um, make it really clear for both our researchers and the general public about the seriousness the way that we take this work seriously, um, the better it'll be. Thank you. And Dr. Roy, I think you had your hand up as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think the, the Act is quite uh, overarching, displaying the operation of animal welfare guidance for universities. Um, the details are regularly reviewed in the Australian Code for the Use of Animals, um, and the Act is amended uh, accordingly. Um, so that is the flexibility that is needed is already implemented by reviewing the code on a regular basis with community input, research input, everyone, and that is then reflected in the legislation subsequently. So I think the flexibility is already there. Thank you. Just to briefly add, and I agree with my two colleagues that just spoke, my animal welfare, especially in the research setting, is extremely important to us. It's been 37 years since the Act. Research has evolved a lot, and we're still working very well with this Act. I think it's working well, even so we have change. I just wanted to drill down into this point. So I guess if we're looking at whether or not we have a standalone Act or we take this Act and try and um, we take the, the, the current Act and try and build it into this new bill, um, from what I understand from your submissions, there are, um, at the moment, the existing Act has been imperfectly built in to this bill. Um, but if it, I guess, is there a reason other than that that you prefer to have it in a standalone bill? Can you articulate, sorry, standalone Act, can you articulate why it's better left as a separate bit of legislation? Perhaps, perhaps I could <clears throat> make a comment about this. The, the Act as it stands at the moment, unlike other jurisdictions, is a singular Act to which we go directly. Mm -hmm. It's very clear. It's, there's, there's no misunderstanding about the fact that this is about animals that are involved in research. So that means that the way that we set up our systems and our processes is very well described. We know that the code is embedded in it. We know that the prescription is there about the constitution of ethics committees, the fact that we have community members and that one third of every committee, including subcommittees, must be category C and D members. This is our social license. These are the people that are telling us, yes, we agree that the research that you're conducting, you've been able to demonstrate that the use of the animals for that research has been justified because of the benefits that are going to come to humans, animals or the environment. This I think is quite unique. 
and it's a standout. It's a standout that other countries around the world have used for many, many years. Mm. And I think it would be a great pity to lose something which has served the welfare of animals in the research environment so well for so long. Thank you. Professor Robert? Um, I mean, if it were perfectly transplanted and still an act, I would have not a problem. It, it's really that fear that it works very well and any degradation of that is, is, is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. right? it's, it's really have it with parliamentary oversight in an act. If, if you would achieve that, we would be all forward. We would be willing to work with you. But it's a tall call because what has been built in the last 37 years is quite substantial. Mm -hmm. yeah. Understood. Thank you. Did anyone else want to? Oh, oh sorry. Sorry, you. I just wanted to check if the other um, witnesses wanted to add anything to that. Uh, yes, Professor Rolf. Yeah. Look, as as somebody who's been responsible for establishing and maintaining the compliance environments in this field, um, the Act has been very important in uh, having a solid framework for researchers and others involved in animal research. And it does take a lot of effort by the institutions to comply. So it is very important that there is a senior uh, piece of legislation that is really enabling us to maintain the compliance. Thank you. I might move to Mr. Vanessiak. Yeah, thank you. Just picking up on, I guess, some of the comments that have been made already and also Mr. Veach's comments. Um, the University of Sydney's uh, submission talks about how that the definition in the draft bill uh, for animal research um, sort of differs from the national code um, and it talks about how you know that it doesn't reflect the breadth of animal research conducted so I'm just interested to know like currently what would be some research as defined by that national code that would possibly fall foul if this bill was passed and that alignment didn't happen? Or, or, do you have any current examples of research that's being done that would not fit into that definition in the draft bill? With respect, I'd probably need to take that one on notice yeah, sure. and get you some information. Yeah, yeah, that, no, that would okay? be good. That was if they should each take it on notice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if yeah. you could each perhaps take it on notice in your respective universities, what, what would be some research that may fall, fall foul if there isn't that, that uh, alignment? I just wanted to ask about <clears throat> the system of ethics um, and its governance. I understand that there are international standards, but I don't know how they operate. Um, obviously, there's a national code. I don't know who's responsible for that and how these things fit into what actually happens in each ethics department. But my, I, am an, I am guessing that it's quite a complex, well-developed system that everybody has to be trained in before they can proceed. So I wondered if you could just actually give us an overview of that so that we can understand where the New South Wales legislation fits in and what role it plays. Okay. So when an institution decides that they would like in fact to undertake research involving animals then they have to go through the process of being accredited as a research establishment to use animals they may or may not also need to have a supplier's license who would do that accreditation that accreditation goes through to the animal research review panel and who who are they the animal research review panel are currently i guess the senior advisory governance panel that is sitting currently under the Animal Research Act and they work closely and are staffed by personnel within the DPI. Okay, so they're empowered. How does that fit into the National Code? Is that just something that, that that's, sits beside that's, it? That's been one of the things that's been established, I guess, to support the implementation of the Code. One of the things that the uh, that ARP has been able to deliver over the number of years it's been 
operating is not just all the licensing requirements, but it actually has provided advice to the minister. It's done, it's created the guidelines and the fact sheets and those sorts of things. It's helped the institutions to stay abreast of current um, uh, changes and developments in the sector. It's, it's also been responsible for reviewing the reports on inspections of facilities. So it's at, it fulfills a very significant role in terms of supporting institutions who are undertaking animal research. Who is responsible for the National Code? How is that? The National Code has been developed by the NHMRC, ARC, CSIRO and Universities Australia have all been involved in the development of it. It's been a code that's been around since maybe the, 19, the 1970s and it was developed in advance and there's been, we're now at the eighth edition so you can see it's the iteration that's happened over a period of time which is about learning more about what's needed for the welfare of animals in research and the code has been very prescriptive and it actually applies quite significantly in the way in which the act is implemented as well. So the two things work absolutely together in making sure so that the, the Act provides the legal setting and the responsibilities by law, but the Code provides the system that you need to follow, the, the, the standards that must apply if you are going to be undertaking animal research. And is the Code enacted by the Federal Parliament? It's a statutory instrument. It okay. would be, it's certainly included in all of the, incorporated into all of the legislations and noted as a code that will be referenced in all of the legislation across, uh, across Australia. Okay, so then in addition to that we have international standards and work and bodies. Yes, and the code would be the place that's responsive to what's going on globally? The reviews of the code have usually incorporated elements of the, in the international setting. So as things have been learned, that's what's happened. But I should remind you that in fact our legislation and the way that we did things go back to 1985 and it was of course in development prior to that. We set the standard and the world followed. Thank you. I just, um, I can see that uh, the regulation is actually a package of, of different components that are fitting together quite well at yes. the moment and that the sector feels it's operating well. Yeah. Yes, one of, one of the things that Kevin mentioned before was the three R's. So we're talking about um, reduction, replacement and refinement. So they're the three R's. They, were, they came out of a book that was written in the 1950s and it really set the scene for the way in which you should be um, uh, undertaking research. And I think that without those, the, the welfare of the animals in the research setting is, um, is not going to be as good without embracing that and the code embraces it and as a result so also does the legislation. Thank you very much for explaining how that works. Can I, can I just follow up as well? One of my questions was actually specifically about, about the three R's um, and I know that there was criticisms that it was only mentioned once in the objects of this new proposed bill um, and I know some of you felt that that wasn't sufficient um, and that the three R's should be playing a much larger role in, in any legislation. Um, and I know there's also discussion about a potential fourth R, which is the, the attempt to rehome animals as well. Um, do you feel that, you know, can you talk a little bit more about um, the three R's and, and what you would like to see, or even the fourth R, and what you would like to see included in the bill or the regulations around, around them? Can I do a personal wish list? Yes, please. <laughs> I would sincerely love it if, if in fact, um, aligned to the grants that are provided for people who are undertaking research, they were also given money to be able to look at how they could reduce the numbers of animals, how they could replace the animals that they're using, and how they could refine the processes. Um, I think if, we, if the granting bodies actually did that as well, we would move forward a great deal faster. So that's very personal um, commentary, but it's a really, I think, important one if we're going to move forward in that space effectively. Having said that, I know that UNSW now has a, a very substantial way of supporting people in looking at um, the three R's and alternatives to, um, to animals for research. We have our own three R's award program. We receive about five to ten 
applications every year, some extraordinary things that have come out of it, both for teaching and for research. So I think that there's a lot of movement about moving away from animals wherever we can. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, uh, Professor, you had your hand up as yeah, well. Susan gave me a nice shout out. So uh, it's extremely important to us and at UNSW we actually have an uh, internal grant scheme that's, that's open also to um, submissions from outside. Um, we put $250,000 towards basically improving the three R's, uh, replacement, reduction, refinement. And I want to add, it's not just the three R's, it's also the assessment of the scientific question, right? It's not just that, that you reduce. Like, it first has to be that the, the scientific outcome has to be really achievable, and then we look at the three R's, right? So it's, it's very important to the sector. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, and, and I've got another question for you, Professor, just um, because I, it also followed on from something that um, the Chair was asking as well. Um, because you noted in your submission that you'd also like to see the NHMRC Code and Animal Ethics Committee process enshrined in the bill. Um, and so, I'd like to hear about your, what you want to say about the three or fourth R, but um, also about enshrining the NHMRC and Animal Ethics Committee process. Oh, sure, Emma. Um, look, just reinforce again that, that Western Sydney University too, the three R's are very important to us, and uh, uh, we've uh, advanced, in fact, I think, and this is true across the Australian sector, we've uh, done world-leading attempts uh, at progressing the three R's. I think it's very impressive what Australia has done. Um, one instance at Western, one, one innovation is our brain incubator, which reduces the amount of tissue that we have to actually use. So it was a world-leading innovation um, that our team put together. But um, so, so it's high-level substance and content that needs to be in the act, uh, is, is our view. Uh, and, uh, and that goes also for the things that you just made reference to before. If there's, um, I know people made reference before to one of our concerns is that it's an imperfect integration at the moment. That is the case. If it was a perfect integration, well, it would be those sorts of cross-references, top-level substance that we, we want to see in the bill, not just the regulations in the Act. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that the Animal Research Act currently sits within the responsibilities of the Agriculture Minister. Do you think that's the most appropriate place for it to sit, or would you prefer it to be administered by a different minister? Mm. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Who do you think is the most appropriate I'll, I'll, minister? I'll mm. take a stab. I, I mean, I, I think the challenges are the, the ministries do change. We do have a minister for science now. Um, that wouldn't have been the case a couple of years ago. So, um, uh, yeah, I don't have a strong feeling, but um, I, I do think that the breadth of our research does cover everything from agricultural to biomedical to conservation and wildlife research and many others. So I think that that would be up for debate as to where it would be best placed. Mm. Thank you. Anyone else care to put a view? No. Okay. Can I just on that ask, how do you inter interact with the department at the moment? on these regulatory issues. Do you mean in terms of um, reporting? Um, uh, all of those things, but discussing the system that, that the evidence is that the system is working fine at the moment mm -hmm. in terms of interacting with New South Wales. Um, and I just wanted to understand what interacting is involved. Mm -hmm. I can so um, Mr. Raw, I think, yes. Yeah, look, um, so we're working closely with the Department of Primary Industries when it comes to um, uh, licensing, uh, the accreditation of the Animal Ethics Committee, the new members of Animal Ethics Committee, they are uh, accredited by the department. Um, and also, we're working closely with the department as they're inspecting, uh, conducting regular audits of the universities. Uh, very thorough audits um, that they're providing feedback on how our system is working. So is there an office in the department and is the person signing off on the accreditation perhaps the Director General of the department or the Secretary, I think is the term? There was some movement in the department recently. I'm not sure I would need to take that on notice. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, do you have a question? No, I think it sort of picks up from what um, 
both you and uh, Ms Boyd were saying, but does it really impact your, I guess, day-to-day -day operations, who, who, the, who the minister is? Um, no. No it's, no. it's the don't fix it and ain't broken yeah. category for us. So. Yeah. I haven't seen any demonstrations about it in Macquarie. So. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> don't give them a... <laughs> so I just, so I just Giving someone an idea. <laughs> Thank you, Ms Hurst. Um, I've just got one um, follow-up question about the, uh, a comment made in the submission by the University of Sydney. Um, you say you support retaining the requirement that animal research inspectors um, to, be, to be veterinary practitioners. Um, and another submission by Humane Research Australia highlighted that this requirement's caused problems in the past um, be because of the issues around actually recruiting and retaining vets. Um, and it's not just in this role. Um, I, this is across the board. We've got a major vet shortage throughout New South Wales. Um, I know that the DPI were quite lucky for a very long time. I think there was a vet in for about 22 years in the role. Um, but there was a significant period where a vet couldn't actually take that role so there'd been there was actually no inspections in 2018 2019 which really you know dropped um, the the requirements around those inspections um, I'm just wondering how we fix this um, if we're struggling to find vets to actually fill that inspection role going forward so I'm perhaps I could answer that because I am I'm a veterinary myself and I am aware that there is a shortfall in terms of veterinarians who have expertise in this particular area. So we've made the decision to actually introduce an internship program for young vets. So we have our first intern on board and they come in for a two year period during which they do some external training through the University of Edinburgh. They also participate in all of the different things that the animal welfare officers do in our institution. and. Should they stay with us if they're wonderful, then that of course is a wonderful bonus. But the other thing is that they're going back out into the community and may be given opportunities to be working, whether it's in government or whether it's in other institutions, and we believe that that's something that needs to be done. Mm. That would just be one person every two years. So we've taken a different approach, and I've now been liaising with the veterinary school, and the uh, fourth year veterinary students go out on placement, and we're just now developing an arrangement whereby they will come and do a placement with us as well so that they're not only going to perhaps have one lecture in all of the time they're at university about um, animal research but perhaps are getting more than that and have an opportunity to work with our animal welfare vets and to come and be part of ethics committees and see how all of the ethics committee members work together and how the rigour of what's done. Mm. And perhaps this will encourage them to think about this as a career path for the future. It's a slow process, but it's one that I think is going to be really valuable. And interestingly, prior to this, I was talking to uh, Professor Dunn and he said, oh, I wouldn't mind being involved in doing that. So we may just have another place for our young vets to be able to go as well. Thank you. Yep. Please. Have you finished that line of scrutiny? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, this is the second hearing day uh, of this inquiry. The previous hearing day we had a number of really uh, stimulating conversations around recognising animal sentience uh, in, the, in the, um, this draft bill. I'd be very keen for each of your institutions or your own views about the merits of recognising animal sentience uh, in the legislation. And if I could start with maybe Professor Rogan or just Rocky and work our way across. Um, that is a very important question, but we, with my background, I'm a physicist. I, I will not touch that um, because I'm not sufficiently qualified. I will hand it you, over. You, you could take it on notice if you're just no, I'm happy to do that. The yeah. university can yeah, yeah. choose to answer it. Yep. Yes. Um, with regard to sentience, I think that it's it's the language, um, the global language around animals that are used in the research environment and I think it would be well for us to take note of the fact that it is being used widely. It's also important, I note that you explain the reason in the, in the, the discussion, the outcomes document, you explain the reason why you've included um, the description, rather than using the word sentient, you've in included the description of what that actually means and it relates to harm and what that harm might be. I think that it is actually 
it's a very well known, well recognised word, and I think that we do need to be using it. And if it's in the code, we need to be using it more broadly. I, I just. I think it's just one of those things that bite the bullet and make sure that it's in there because it, you can describe what it is, put it in, have a description, this is what it actually refers to. I think it's a really important one because it is well understood in a global setting and if we're talking about the way that animal research is going to be interacting where we have openness, transparency, reproducibility, all of those things that are so important, then let's make sure that we're using the same language. Mm -hmm. yep. Uh, look, from Western's perspective too, I mean, uh, anything which has currency uh, and uh, operability um, is, is preferred, but uh, again, it's not my area of expertise there, and I'll need to take it on notice. Yep. Okay. Thanks for anybody else want to comment? Thanks for the question, it's a great one. Um, so I'm starting to realise how important this national code is. Uh, I'm just wondering if someone could recommend to me how the committee can maybe write to them and get some more information on some of the matters that we're reviewing so that we can better understand how things interact. I think you would need to speak to the animal welfare team in the NHMRC. They take carriage of the code. Right. The code, I would think, is probably due for another review sometime in the next, maybe the next 12 months. So I would definitely talk to them. Um, codes, the code is referenced in every piece of legislation around the country where um, animal research is, is, um, is actually addressed and the reason is because it is a code that does need to be reviewed and updated so I would speak to NHMRC about that. And can you um, help me to work out how we can find out how many institutions are accredited to conduct experiments in New South Wales? I would have thought that you would be able to speak to the DPI and they'd be able to give you exactly what you needed to know. Thank you. And is there collaboration between you in New South Wales? All between, between institutions? Correct. All the time. All the time. All the time. And is, are the, is the ethics approach applied uh, as a standard across all industries or, or, or fields of study? For example, are they the same in medicine as they are in veterinary studies? Absolutely. Absolutely. And environmental studies? Yeah. The, the code sets the, the ethical standard and the code applies to any animal that is used in research that is a, that's named in the code. And your committee at the university ensures compliance with that? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And then they, you oversight that and then need to be satisfied at the conclusion of yeah. the research that it was done <coughs> ethically? Yes, absolutely. And it's the, the consideration that occurs at an ethics meeting is very robust. It's, and it's, it can be back and forth with the researchers to get clarification. Um, it's a very robust process and it's, um, it's the scientists, the veterinarian, the community members. And the one, one of the really fantastic things that we've seen since this all started more than 30 years ago is that the growth that we've seen in the way in which ethics committees behave because we've had the community members present who have challenged us. Well, why are you saying that? What are the reasons for that? And it's been, it's been a wonderful thing and I've been, I guess, on a number of ethics committees and it's lovely to see that growth that happens. And it, it means that we do, every year we're doing better and better job. Can I ask you to just share a case study of that happening? Okay, so I, I can, and um, I won't do it from Sydney University, but I'll do it from somewhere else where we had a, an ethics committee. It was in a teaching environment. It was very important. And you, um, Kevin mentioned before about other places where teaching does, where animal use occurs with teaching. And I would suggest to you that the taste sector is exactly the sort of place where animals are used for teaching, to teach young um, nurse, vet nurses, to teach animal technicians. And the um, and one of the things that we did was we had somebody who came in as a Category C person and the, the, their perspective on things allowed the, the committee to grow and develop and to put some stronger um, SOPs in place to, to in fact really, really train the teachers better about how to make it happen, to make sure that the message was getting to the students. It was a very, it was a very, very worthwhile um, development and I've seen it again and again. 
Thank you. Um, yes. Just following on the codes, are there any activities, I feel like I know the answer to this, but are there any activities that happen outside of what is prescribed in the code that you rely on the Act for, or is the code the, the guiding principle document? The code is the guiding principle. It's like, uh, it is, it's the standard that is applied within the Act as well. So they work collaboratively together. They work really in partnership and that's as it should be. And I guess what the legislation does is it gives it the teeth. And is that missing in the new Act, you feel? Yes, I think that that's sufficient teeth and clarity and the ability to go straight to something and go, ah, oh, yes, that's what we've got to do. It's clearly delineated in a place that's very well understood because it's prescribed there. Um, I think that the, even if you look around the, the other states and territories, they have a part in all of their legislation which is prescribed, in, albeit in a different piece of legislation, but it's prescribed specifically for the use of animals in the research environment, and uh, research and teaching. So I think that that's the issue, that it's about clarity and, and um, us being able to find that information quickly and easily and understand exactly what's needed. Can I just follow on? Um, can I start? So does the code acknowledge or recognise sentience? You to ask me that question, and I was reading it the other day, and I'm not absolutely certain that in the current version sentience is written. Can I? It, my understanding, reading the code right now, did, um, oh. is uh, is that it's it talks about emerging evidence of sentience. Thank you. Um, <laughs> an ability to experience pain and distress as something to take into consideration. It also mentions in a couple of places non-sentient organisms. I'm curious as to, in practice, what that <laughs> distinction looks like. Are you able to give the committee a clear... Sorry, can I just... Because um, I think Professor Raw was quite oh, keen so to sorry. say something. No, that's OK. We'll <clears throat> move to that. Okay. Mm. Um, sorry. sorry. Um, so there, there, there's sentience as a concept in that is, uh, I, I saw the previous uh, talks with the hunters, uh, dogs, how do we feel that they're cared for and that they feel in a happy environment. I think in the laboratory setting there is a increasingly recognised uh, recognition, increasing recognition that we need more science and how, how animals feel pain, how do they feel well-being, how do they display that well-being. And that's exactly why UNSW put uh, uh, a grant, put grants up to do research on that, and that's an international question. The code itself uh, classif uh, limits animals as vertebrate animals, and depend uh, and the legislation, and depending on the state and territory in Australia, some include higher order invertebrates, so that excludes animals such as nematodes. In fact, a lot of researchers do work with nematodes and fruit flies, for example, because they feel it's too much hard work to go through the animal ethics process. Uh, so there is an exclusion of animals that are not covered by the Act, but it's clearly defined for vertebrate and some invertebrate animals. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Wall. Look, I'm really sorry, but we are just about out of time, and, I, and we do do like to give you an opportunity, uh, say, each of the institutions, just to let us know if we've missed something in the hearing today. Um, so I might ask, uh, begin with the University of Sydney, um, if you have anything that you wish to add, not, not a summary, just anything that we've missed or that you feel would be good to say. Thanks. I can't see Susan to see if she's wanting to say anything, but from my point of view, I think we've covered everything we wanted covered today, so thank you. That's much appreciated. Is that okay? I concur. Uh, University of New South Wales. We touched upon it briefly, but it's so important that I want to reiterate, if, if there is a change consultation, it's, it's extremely important. Right? We want to, like, if, if you would move toward the draft bill, there needs to be a lot more consultation with the sector. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Professor Dunn. Uh, same point as Sven's, otherwise uh, well covered for us, thanks. Well, thank you all. I thank all of you. Um, it's been very enlightening, the evidence that you've given today, and it's very much appreciated. So uh, I'll call this uh, part of the hearing to a close and um, invite 
next session's witnesses to come forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Could each witness please state their name and position title and swear either an oath or affirmation? Uh, and I might begin with uh, Senator Animal Law Foundation. Mr Robinson, could you begin for us, please? Certainly. My name is Ian Robertson. I'm the co um, the co-founder and director of the Sentient and Animal Law Foundation. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Mr Goldsworthy. Uh, thank you. Uh, Daniel Goldsworthy is my name. I'm co-founder and director of the Sentient Animal Law Foundation. Um, I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. I'll move to the Animal Defender's Office. Ms Ward. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name's Tara Ward. Um, I'm the uh, Managing Solicitor uh, in a volunteer capacity for the Animal Defender's Office. Um, I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. And uh, Professor Cullen Brown. Yes, my name's Professor Colin Brown. I'm head of the Fish Lab at Macquarie University and I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Uh, Professor Brown, can I just clarify, are you appearing in an individual capacity or on behalf of the university? In an individual capacity. Thank you very much. That's terrific. Okay, uh, so can I ask um, Mr Robertson perhaps, uh, do you have an opening statement you wish to make to the committee? I do, thank you. Please proceed. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> all right, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to appear on behalf of the Sentient Animal Law Foundation. As you'll see from our submissions, our core message is that by legislatively defining sentience, referencing the science, the knowledge and the wording of the five domains. First of all, you get a duty of care uh, for both halves of the animal's life experience. And secondly, you establish New South Wales as the global leader of animal welfare with all the benefits that accrue from that position for the next 15 to 20 years. At its heart, animal law is about more than just recognising the inherent value of animals and establishing how we should treat them. It's governance of the human-animal relationship. For the last 200 years, the legal model uh, has functioned on taking responsibility for just half of the animal's life experience, namely the animal's suffering. Remembering that the human-animal relationship affects animals and people duty of care within animal law has enormous consequences for people's interests that are conveniently illustrated in the three subgroups of animal law, namely private animal law, public animal law and international animal law. Recognising the need to elevate standards of animal welfare has turned discussions from around the world to the subject of animal sentience. Now look, there are, there are five key understandings demonstrating that the definition of sentience is the doorway to extending the duty of care with positive animal welfare law. Those five key understandings, which we can talk to later in discussion, uh, are number one, first and foremost, existing anti-cruelty law implicitly recognises animals as sentient. Number two, law hinges on the concept of responsibility. So when the law, uh, so when using the law to deliver nationwide change within necessary timeframes. Nothing changes in practice if you don't change the duty of care. Thirdly, animals feel and experience negative and positive states, which has given rise to the concept of positive animal welfare on the basis that animals, according to the science of the five domains, experience more than just suffering. Fourth, Positive animal welfare law replicates the performance and practices of New South Wales's top 11% of animal related industry and corporates and wider animal caregivers. Essentially, point number four states that with positive animal welfare law, today's standards of best practice 
become tomorrow's norm. And finally, number, point number five, you'll see from the submissions of the Sentient Animal Law Foundation that the three-word law reform and legal definition that clearly and unequivocally extends law's duty of care is sentience means that animals experience negative and positive states. Thank you again for the invitation and uh, representing the co-founders of the Sentient Animal Law Foundation, uh, Daniel Goldsworthy and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Um, Ms Ward from the Animal Defenders Office, I'd invite you to make an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for inviting the Animal Defenders Office to give evidence at this uh, inquiry into a very important matter of animal law reform. Uh, you'll probably be aware that our submission was fairly long. Uh, I don't actually have anything further to add. I think we said every, or we covered everything that we wanted to cover in the submission, so I might just leave it at that today then. Is it possible you. for you to perhaps just summarise the key conclusions of your submission? Um, Thank you. Uh, yes, so there are a few um, things in just sort of looking, taking um, the bigger picture, and that is that it's hard to judge uh, the sort of full extent of what will be um, provided or what will be um, contained in the new regulatory framework because a lot is not, we just don't know what, what it will contain because it will be contained in the regulations. So it's hard to comment on that. From what is there, um, I would say that it takes a conservative approach to animal protection, a very conservative in sort of 2022. Um, and in, in, in that, it, um, I'm sure you've already sort of <coughs> spoken um, at length about the, the fact that it doesn't uh, acknowledge sentience. I think that's um, a, a serious omission and really um, undermines any claim that this will be a modern uh, um, uh, anim animal welfare uh, act that will take New South Wales into the sort of, you know, um, next 10 years or more. Uh, it simply won't be able to do that if it doesn't acknowledge sentience. Um, it's the equivalent of, for example, um, 20 years ago uh, redoing a, an animal protection or an animal welfare law and still only focusing on anti-cruelty measures rather than um, incorporating a positive duty of care. Uh, that's, that's where we are at now um, uh, with regards to acknowledging sentience. Uh, certain key omissions, the fact that it doesn't include an independent office of animal protection, I would say is a serious omission. Um, and I'm sure other things will come up during the okay. discussion today. There will be an thank opportunity you. for that too. So thank you so much. Um, Professor Brown, do you have um, a brief opening statement that you wish to make? Sure, thank you. Um, I think probably that it's best to start with a little bit about me and while I'm here so you can, the committee can understand um, my background. I'm, as I mentioned, I'm head of the Fish Lab at Macquarie University. I'm a recognised world expert on fish behaviour, particularly cognition. So my work on fish intelligence in particular informs concepts of uh, sentience and, and welfare. So that's where my expertise overlap with this inquiry. Um, look, I sat on the Macquarie University Animal Ethics Committee for 10 years as a Category B member. So obviously there's a lot in, in this that I have a vested interest in. And I'm also chair of the Australian Society for Fish Biology Animal Welfare Committee. Um, I sit on various international advisory boards, um, particularly in the context of devising fish welfare indicators uh, in the context of aquaculture. Um, look, I, I've tabled my supplementary submission um, which was distributed to the committee. But to save time, I think I'll just um, read the key points here. Uh, but I should, before I carry on, I should re really reiterate that I'm, I'm not uh, representing any of these organisations that I've mentioned. I, I'm here in my own uh, capacity. Um, Professor Brown, about my... Professor Brown, sorry to interrupt you. Can I thank you very much for that um, introduction? We do have your submission. Um, if, you, if you don't mind, that was terrific. We, we'll just move straight to questioning from here, I think. And uh, I'll ask the Honourable first to Thank you. go first. Um, I just want to jump in about some of the provisions that we haven't discussed yet um, over the last couple of days. I might throw this to Miss Ward. Um, I want to ask about the proposed provision regarding animal cruelty material. Um, the Shooters Union argued that there should be an exemption 
in relation to production of videos such as pig dogging, um, and I'm sure other industries might want exemptions as well. Do you think it makes sense to exclude certain interest type videos, or should we really just be removing this provision from the bill altogether, um, particularly given the recent changes to the Crimes Act? Uh, thank you. Uh, I would agree with uh, the latter part of your statement, and that is that uh, um, in our submission, that part of the um, proposed bill should be removed altogether. It serves no purpose. It's unnecessary law, and unnecessary law is bad law. So um, yes, in our submission, uh, it won't achieve anything. It will create confusion. There will be sectors across the spectrum who um, are, are um, unhappy with it. Uh, who, so I think that the most sort of um, uh, or the uh, best solution would be simply to remove it and the bill would be better for it. And I just sort of, no, don't you say it's sort of unnecessary? Um, I mean, does it sort of almost have a, have a gagging issue with it in regards to somebody potentially, or, or for example, say somebody sees a video of somebody doing harm to an animal and they post it on Facebook? And that ends up, the RSPCA ends up seeing that video, but the person posting it could also be charged. Is that correct? Even if they were posting it because they were horrified? Exactly. So that's some um, another aspect to the proposed provision, and that is that it's too broad and will capture uh, a, a a wide range of things that I don't think is the intention or would be the intention. So in that sense, given that the core um, cruelty material is already covered by the, the new provisions in the Crimes Act, uh, th this um, uh, pr proposed provision is redundant, um, mm. uh, both for being unnecessary and um, also it is too broad and will capture things that it really shouldn't capture. Thank you. It shouldn't be criminalised, matters that shouldn't be criminalised. Yeah, thank you. Um, Sorry. I'll just join in on that conversation. So, forgive my ignorance a little bit. So, does that mean then that pig dogs can then show videos of them catching and that would be my uh, interpretation of the clause in its current form would be that that would be captured and that would be potentially a criminal offence to have to share the videos or to yes, the activities. because it shows cruelty to animals. There is no doubt that pig dogging is cruel to to the animals involved, and that could um, be interpreted as falling within that offence. Yes, and that's the offence you're asking to have taken out. Yes, because it's too broad. And I mean, we would be in furious agreement here with the pig doggers. <laughs> Lucky I'm sitting down. Interesting position. <laughs> Um, look, I just also want to go into another aspect because yours your is um, a submission that also talks about the stock animal welfare panel, panel model. Um, I just want to get your views on uh, that panel and if you think they should be retained um, or if, you're, if you have any examples of where stock animal welfare panels have actually led to poor animal welfare outcomes. <clears throat> My concern or our concern would be a um, sort of in principle concern. We, we aren't directly involved with stock uh, welfare panels. Uh, there are reports of uh, huge numbers of animals because, of course, the whole point of them is they're dealing with so-called stock animals, which means uh, large numbers of animals, and I think that is the sort of underlying uh, rationale. Uh, how do you deal with from a sort of prevention of cruelty or, or um, it's probably too late to prevent it, but dealing with ongoing cruelty or suffering to animals uh, when they're in large numbers. And uh, the problem is that the stock welfare panel um, would appear to be a very long and drawn out process. <coughs> And so this is the problem that animals continue to suffer during that process. Now, I'm all for educating animal carers, but when it takes so long and the animals will continue to suffer, that's when I think it's not the best model. Um, and this may be a problem extending it to intensive animal uh, facilities because those animals are already uh, in very stressful situations, being intensively confined. And um, therefore, I, I just... Um, I'm not convinced that this is a good that good welfare outcomes will result in extending the panel pro, uh, process to intensively confined animals. And I think you've also raised in your submission um, in regards to stock animal welfare panels that they focus on physical suffering, um, which is in contrast to the bill which is now actually proposing to extend the definition of harm to include psychological suffering. Um, do you think that if stock welfare panels remain that they should be required to take into account psychological harm as well? 
I think that it's certainly an option and it would be in um, the spirit of the bill because the bill does um, extend the definition or, or include psychological suffering, which um, I, we fully support uh, as animals are sentient, whether or not that's acknowledged, they are sentient. Um, and um, uh, But there remains, I was thinking about this and it could be that the stock welfare panel is uh, devised to deal with physical suffering. Now that's that's fine, you know it's good, um, but uh, uh, there remains the issue of psychological suffering for stock animals. It's not that just because they're farmed they don't <laughs> suffer from a psychological perspective, um, or you know mental suffering. Uh, but there remains the possibility to pursue uh, um, investigation and enforcement um, measures under the other parts of the Act, as long as that is clear, that that, that can be pursued um, where there is clear psychological suffering and it would be um, outside the Stock Welfare Panel. As long as those two um, processes can, can coexist, then, then um, it may not um, be uh, as Sorry. bad an outcome. Um, <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, Mr Robertson, did you wish to add to that? Yes, if I may, uh, on, on these points, I think what's a, a, a key consideration, um, whether it's uh, pig dogging, stock, uh, stock welfare, or any activity uh, involving an animal and its, and its well-being, um, the, the last few minutes have, have highlighted uh, three points. One, what difference would there be in uh, a foundational law that affects all people, their behaviours towards all animals, and consequently all activities, current standards, uh, looking for exemptions or whatever, what difference would it make to have positive animal welfare as a matter of law? Um, uh, I, I appreciate that um, there's a, a, a spirit of extending those responsibilities beyond cruelty. Um, but, but point number two is that uh, uh, when you were talking about the physical well-being of the animals. That's why we um, have suggested that we mirror any law reform, mirror the wording and the contemporary science of the five domains. Now, the, the five domains talks about, um, you know, it establishes the scientific authority in much the same way as the five freedoms did half a century ago. The wording of the five domains sets out that animals experience physical, mental, and emotional suffering. Um, the, five, the five freedoms, as I said, half a, half a century ago, uh, resulted in a law reform that extended the duty of care beyond just a responsibility in respect of blatant acts of cruelty, and extended enforcement powers and responsibilities to preventing likely or foreseeable, likely is the key word in law, likely suffering. So the five freedoms was instrumental as an authority and a, and the wording for that law reform. What we're, we're submitting is that the five freedoms, which has now superseded the science of the, fi uh, the five domains, sorry, which has superseded the science of the five freedoms, now represents the benchmark for truly modern animal law that affects um, not just the animal's experience, but also the interests of people on a private, public or international stage. So the, the, the three points, what's the, what difference would it make with positive animal welfare law? Point number two, the five domains is the new reference uh, of contemporary animal welfare assessment. And point number three is if we're going to utilise words that reference the authority of, or if we're going to engage the concept of the five domains, let's use the words of the five domains and therefore extends that uh, discussion beyond not being just not being cruel to them. We retain that, but as Ms Ward mentioned, extend those responsibilities to provide for their positive states as well. Those were the three points. Thank you. Um, I suspect we'll be having a, a discussion about um, sentience a bit later.
on. I'm sure we won't avoid it because we love talking about it. Um, but I did want to just touch on a couple more of these specific points, um, Ms Ward, that you have raised. And thank you very much for your very, very detailed um, comments on the bill. Um, in one of your recommendations, you talk about um, restricted procedures that should be carried out only by a veterinarian with pain relief. Mm. Um, we've got some obvious ones there, you know, mulesing, dehorning, castrating, ear tagging. Um, you've put in brackets there as appropriate. Can you talk us through, I guess, the, the importance of um, pain relief for those procedures and when it might not be appropriate? Uh, Thank you, Ms. Boyd. Um, can I? Uh, which page? Sorry, sorry page is that bottom on? of page seven. Uh, I think <laughs> that's probably a semantic issue there. Hopefully, I'm just. Uh, I think po possibly the appropriate as appropriate is referring to whether um, by a veterinarian or and or pain relief. I, I, I must admit I did struggle with how to express that, so apologies for any confusion. But I think as a minimum, pain relief uh, for all of those um, procedures would, would be a minimum. Um, and, and ideally, uh, in an animal welfare um, paradigm, ideally uh, a veterinarian would administer these procedures as well. But um, at the very least, they should be administered with pain relief. And I think we mentioned that that is going no, f um, no further than, I think it was the consultation outcomes pa uh, paper, which did refer to the high industry uptake of voluntary use of pain relief. So really, it should be a, an uncontroversial um, proposal. Um, another one that you've mentioned here that seems quite uncontroversial to me is um, in relation to the offence proposed in section 29 in relation to uh, injuries to animals struck by a vehicle, nice. um, which excludes birds. Um, why, why does it exclude birds, do you think? What, what's the historical sort of background there? I can only go to the hist sort of historical from a legislative perspective. It, it is in POCTA. Mm -hmm. So, um, and as we all know, that was uh, um, introduced or, or passed in 19, or commenced in 19, 79, I think it was. Um, I haven't looked further into it, um, whether it's just ex and a matter of sort of expediency, it's just, oh, there's too many of them and they're too, you know, we don't need to worry about um, their suffering. Uh, but I think, yeah, we've moved on from there and, and that um, animals, birds, sorry, are definitely included in the definition of animal. Um, I think the science, and I defer to the, the experts in the on the screen, uh, birds would be sentient and therefore there's absolutely no reason why birds should be excluded from that provision, which just suggests some minimum measures that can be taken when an animal, you've caused an animal to suffer. Thank you. Can I ask? The Honourable, we'll come around, we'll come back around, but the Honourable Scott Barrett. Thank you. Sorry, just going back to the stock welfare panels, one of your recommendations, Ms Ward, was about publishing the details of those mm. stock welfare panels. Mm. With the idea of these being sort of an intervention <coughs> before it becomes an animal welfare issue, wouldn't that be a deterrent for a producer to get involved if at the end of it the details are all going to be released publicly? I think we suggest uh, that the sort of um, non-sensitive information be uh, disclosed. So it wouldn't be sort of, you know, pointing the finger at individual, uh, you know, animal managers or carers uh, or farmers. Uh, but, but I think the community needs to know uh, how, you know, what are the outcomes from these stock welfare panels? How, in terms of the animals, the animals, <laughs> um, how can we possibly assess whether they are working if we don't know wh what, you know, was the initial situation, what were the measures taken, and what were the outcomes for the animals? There's no way of assessing or evaluating that whole mechanism if, if the community doesn't know. Um, I mean, there are reports um, that, you know, uh, I think one report was, and I think we refer to this in our submission, um, 800, or anyway, large numbers of, of cows, I think, in that um, example, uh, died. Uh, during the process. Now that's a serious concern and we would want to know that because that we would factor that in into the, the very legitimate question of is this working? And when you say reports, do you mean actual reports or by enforcers. Sorry, so it's a written, I think it's, uh, we refer to it in one of our footnotes, it's, uh, I think it was an RSPCA uh, blog that referred to uh, large numbers of um, cows in that instance uh, dying 
uh, during during the process. So as you would have seen from the bill, there are many stages. First of all, a welfare situation. There must be an initial welfare situation, otherwise it wouldn't come to the attention of authorities. Uh, that has to be referred. Um, then uh, the process has to be instigated, it has to be investigated, it has to be reported on, and then I think there are recommendations from the minister or the relevant authority. And, and I would imagine that that process is going to take some time uh, and all the while you have animals who were suffering to start with. So, so that, that would be our concern from an animal welfare perspective. The Honourable Taylor Martin. You keep going. Oh, right. so, so just a question about um, poisoning of animals. Um, do you see any other alternative at the moment and do you think it would be okay to not have a control mechanism for pigs and wild dogs and the, I guess the long-term animal welfare issues that they can and do cause? Uh, so uh, we would certainly oppose the use of poison on any animal, as, you, as I think we've stated, given the um, immense suffering that it causes. It doesn't discriminate between the labels we give to animals. So in terms of um, alternatives, I think that we are um, a smart species and that we can, if we <laughs> um, applied the, the appropriate sort of resources and effort into coming up with alternatives, I think we can. I think for too long we've relied on the, um, the easy solution, which is in, a, an incredibly cruel solution. Uh, so, I mean, it could be fertility control for one. It could be different sort of managing habitats differently. I'm I'm sure there are solutions out there. We just have to um, adopt them rather than the cruel, sort of first resort, cruel uh, solution. But without an alternative at the moment, like a ban on... How long does that last? We'll just go around in that circle. There isn't one now, so we've got to keep using the cruel. We've got to break free of that cycle uh, and, and, and be the smart species that we are, or we think we are, and come up with, with um, uh, humane properly humane alternatives. I'm sure we can do it. Could an instant ban, though, not lead to worse animal uh, welfare? I don't think anyone's ones? proposing an instant ban. Uh, with any of these measures, um, uh, and, and apologies if our submission gave that impression, with any of these measures where we're dealing with um, entrenched uh, practices, uh, we, it's, it's um, obvious that we would need some kind of phase, phased out phasing in or out um, you know, pr uh, period. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Benesiak. Sure. I might just start with you, uh, Ms. Ward. I just wanted to get some clarity on your position in your submission, which is number seven. You, you talked about recreational fishing and you say it's unreasonable because reasonable alternatives exist both in terms of the recreational activity and the food source. So what's the alternative in terms of the recreational activity and what's the alternative in terms of the food source? And are you just trying to legislate a way of people's freedom to make that choice by essentially saying? The whole point of legislation is to sort of regulate freedoms. So um, uh, I, I don't certainly don't resolve from that. Uh, why not enjoy the lake or the river or whatever, you, you, wherever you're um, um, trying to capture the fish uh, or the fishes? Um, why not enjoy it? Enjoy the scenery. Um, go for a, a boat, boat, um, you know, sail on the lake or, or something. There's, there's plenty of other uh, recreation um, activities that can be conducted without involving killing animals in a painful way. <coughs> Given that. And, and as for food sources, um, I'm sure that there are plenty of um, people out there who, who may not even be vegans but um, don't eat fish. So it is certainly not an essential food source. Okay, given um, you picking up on just picking up on that point of pain, given that that's actually a contested area of science, and also I'll probably put this to Mr. Brown as well. Um, there's various studies on both sides of the fence about whether fish do feel pain or don't feel pain. Um, given that it seems to be more of a personal truth rather than objective truth, um, given that personal truth is, you know. Uh, not contested. Um, oh, sorry, objective truth is not contested. Why would we be legislating based on that fact, given that it's, an, uh, it's a contested area of science? Mr. Brown, did you want to? Certainly. I mean, the first thing is that I would uh, disagree that it is contested area of science. Okay, can I, can, the then I try to point you to like two 
uh, studies that I've just found in about five minutes. Uh, one from a Dr. K, a Dr. K in Brisbane, uh, who specialises in brains, um, both animal and human, and he says that fish don't have the necessary arch neuroarchitecture uh, to actually feel pain. And there's another do uh, another study by done by uh, Rose, Rose um, that specifically uh, debunks whether fish have the necessary uh, um, architecture to do that as well. So I, I would put to you that it is a contested area of, of science, and you even admitted in your submission that you're pragmatic and that it's not a widely held view. So why, we, why would we... I may address that. I'm, I'm pragmatic in, in the perspective that um, there are a large number of people who <coughs> like to go recreational fishing and that I would not personally ban recreational fishing. I'm pragmatic in that that would be my perspective. In terms of the science, if you look at why those papers are cited in the way that they are, it's, it's because they are extremely controversial. And if I may tell you basically they're, the principle behind them, they, they basically state that unless you have a human cortex, you are incapable of suffering, which would rule out just about every animal on the planet other than a select number of primates and mammals. So if you take that approach, then you are basically uh, assuming that other than human beings and a select number of mammals, no other animal is capable of feeling pain. The reality is that the, the vertebrate brain and the associated uh, nervous system, the hormones and everything are highly conserved across all vertebrates, which is why just about every country in the world recognises fishes in their definition of animal and it's included in the animal welfare legislation around the world. So are there some people out there who dispute that? Yes, but they are by far and away the minority of scientists. So we can never be 100% certain on this because actually sentience, there's no way to physically measure it. So I have no idea what you're thinking right now or or what uh, Ian Robinson's think, thinking right now because it's a private thing what goes inside your, in your mind and other animals' minds. It's exactly the same problem. But fundamentally, the evidence we now have for uh, sentience in, in fishes and the capacity for feeling pain is as good as for just about any other animal. So just by extension, picking up on that point that you were saying that you, you, know, you, you can't possibly measure it, then how do you enforce, how do you enforce it, particularly this area of psychological harm, which has become a bit of a contentious issue, um, you know, varying opinions from the stakeholders receiving. How do you how do you measure that? Is is psychological harm more a a symptom of, I guess, the other physical um, <clears throat> welfare concerns that that animal might be experiencing? Uh, is that just a manifestation of the fact that it might not have enough water or not have enough food or might not be getting the right medical attention? Um, like, how do you measure that to then enforce it, I guess, is the problem we're coming up against. Yeah, and I don't know if you would like me to answer that, but if you've ever been to the doctor with a significant injury, the first thing they do is they ask you on a scale of 1 to 10 how much pain you're in. So we currently have no way of even quantifying pain in humans, let alone any other animal. So what you have to do is rely on signs and symptoms. Is this person suffering? How badly are they suffering? Is their behaviour changed in such a way that it suggests to me that they are suffering? Um, that's the only way you can do it. And, and that's true of all animals, including people. Can I ask Mr Goldsworthy if you'd like to say something? I've seen you've been quite animated. <laughs> Mr. Golds. I apologise. Um, yeah, nodding furiously uh, in, in agreement with um, Professor Brown. Um, I uh, there's there's nothing specifically to add to this point un unless there's a question you might have of me. Um, but my my colleague, Dr. Ian Robertson, um, is a is a veterinarian and a barrister, and I know a number of these these questions specifically about um, uh, being able to measure. Uh, Professor Brown's provided obviously some some great incisive insights there, but um, these positive affective states, well, affective states generally about mental emotional states that animals experience and um, the ability to to measure them and quantify them are, are questions that um, 
are obviously critically important. I suppose the, uh, the, the contributions I'd be happy to give would be around, um, and my area of expertise would be around statutory interpretation and statutory construction. So on that particular question, I might defer to, to Ian if, if that's okay, if you've got anything to add there. Uh, I know that Ms Hurst had a follow-up question she wanted to ask. Yeah, so I'll just jump in here, um, just because I do have a, a follow-up question from the questions from Mr Benaziak uh, to Professor Brown. Um, we have had some industry groups or, or fishing industry groups in their submissions argue that uh, decapod crustaceans and cephalopods should not be recognised as animals in this legislation. Um, I just wanted to ask you if there's any scientific basis that you are aware of to argue that um, decapod crustaceans and cephalopods <coughs> are in fact not animals. Again, this comes back to that definition of animals and to the extent to which we have reasonable um, reason to believe that um, decapod crustaceans in particular, not all crustaceans, just that um, particular group because that's where the work's been done, and uh, cephalopods, so there we're talking about things like octopus and squid. Both of those groups, um, there's a long history of pretty well established uh, scientific research, um, particularly in things like crayfish, um, various species of crabs and those sorts of things. Most of that work's been done in Europe. There's very little of that work that's done here. Uh, most of the work on uh, cephalopod cognition and sentience has been done by labs again in Europe, primarily in France. So the evidence um, certainly for cephalopods is uh, pretty good and, and it's not surprising that, that you know, cephalopods are almost universally recognised in the definition of animal uh, around the world. Um, whether it be the EU, or Canada or the US, um, not in the US, the UK rather, New Zealand and all these sorts of countries, the sorts of countries that we often benchmark ourselves against. So that's, I don't think, controversial. Decapod crustaceans is certainly the next one. Um, the evidence that there is, I would say, reasonably good, certainly beyond any kind of reasonable doubt that, that this is the, the new and emerging uh, group that would be uh, capable of suffering. Uh, and if you multiply that out by the, the sheer number of animals that we're talking about, the, the overall welfare impact is quite high. And in fact, the science has now moved beyond that and we're now thinking about uh, other invertebrates and it looks to me like the Hymenoptera are really going to be the next group. So that would be bees, wasps and ants. They have quite sophisticated um, behaviours. So the, the science has now moved beyond decapod crustaceans and cephalopods and it's moving well into the invertebrates. Thank you so much. Um, I might turn back to uh, Ms Ward. Um, one of the submissions that we received um, suggested that any person charged with an offence should be given the right to challenge the claims prior to even going to court. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts about that idea, uh, whether it's workable or beneficial, um, and if it happens in relation to any other criminal law that someone's actually able to challenge a claim before they're charged by the police. I'm not aware of um, other examples of such a mechanism um, in the criminal law space. Um, I could take that on notice, but uh, certainly nothing comes to mind. Um, I think that's what we have the court process for. And um, uh, yeah, so I would um, regard that as being unnecessary. I can understand where they're coming from. These are highly, highly um, charged and stressful situations for everybody involved. Uh, often the keepers of the animals uh, are, are doing their best, um, are trying to, um, you know, within their means, uh, but it just, their best may just fall short of the standard that we expect of keeping animals. So, um, I can certainly see where situations, uh, where, you know, charging off to the courts is, is not ideal, but it is our criminal, um, justice system and I think it, it, it would serve us best. Sorry, there is an opportunity for cautions to be given to juveniles, for example. So this would be based on that? 
Oh, I mean, that, that sound, I mean, it, it, it certainly would be worth exploring. Court, isn't it? No, no, the, the, the cautions are issued by the police without going to court. Sorry, I'm just saying. It. So there are already mechanisms because uh, we have the written directions um, uh, mechanism. So they're built, already built into, um, and that's outside of the stock welfare panel process, of course. This is just your, you know, your sort of... Um, uh, you know, um, family pet, say, uh, where so there are uh, already processes um, to avoid the criminal justice system. So there's penalty infringement notices, there's written directions, there's so I would su suggest that there are plenty of um, uh, mechanisms already built into the framework. Thank you. Uh, I just want to ask um, some industry groups have raised concerns uh, about unreasonable and unnecessary harm in the bill, though those particular terms. Um, and have actually proposed removing words like unnecessary and unreasonable. Um, uh, how would you? F are you concerned about those actually being like removed so that you know it, would, it wouldn't have to be unnecessary or unreasonable? I would welcome that because then harming an animal would be in effect a strict liability offence, and I would welcome that. I, I th so I, th I think maybe my question is not very clear. So. It would, so to give you an example, um, uh, it, an exemption is in the course and for the purpose of performing prescribed animal husbandry in a way that inflicted no unnecessary harm to the animal. So no unnecessary harm would be removed. So it would just oh, be... So we're talking exemptions? Yes. Uh, absolutely, they have to remain. So that qualification qualifier on, on the exemptions must remain. And in our submission, as you will have seen, we have uh, recommended that it be added to all the exemptions. Because the exemptions are there to uh, render lawful what would otherwise be cruel cruelty to animals and in many instances aggravated cruelty to animals. So, um, you know, we have to acknowledge that that's what we're dealing with, with the exemptions. And so if they are to remain, uh, we of course would be, um, would fully support removing the exemptions. Cruelty to animals is cruelty to animals. Uh, there must at least be that um, qualification which would then uh, enable some kind of uh, evaluation according, according to current community standards um, as to whether that uh, exemption should be protected or that activity should be um, exempted and protected. Can I just ask, invite Professor, Professor Brown wanted to say something, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I, I really back up um, what Miss Ward's saying here, and, and it's really interesting in the concept, in the context of um, recreational fishing. I mean, it's an, an obviously a, an allowed activity under the Act, but you want to be careful that people are conducting behaviours within that uh, exemption that are part of the normal process of, of what people and the average people in society would consider when you're catching a fish and that you don't step outside those normal activities. So I think it's really important and that's just one example of, of the many where, where that sort of language I think is going to be important. I will go now to Mr Barrett and I think and then we'll I'll just probably be a very quick one I'd say. Just back to the stock welfare panels, Ms Ward. Um, your recommendation that it, suggestion that there could be the situation at the moment where there's no one, yeah. no animal welfare expert on the panel, mm. um, a panel that includes someone from the department who has expertise yeah. in animal welfare and stock management, someone from local lancers who have expertise in animal welfare and stock management, and also RSPCA and or Animal Welfare League, is the inference in that that none of those people are actually experts in animal welfare, including RSPCA and Animal Welfare League? Uh, from memory, uh, the way it is currently worded, the proposed clause would, I mean, it's a hypothetical, and of course that's what we're dealing with, but it would be possible on the current construction for there to not to be an animal welfare uh, expert. So all we want to do is uh, just ensure that there is always um, an animal welfare uh, expert. Now, I unfortunately don't know much about these stock welfare panels in terms of how they are uh, or the membership. So um, hopefully that will uh, you'll be able to ask questions of the RSPCA, etc. Yeah. Whether they are involved in those uh, in every stock welfare, it would just be to ensure that there is an animal welfare uh, expert on the panel because currently the way it's worded it would be theoretically possible for there not to be one because I think it's um, uh, experts in 
animal management or animal welfare? No, animal welfare or stock management. Or animal welfare or stock or? Also, oh, true, but it also has RSPCA and animal welfare leg on there. Uh, okay. Well, as long as that that is um, a, a mandatory component of a stock, that's that's all so we're we're that, seeking. Sorry. So the Honourable Taylor Martin. Thank you, Chair. I just want to ask, in regards to the inclusion or the possible inclusion of sentience into the legislation that's been brought up by other witnesses, and I think you brought it up in your opening statement, um, Ms Ward, how would that actually, what, what outcome would that achieve and how would it change the enforcement of the proposed laws? Uh, well, happily, we would have that all ahead of us to, to find out. Um, uh, it's just uh, um, you can't const uh, sort of um, introduce animal welfare legislation today without acknowledging the reason why we have animal welfare legislation as opposed to the welfare of tables legislation. Animals are sentient. That has to be acknowledged so that it provides that um, sort of interpretive tool mm -hmm. for, for interpreting the rest of the, the legislation, why it matters that we're not, um, not only are we not cruel to animals, but we do promote those positive um, well-being. So that, that could possibly be something that the minister includes in their second read speech? Potentially, in that, that explanatory would it... material is useful, but uh, why would you stop short of having it um, incorporated into the primary legislation? Other jurisdictions uh, have done it, are doing it. That is the direction that um, animal welfare legislation is moving. It would just be a great pity to see New South Wales left behind in this regard. Any other jurisdictions that that have included it recently? Well, the ACT, for one. Uh, Victoria has committed to, to using it. And I think the best example is the UK's um, Animal Sentience Bill, uh, which is all but all, almost passed. It's going through there, protracted. Uh, and that is, um, a, 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 that is an excellent uh, model for, for um, uh, incorporating the, the concept of sentience, which is not radical. It's, I think we have um, yeah. Professor Brown, etc. Science acknowledges it. Philosophy acknowledges it. Why is the law in New South Wales lagging so behind? We have one minute left, so I'll allow Ms Abigail Boyd to direct a follow-up question to Mr Robertson. Thank you. Um, the question really is coming off of this sentience discussion, which unfortunately we don't have that much time for now. But um, in terms of people who are opposed to the idea of embedding sentience within our animal welfare laws, can you explain, would it actually impose an undue burden or cost on, on industry or agriculture? And I'll direct that to you, Mr Robertson. Thank you for the question. Uh, in addressing that, I think there's, would it oppose an undue burden? Uh, invites questions about how much would it cost to take responsibility, not just for the animal's cruelty, which is negative states deemed necessary, but also for its positive states defined in the five freedoms in a, in a, a burgeoning volume of research papers that say positive states involves providing animal, persons in charge of animals, providing animals in their care with opportunities to experience positive states. Um, animal welfare progress, much like when we moved uh, to incorporated the principles of the five freedoms to our animal welfare, did have a cost to it. However, it was also recognised that there was a cost in not moving that way in terms of consumer trust, in terms of opportunities for trade, in terms of just the basics of how that human animal relationship got affected. Um, providing animals with opportunities to experience positive states is already practiced by 11, about 11% 11 of New South Wales producers, mirroring what's going on in other jurisdictions. It's, we come back to our opening statement that positive animal welfare duplicates your top, practice, your, your, your top performers. Um, so it's profitable. It's doable. The question is, um, you know, will, will New South Wales continue uh, just to protect um, animals against cruelty? Or will it incorporate positive animal welfare law that affects all people? And just as an interesting uh, soft soft knowledge um, I'm so sorry, Mr. Robertson, but we've run well over that one minute. 
sorry. And I am going to. I am going to actually have. We've gone past. We've gone past the time for this. But I, I do appreciate your evidence. And look, I want to thank all witnesses so much for attending this hearing and for the witnesses. Uh, sorry for the issues that you have brought out for us. It's been incredibly helpful. The secretariat will contact you in relation to any questions that you have taken on notice. So thank you very much. I'm now going to adjourn the hearing until 11.30 a.m. when we'll receive our new witnesses again. I'd like to uh, reopen the hearing, welcome the RSPCA and the Animal Welfare League of New South Wales um, to our hearing. Thank you very much for being available and joining us. Um, to begin with, I'd just like to ask witnesses to state their name and position and uh, take the oath or affirmation. Thank you. Elizabeth Arnott, Chief Veterinarian, RSPCA New South Wales. I'm sorry, can I just pause things here? Can we just check the microphones that they're working? That better? Yeah. Yes, and it's good to get these things checked as well. Thank you very much, Ms. Arnott. Uh, sorry, Dr. Arnott. Uh, Elizabeth Arnott, Chief Veterinarian of RSPCA New South Wales. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Ms. Jurd? Catherine Jurd, RSPCA General Counsel. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Mr Godwin. Matthew Godwin, uh, Animal Welfare League Chief Inspector. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Does the RSPCA have an opening statement? We do. Please proceed. Sorry. This inquiry represents the eighth occasion in two years that RSPCA New South Wales has provided the New South Wales Parliament with submissions in respect of vital issues of animal welfare. Animal welfare clearly remains at the forefront of the public, public consciousness and we welcome this opportunity to provide these comments in addition to advice given throughout the reform project. Number one, what hasn't changed? The process of legislative reform has clearly caused anxiety among stakeholders about what this could mean for them, their hobby or their industry. With the benefit of our experience and knowledge of the operation of the law, this alarm is not founded in the reality of the bill as drafted. The bill retains large parts of POCTA, particularly in the following respects. There are few changes to the powers of an authorised officer under the bill. An authorised officer has the same powers of entry Contrary to evidence given before this committee last week, an inspector can only enter a residential premises or part of a premises used for residential purposes with the consent of the occupier under the authority of a search warrant or if the authorised officer reasonably believes that an animal is in imminent danger and requires immediate veterinary treatment. Respectfully, that is the exact operation of the current section 24E of POCTA. The class of people with responsibilities for animals has not changed. Hunting, shooting and fishing remain exempt from liability under the bill where those activities cause no unnecessary harm. The retention of the unreasonably or unnecessarily test within the offence definition and the deletion of unjustifiably has caused some controversy. However, however there is no real change to the operation of these offence provisions. In nearly five years, I have prosecuted or been responsible for prosecuting 313 cases involving 9,057 animals on behalf of RSPCA New South Wales. The court has never expressed any difficulty in interpreting the phrase unreasonably and unnecessarily. The term reasonable occurs 98 times in the Crimes Act. They are common and uncontroversial standards used across the criminal law. Whilst some confusion is apparent, that is an educational piece that needs to be undertaken. It does not mean that the terms of otherwise well-functioning law should be changed. What has changed? The bill now explicitly refers to psychological suffering. For the last 40 years, it has been an offence to commit an act of cruelty as a result of which an animal is unreasonably, unnecessarily or currently unjustifiably inflicted with pain. Pain is defined in Section 4 of POCTA to include suffering and distress. It has also been an offence to torment or terrify an animal. These are all forms of psychological harm. 
This inclusion reflects the social consensus ethic that causing an animal mental anguish is not acceptable. This is not new and it has not been controversial in our experience of enforcing the law. The current framing fails regulators and the community by lacking clarity and transparency. The bill as drafted gives a modern approach that streamlines the legislation as is the objective of the reform. There have been some additions whereby animals must be provided with an appropriate environment, opportunities to exercise and display normal behaviours and require appropriate handling and transport. These are positive developments. However, the minimum care requirements should also refer to providing enrichment and social interaction, and they should also specify that an animal must be provided with an appropriately clean living environment. This change is necessary for animals distressed by having to live in hoarding situations. There are some areas that we identify for improvement. RSPCA New South Wales does not support combining the legislation and contends that the three acts as combined in the bill do not inherently fit together. The objects are generally well done, but for the failure to reference sentience and the confined aspirations described within them. The failure to reference sentience is significant. The reform project will fall at the first hurdle if it misses the opportunity to refer in its terms to sentience. Furthermore, there has been no explanation given as to what risk is ameliorated by excluding a reference to sentience. The bill could be strengthened in several other areas. Surgical artificial insemination of canines should remain a prohibited procedure, and any def defences and exemptions must be informed by contemporary animal welfare science. Specifically, there should, be not an, there should not be an exemption for police and corrections dogs. RSPCA New South Wales supports the extension of interim disqualification orders, but the test should include a list of factors for the court to consider rather than requiring the court to come to a conclusive determination about probability of reoffending. In conclusion, we say this bill represents a major project of statutory reform. It is obvious enough that this has not been the work of a moment, but it is an important moment. We have the chance to modernise animal cruelty laws in New South Wales for the future right now. To fail to take this opportunity risks both the law falling into obsolescence because it has not kept up with public sentiment, but worse, it risks failing animals in New South Wales now and in the future. Thank you. Uh, Mr Godwin. Uh, I, have, I have no, no statement to make. Thank you. Look, can I just start, before I call the Deputy Chair, can I just clarify one issue with the RSPCA? Um, and I've noted in your submission that you say the objects of the three current acts are inconsistent uh, with being served by one piece of legislation. Would you support um, the Act governing uh, animal research um, being continuing as a separate act and not inserted into this? It does seem that a lot of the exemptions seem to relate to trying to push that act into this one. I, I think the committee heard evidence, pretty um, um, convincing evidence this morning. I watched it. I was convinced by it. Um, we say that the objects of animal, the Animal Research Act and the objects of POMTA don't comfortably fit together. And as possible evidence of the difficulties that the drafters have met trying to achieve one consolidated piece of legislation. Yes. <laughs> In, indeed, yes. Um, possibly a round peg in a square hole. Um, and uh, as I say, I, I was pretty well convinced by the experts that from the universities and their eminent universities that the committee had before them. Yeah, the only thing I would add is they're a very discreet, unique group of stakeholders in this. Um, so for the rest of the community that have to uh, comply with uh, this act, it would be unusual that it would have other parts inserted that simply do not apply to the, to the broader community. Yeah. May I um, just make a point before we go into the other opening? We did have a paper to table in relation to our opening, if there's an opportunity to do oh, that. Oh, yes, so. thank you. If you wouldn't mind, that would be terrific. Well, thanks for clarifying that. I'll pass to the Deputy yeah. Chair now. Can I just before, before I go into my main other question I was going to ask, which was about tethering, but just on the objects, I think it's important that we hear why the objects of the bill are really important, both with regard to the compliance officers in your organisations, but also uh, from a legal framework or point of view. Why are the objects of the Act so important? So from a perspective of statutory construction, and by that I mean how a court will interpret a piece of legislation, 
If there's any ambiguity about how an offence provision is framed or a power creating provision is framed, the court will look to the objects to clarify what Parliament, by virtue of taking those objects into account, must have intended the operation of that provision to include. So, for example, um, in an application I made in respect of the interim, um, the interim disposal of a large number of animals in the RSPCA's custody, there isn't currently a test defined in Section 31.3 of POCTA, but the court said, mm. well, in accordance with ordinary principles of statutory construction, I'm entitled to take into account the fact that POCTA is designed to protect animals and therefore I'm convinced this is in the interest of these animals and I'll give you your application. So that's how it works in practice. Okay. And Mr Godwin, compliance, what, what, compliance officers, what, what are they, the objects of the Act are important, why do your compliance officers? I think for, um, for everybody on the ground, as far as inspectors, both Animal Welfare League and RSPCA are concerned, um, inspectors just want uh, legislation that can be easily applied and interpreted by the persons on the ground immediately in the situations that they find themselves, rather than having to wade through um, I guess sections that require uh, a more thorough look uh, and interpretation, so to speak. Um, the more simple, the more easily applied, uh, the easier it is for inspectors to make uh, critical, de critical decisions on the ground. Okay, thank you. Can I now the main part of my question is actually about section 342A, which is to do with tethering. Um, and you talk about uh, in the RSPCA submission um, the deficiency in the Act. Um, so, for example, the, the provision as drafted does not include uh, that a tethered animal can move freely or toilet itself. Um, what, are there any other jurisdictions that, have, uh, that we could go to that actually have provisions around tethering of animals? Now, I ask this, uh, my dad, I grew up in the high country, like, dad was a high country horseman and uh, he would never tether his horse. He thought that was the cruelest thing you could do to a horse. We just dropped the reins. So I'm actually pretty keen on this tethering issue. I think it's some of the current aspects, the current Act does not um, meet contemporary um, requirements. So if you could explain why you think Section 342A is deficient, and if there's a jurisdiction that has a, <clears throat> a clause or a provisions or a framework around tethering that we could look at for the bill, that would be good. I haven't done a review of the other states' um, you take that on notice. provisions in relation to tethering. Um, I will say that um, the offence provision as it is refers to um, being able to access water, obtain shelter from climatic extremes, unable to freely stand up and sit down. Standing up and sitting down is insufficient to meet the needs of an animal over a period of time. And frankly, if all you could do would, was sit up and stand up and sit down for even half an hour, that would be extremely restrictive, one would think. So um, the capacity to move about and, and more move away from where you toilet, where, where an animal chooses to toilet in a confined area, confined by the limits of the tether, that is. Um, I say that's, that can be relatively easily rectified in drafting, I think, and, and I think for the um, layperson to interpret what their responsibility would be under the new Act, um, a, a principle that the animal be able to move about freely, I think is easily interpreted in practice. Okay, thank you. Um, do, do, can me ask a follow-up question? Yeah, I've got a follow-up yeah, question too. So, just in relation to events like the Royal Easter Show, um, we've got different sorts of arrangements for different sorts of animals. So, for example, the horses would be stabled, but the cattle would be tethered. Uh, yes, often in the Easter shed. Show, yeah, that's right. And <clears throat> their stable hands are sort of removing their sort of toilet. Oh. Yes. So, I mean. I guess I'm, I'm trying to talk about the complexity. You wouldn't, yes. surely you wouldn't regard that as an activity that should cease, um, or do you? So I guess it's the complexity of how do you draft it. And I would, I mean, I would also be fully aware that to tether a dog mm -hmm. um, is, is, you know, like that's a bigger issue even than tethering a horse, which is not a good thing to do. Mm. Um, 
So I just wondered if you could get the nuance in terms of how you would draft anything about tethering that captured all the different situations. The, the preface to the section is that results in inappropriate or unreasonable outcomes for the animal. So it, it's unreasonable is something that can be determined okay. by the application of um, you know, experience and, and the terms within the legislation itself some, in, in some cases tell you explicitly what reasonable is constituted by or unreasonable might be constituted by. So if someone's removing the animal's excrement so that they are not sitting and standing within their own excrement for hours or days at a time, then from my perspective that would be a reasonable method of animal husbandry in respect of the, that particular animal. If on the other hand an, a dog is tethered and is unable to move further than you know the confines of the table in front of me. Weeks, yeah. Then I think um, the difference is obvious, respectfully. Yeah, I think. I mean, it's obvious to me, but I, I just don't know so if it's to. in the legislation. Mm -hmm. If it's yeah. obvious. I, it? I think your point about the complexity is a good one, and from an animal welfare perspective there are risks of securing an animal by its head and neck that are not common to other forms of confinement. So it inherently has some concerns around it. I think what makes it difficult in legislation, and I'm not going to offer a drafting as a veterinarian, but um, the to take every animal off a tether and say it's okay to confine it in circumstances where the limits around confinement are not sufficient potentially um, may not overall um, improve the welfare of the individual animal. So I think it needs to be looked at holistically about um, what is acceptable about confining an animal and for what periods of time um, that's, that, that is acceptable. Well, it's really more the outcome than the tether itself. It's the impact that it's having. I, the, the situation. Yeah, that's right. And I guess my, um, but there is that inherent risk because it is secured by his neck, risk, yes, um, and that is not common to um, being kept in a, a yard or a cage. I would say. Yeah. Thank you. I've just got a yeah. Sorry, I've just got another follow-up question about tethering because um, I, I know that dogs can get aggressive when they're left on a tether for a very long time. I've heard horror stories of dogs hanging themselves, jumping over fence on long tethers. Um, but one thing we get a lot of calls about in my office, I can't imagine how many calls you guys get, um, is just the constant uh, complaints of saying this dog's been tethered for months, um, the RSPCA or the Animal Welfare League have been out there, they said that they can't prove that the animal has been there tethered for longer than 24 hours in a court. Um, now the changes to this legislation is now for an unreasonable period because I know that before it was 24 hours so if they took the animal off the tether for five minutes put the back, animal back on how do you prove that they didn't do that um, do you think that for an unreasonable period fixes those enforcement challenges um, for proving that an animal was tethered um, you know in a cruel way or do we need to have you know a much more strict time limit in the way that say California does or something like that and I guess that's for Ms. Jurd and Mr. Goodwin. So I think um, the combination of the minimum care requirements in section 13 are, are, um, need to be taken into account at the same time. As it, it may be that a, an um, enforcement officer or the prosecutor would determine to proceed in respect of one and not the other, or both in the alternative to each other. So um, the minimum care requirement would not be met in my view if there were not appropriate opportunities to exercise being provided to the animal. And if the suggestion is that taking <clears throat> a dog off a tether for five minutes every 24 hours, possibly even half an hour every 24 hours over periods of days, weeks or months, would not meet the minimum care requirement in 13 to well, E, possibly F. Um, and if you take our submission that I referred to in my opening, that it, it's not enough that you give them the opportunity to exercise, it's that they need enrichment and social interaction um, either with members of the same or different species or with their humans. <coughs> yeah. Can I just ask, if you were prosecuting a case like that, would the behaviour and the physical condition of the animal be part of the evidence that you were presenting? Yes. And if those, 
If you didn't have any evidence that either was a problem, then you probably wouldn't be prosecuting the case. Is that a fair? Like if the animal was behaving happily and had no physical detriment? I guess as someone who's given expert evidence in respect of these types of cases, I think there's a couple of ways to approach it. One is uh, what you look at is whether there's been a significant deprecation of the animal's needs. So there's a couple of ways of looking at that. Absolutely what you're saying by examining the animal, and that might be behavioural observations, it might be um, pathological observations like pressure sores suggesting they didn't have a comfortable resting area, it might be by way of looking at um, uh, other health-related physiological measures, so that's true. But there's also a really large body of evidence emerging for some species about what it is then they have need for and what the consequences are of um, the long-term health and behaviour consequences of living in certain environments. So it is possible to draw on the evidence of um, what their environment is and, and what uh, damage <coughs> that is known to do in their species. I think also it's really relevant to refer to existing um, uh, guidelines that provide some really useful information about this. And when I give evidence, it's certainly useful to look at um, what the Department of Primary Industry says is acceptable. Um, it's useful to look at codes of practice if it's relevant to a breeding establishment that talk about the area that should be given to an animal. I mean, that's certainly relevant to the um, extent of the, the tether. So. Yes, looking at the animal is important in adducing their um, their mental and physical state, but I think there's also a lot of other evidence about how they might be impacted. Thank you. Sorry, I think Mr. Barrett. Oh, I'll leave it. Yep. Yeah. Can I, keep I, keep going. Yep. Thanks, Emma. And my last question before I hand over to everyone else. It's actually again drawing on the RSPCA submission. It's around um, uh, dogs in vehicles, uh, and you, you in your submission you talk about the inconsistency of the draft bill, but essentially what you're calling for is a power for an authorised officer to enter a vehicle where the animal, and I'm going to quote here, is in imminent danger of significant physical injury or harm. Um, can you just probably talk further to the committee about why you want that um, provision changed in the bill to reflect that? So it's the same statutory test that is in the current section 24E and I say is replicated in the draft bill um, act. Oh, section 60, uh, 59 and onwards, um, it's the same statutory test. So if you could enter somebody's home to achieve yeah. a, a um, diminution of risk in respect of an animal that's about to you know, um, significantly overheat or have really poor outcomes, um, if you can enter someone's home in those circumstances, then surely one could enter a vehicle in the same circumstances simply to remove the dog from that, or I say dog because normally it's a dog, um, yeah, but, but simply to remove the animal from the situation. Um, and I, I think the Animal Defenders Office agree with that provision that effectively it should have the same statutory basis for the power of or power of entry and an exemption from civil or criminal liability once that action is taken to remove the dog from that risky environment. Yep. Mr Goldman, does the Animal Welfare League support that? Yeah, we do. Yes, definitely. Just to clarify, sorry, you, no, okay. did, you, did you finish or you were still going? No, okay. okay. Uh, just to clarify, so in practice, the way it runs now, uh, Ms Jurd, is that you could have an RSPCA or an Animal Welfare League officer looking at a car with a dog near death and it hasn't reached the minutes required before that they've actually officially broken a law and there's nothing to be able to actually take that dog out. Is that as it stands now? Mm. Sort of just to, to kind of get right. this point that you're making in practice. I'm yeah, just looking up popped up at well, I'll fill in. Yeah. Um, it's already an offence to uh, cause distress, obviously. It's already an offence to um, expose an animal to excessive heat or cold. So. As I understand the point of adding a provision that puts a time and a temperature is it's only a benefit if it provides you the opportunity to prevent an animal from reaching that point. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't find the, area, uh, the section at the moment or the proposed section, but as I read it, um, well, firstly, if it doesn't allow you to intervene at that point, then it's of no purpose, but also <laughs> providing an exemption where if you park the vehicle in the shade, um, you know, it doesn't apply, then we're back to waiting for the animal to show 
signs of heat already stroke. be in so, distress. Yeah, so, so I'm not sure prevent that the harm happening. Yeah, otherwise, there's no real purpose to it. Section 37. 37. Yeah. Yeah. List yes. List it, was, yeah. it was just on the, the point I think that Ms. Jerd made that was about uh, strict li or protection from liability. So if, if, we're, if you're happy, Chair, for me to ask a question about that. Can I just check with Ms. Boyd. Were you asking about the same topic or a new topic? I was talking about the same topic. Do you mind if Chair goes first? Thank you. I just wanted to round that discussion out about um, uh, animals in cars. And I note that you have um, commented in your submission that the 28 degrees is not particularly helpful. Can you talk us through that and what your proposal is um, as an alternative? I guess I was providing the science in respect of um, how quickly harm can happen at lower temperatures. I would say we invite the inclusion of, um, of this provision. Uh, it's just to demonstrate that certainly there is nuance there. I would also, um, yeah, and I guess also just emphasise the point that diluting it further by way of reference to ventilation or shade is really putting those animals at significant risk. And I, I think um, I, I read re a reference in relation to the provision of ventilation, even where windows are cracked 40 centimetres, which you would think is low enough for a dog to actually jump out of the car, um, even where the windows are lowered to 40 centimetres. It doesn't really achieve very much in terms of um, reducing the temperature inside the vehicle once the ambient temperature is above 28 degrees. Actually, I think it was even above 25 degrees. So there, there's some science around, and I think we've provided <coughs> those references in the submission. Can I perhaps just ask you to take on notice to send us a specific proposal as to how that can work? What would be a good way of fixing that problem? Is that all right? Uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, certainly, in our submission, I uh, we do propose various temperatures um, where it could be considered an offence based on the risk to the animal. So, um, for example, any period where the temperature is above 30, de 30 degrees down to greater than 30 minutes when it's greater than 20 degrees Celsius. I think it probably um, then becomes a decision for policymakers about um, the application of that and whether that uh, is a complex. Um, I guess matter for the public to um, understand, uh, but certainly that is the science that I'm, I'm prepared to stand by that would um, protect the animals. That's from the risk. best solution, in your opinion. So the four dot points on page seven of our submission. I'm not sure if any of the enforcement officers have a view in terms of the, um, you, you know, that. the yeah. enforcement of such a provision, but I think it, it's based on sound science. Can I also just quickly ask, I mean, it's, it's restricted to dogs in, in, in the legislation. Um, and I know some of the submissions talked about, you know, people potentially leaving cats in carriers in cars if they're dropping into a vet or, or a lizard or a rabbit. Should we be less prescriptive of, of a species? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Vanessa. Yeah, can I just go to you, Mr. Jared, just picking up your comments about protection from liability and I know from your submission that you support that inclusion of section 121. Mm -hmm. I just want to get your, I guess, your learned legal opinion in terms of how far that protection from liability goes. Given you, you raise that example of us smashing a window, then obviously the officer <coughs> would be liable for replacing the window because they're acting in good faith. But I guess as another example, if you, if the RSPCA inspector sees dogs and then those dogs were returned uh, in worse physical condition than when they were seized. Um, would this protection from liability stop those officers from being charged for animal cruelty or the RSPCA shelter who was housing those animals? Would that stop them from being charged with animal cruelty? Um, so I, I can't adopt the premise of your question that a dog would leave RSPCA custody in worse condition than it was seized from. But we'll, we'll probably get to the evidence of that in another inquiry, but in theory, mm -hmm. would this protection from liability uh, allow for that to occur? The way statutory exemptions work in respect of um, things undertaken by law enforcement officers is that as long as it's done in good faith and in accordance with the exercise of the officer's powers under the legislation, they are the, that is the twofold statutory test for the provision of the liability exemption. So as long as um, the officer A was an authorised officer, 
be was acting in accordance with their powers under whatever act you're talking about, and C was done in good faith, then the liability exemption would protect them, yes. Okay. But it doesn't, the liability exemption doesn't operate indefinitely into the <clears> future. Right. And I guess the complexity would be that the person that was seizing the animal wouldn't necessarily be the person that was caring for the animal at the shelter. It would be two, two separate officers too, wouldn't it? Well, and it, it may not even be the RSPCA shelter. It may be a registered veterinarian in Timbuktu. It, or it, it could be any number of um, an exotic specialist or animals seized by the RSPCA end up being cared for in a, a variety of ways and in a variety of locations. Thank you. Got some questions. Um, Sorry, before I oh, move yeah. to you, <coughs> Mr Barrett. Yes. Um, just a couple. Um, Sorry, Mr. Gordon, probably not for you. Well, anyone that's been in stock work, involved in stock welfare panels? Uh, no, I don't have any experience there. RSPCA then, can we, can we just briefly touch on them and how successful they've been in, I guess, averting animal welfare issues further down the track? Yeah, so I, I don't have the um, exact statistics at my fingertips, but as I understand it, only about half of the matters that proceeded to stock welfare panel resulted in an order for the seizure or sale of the stock that was the subject of that panel. The inference being that half the time the primary producer, quote unquote, comes to the party and things get rectified for the animals on the ground where they stand, you know, in the paddocks that <coughs> they have lived in their whole, their whole lives. Um, on the other 50% of times, obviously, the inference is that it's necessary for a power to be exercised currently pursuant to sections 24Q and 24P of POCTA to seize and sell those animals to prevent further distress. And do you think you'll have similar results extending that into intensive agriculture as well? Um, I haven't inquired of the inspectorate what their anticipation might be. Like, I, I can't speak to what they expect might be the outcome. Um, there is some difficulty in um, obtaining expertise um, in relation to some of the factors that the Stock Welfare Panel considers and so, um, I mean, it requires some specific evidence. Yeah, I guess my addition to the comments is that I think um, in principle the Stock Welfare Panel process is really valuable. I think having a mix of expertise and stakeholders, including New South Wales farmers, involved in what can be an educative process, particularly in circumstances that are very complex. Some of the people, the subject of these panels, have, um, I, it appears, would have some significant mental health challenges and um, a, a range of um, difficult circumstances. So where they can be um, interacted with in a, in a process that uh, attempts to assist them with advice and um, is going to be positive. Um, and also allow them to potentially uh, be remunerated for the sale of animals that m might otherwise be um, subject to dying in a paddock. So I think the principle is sound. Um, and in terms of statistics, I think um, over a, a two-year financial year period, um, around 2017, um, 18, 19, there were about 23 panels. There were 15,000 animals um, that had oversight through the process. So it, it seems to be important. As far as intensive um, uh, livestock situations, I think the, because of the scale of those operations, the potential for things to go very um, badly um, if uh, someone was to run out of resources for those animals um, or there was a threat of infectious disease, I think is really um, significant. So having a way to um, find solutions for those animals, um, whether that be redistribution um, in non-disease situations to other producers um, and to act before the point at which um, they are too cruel to be kept alive, I, I think has merit. Thank you. Um, just on this uh, list of procedures you've mentioned in there in your submission where you sort of put age limits on um, by when they should be performed, mulesing, dehorning, castrating, um, tying of sheep. Having those age limits on, I guess, can I infer from that that although these mightn't be very pleasant things, they're actually seen as necessities and provide better animal welfare outcomes over looked at in the whole of life context? 
I wouldn't holistically answer yes to all the procedures. I would say obviously there are husbandry procedures that um, do confer some benefits or some um, uh, they have some necessity in a, a farming context. However, not without pain relief. The need to put in age limits is purely to circumvent a requirement to have um, mandatory pain relief for painful surgical procedures because we're trying to look at the science on the point at which it might be less aversive or they recover a bit better. So absolutely our preference would be to just um, acknowledge the availability um, and accessibility of pain relief and use them in painful <coughs> procedures. Thank you. Ms. Thank you. Um, under the new bill, the RSPCA and the Animal Welfare League will only be able to do proactive inspections where they have a reasonable suspicion. Um, uh, uh, and, and I'm just wondering, um, specific, and that's sort of specifically um, around agriculture, commercial and industrial activity relating to animals being carried out. Um, I'm just wondering, um, in regards to enforcement, whether there's going to be challenging circumstances um, where people are operating a commercial animal business inside their homes um, and what that's going to mean on the ground um, if somebody was, um, for example, breeding animals inside the home. I might throw that to Mr Goodwin first, I think, <clears throat> and that you'd probably been doing some of that enforcement. Yeah, I think that, I mean, currently we, I mean, if it's, if the, the, where the business is being conducted is considered a dwelling, there's restrictions in which we operate under, at the moment, um, I think. If they're tighter, that you, you um, that, so essentially the bill will say that, um, you know, you, you have to gather a lot of evidence before you can actually enter a property. Um, you have to have a reasonable suspicion. Um, so are you concerned about that extra sort of level of evidence that you need to be able to provide if there was concern of an animal inside? Um, you, you potentially, yes. I think it, if there is animals inside a dwelling currently that the information that we're receiving to form part of the cruelty complaint would generally dictate that there's something uh, occurring within that dwelling. We would take measures to seek the appropriate um, method of entry um, or other existing ways around having to enter the dwelling to investigate that potential or alleged cruelty. Um, and then in my experience, um, what has been discovered upon initial investigation of such offences has then given us the evidence that we require to maybe uh, apply for a search warrant, things like that. Thank you. Um, I'll give you an opportunity to say something to Ms. Jo. Thank you, Ms. Hurst. Um, the powers to enter premises at, at section 66 and 67 of the draft bill, mm -hmm. are, it's not as simple as residential or non-residential. It's residential, non-residential or commercial, commercial within a, a within commercial outside property, of the dwelling, yeah. within a residential premises. Yes. So um, Pocter was worried about dwellings. The Crimes Act worries about dwelling houses. And the animal welfare bill is, I expect, trying to circumvent both of those <coughs> problems by using something different, i.e. residential premises, to avoid the difficulties in interpretation where similar but different, so residential versus residential premises, are used in two different acts. Um, so I think that's relatively well done. In terms of your question about proactive inspections, um, section 66 1F allows, um, as long as it's conducted at a reasonable time, entry to monitor mm -hmm. um, and enforce compliance with the Act or regulations where the authorised officer reasonably suspects an agricultural, commercial or industrial activity related to animals is being carried out. As long as that reasonable suspicion can be grounded, for example, in evidence that the inspector has and holds reasonably um, a suspicion that, for example, a breeding enterprise is being, breeding facility is being conducted within a house, 
um, then the, to the extent that the breeding facility occupies some of the residential premises, they would be entitled to enter to inspect the breeding premises. Okay, thank you for that. I also wanted to clarify, um, um, and you mentioned uh, Ms. Jurd in your opening statement um, around the disqualification orders um, that can be made in court when, when they're considered likely to commit another offence. Um, now, this was something that, that I had pushed for, so I, I want to make sure that we get it right. Um, if you believe that in practice, um, it's not it's not good how it's worded now. Um, so, in your experience, how difficult is it for the RSPCA to actually obtain a disqualification order um, with the terms that are used now, um, and are courts reluctant to impose them? And if so. You know how do we how do we fix this? So the section 26 def, de, I withdraw that the section 26 definition in POPDA of disqualification order has that big broad meaning that used to come 31 little a little b little c with all of the one two threes right. So what we've done is fix that so it's easier for the court to order it because all they have to say is in accordance with section 31 I, I impose it, the following order. Um, but the likely to commit further animal cruelty offences can be a difficult bar to reach because often animal cruelty defendants are not otherwise known to the criminal law. So there, there can be um, there are matters regularly where six animals die in a house on one person's watch, but they are otherwise unknown to the RSPCA or the criminal law. So proving to the court's satisfaction that they are likely to commit a further offence relies only on the fact that it's happened on one occasion previously. Now, I think we do a decent job of arguing that there is enough evidence that six deaths is sufficient, that the court shouldn't risk that person. Whatever wheels have fallen off to cause the death of six animals are such that the court should restrict the animal's ownership of animals for a reasonable time into the future possibly three or five years. But beyond five years on a first offence, it can be very difficult. And when you say that they are otherwise unknown to the courts, mm. is this, I know um, I've spoken to quite a few people in this space about it, that there seems to be two different systems. So they could actually be in the other system, but sometimes that doesn't reach the RSPCA, that doesn't reach the Animal Welfare League, and it often doesn't reach the courts, even if they've got other criminal records. Is that what you also hinting at or are you saying or that child they are protection brand issues? Was that sorry? Or child protection issues before the court. Yeah. Mm. So um, that has to a certain extent been rectified by virtue of the <clears throat> RSPCA New South Wales Police MOU that allows the convictions um, recorded and sentence outcomes obtained in respect of RSPCA prosecutions to be um, placed onto a person's criminal record. That is a project that commenced um, um, possibly July of last year and there is the capacity to back capture some of the court outcomes. So that's a project that's ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, no, what I mean is truly unknown. I mean there's, there there's no evidence offenders. that that person, because I mean I, as a <coughs> prosecutor appearing on sentence, I tender a person's criminal history which the police prosecutor provides to the court in court. So I know what's on their police history. I know the inspector knows whether or not they've come to our notice and more often than not they know whether they've come to Animal Welfare League's notice too. The conversations between the enforcement agencies are pretty good on this front and there is also the alternative to um, submit an I ask request to New South Wales Police for information or intel rather than criminal records. So. Um, I think that gets covered pretty well. It's just these people are truly otherwise unknown to the criminal law in, in a not dissimilar way to what the court says and there's Court of Criminal Appeal authority about sex offenders. Mm. They are often before the court for their first ever infringement of any sort. Mm. Um, so it, it, it is in my experience of 15 years prosecuting. Um, it's not uncommon. The main concern we have is getting disposal orders whilst a matter is still on foot. So, um, because disqualification orders <clears throat> are kind of that catch all, the, the Section 26 disposal orders can be quite difficult because the court is reluctant to appear to prejudge the matter that's before them for good reason. It's my job to prove beyond reasonable doubt, if I can, 
that a person committed an offence. And the court says rightfully to me, well, how can I order the disposal of an animal, and by disposal I mean forfeiture, of an animal in your custody before I've found the person guilty or not guilty? Right now they retain the presumption of innocence and you, you need to satisfy me that this is appropriate. And so that's why in our submission I refer to a list of factors that I think should be included as factors for the court to consider rather than a, determin a conclusive determination would, likely to do, would be likely to do this again. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a bar that it's the just court's going to have mm. trouble um, convincing themselves of. Yeah. Okay. No, that Even where, sense. for example, a person has a prohibition order that they're not allowed to have more than five horses. Mm. The RSPCA has 46 horses in its custody. Mm. I can't return at least 41 of them. <laughs> So what do we do? I need an order from the court to allow us to adopt those horses out, Yeah. for yeah. example. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I've got some questions. Um, sorry, I know, I know Ms Boyd has some questions. I've just got some questions about the enforcement of the minimum care requirements or minimum care standards um, and how they'll work in practice. I'm just wondering how difficult you think it could be to prove in court um, that an animal's been deprived of clean water for 24 hours um, or um, shelter if they've been um, inside for 30 minutes once a day. Um, you know, if, if this is uh, this whole idea of a 24 hour time frame, whether that's practical from an enforcement point of view. Do you want to say something? Sorry, I'm, I don't want to hold the answers. No, you, by all means. Um, so the statutory presumptions that are at, um, you know, 15, 1, B, 16, 1B, 17, 1B. They're just presumptions. So um, that they are not the be all and end all of working out whether an offence contrary to section 13 has happened. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, um, for example, if a neonate kitten isn't provided with um, appropriate, appropriate? Sufficient, whatever, oh, yeah. appropriate drink, um, they've changed it from proper and sufficient to appropriate drink, um, which in that case would be milk, like cat milk. Um, I think one then, of them was about, it actually says in the new bill, water, which was something that I was concerned with because I thought, a pro I think Pocta was appropriate drink and now it's water. Sorry, I don't have it in right in front of me, but I did. I was wondering about that. Yes, I think it goes in another section, it says appropriate drink. drink. 13, one, no, no, withdraw that. 13.2 little a says access to appropriate food and drink. Yeah. So that's sufficient in my drink. view. Uh, okay, so we can use that um, in, in, instead of the water one. I mean, if 16.1 said mm. drink, I don't think that would, or, or appropriately clean drink. Uh, the point is that often the access to water is not water that any animal would choose to drink. Mm. Um, so the, the cleanliness of the water is um, relevant there, and I would urge you not to throw the baby out with that water. Um, yeah. So keep the cleanliness, but um, if you want to change it to drink, then. Oh, oh no, no. I think that yeah, there was. One, I think it was actually transporting animals, and it said they must have water or something. I don't, sorry, I don't. I haven't written it down, but I remember when I was reading through it. But I think you're right. I think you could always go back to the minimum care requirements where it does say drink, whereas somewhere else it do. was talking about water which I sort of thought, well, don't we want appropriate drink? But So that 24 hours kind of statutory presumption in four and a half years, I've never used it. Yeah, don't that's what I thought, it. yeah. Okay. Because proper and sufficient happens at the point that it's required. And if there's not proper and sufficient water in the midst of a 38 degree day in the middle of a paddock and there's 45 horses on the paddock, if there's not water then so you think I, that, I that would hold up in court if, yes. if they said, no, no, I was just getting water, I was changing it. That, that's yeah. not something that no. happens in practice. And it's not our, our, the harm we're trying to ameliorate is not um, an allegation that water hasn't been provided for 24 hours, it's days. Hmm. Or there's evidence of dehydration. So particularly in neonates, there will be um, expert veterinary evidence about dehydration. Thank you. Before I call, um, for um, Mr Graham to ask the next question. I'd just like to mention that uh, Peter Poulos has joined us. He's a member of this committee and I could see that startled you when that happened. <laughs> so I just want to clarify for the witnesses. 
Please proceed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for your submissions, Ms Jurd. I just want to ask about one aspect of it. On page 12 of your submission, you talk about the enforcement arrangements and the idea of an independent office of animal welfare. Um, you refer back to your submission to the animal cruelty inquiry. In that submission, you advocate strongly for the good work of the RSPCA, and I, I think we should take that as given. What that submission doesn't answer, though, is acknowledging that good work, acknowledging where we are now, would there be arrangements put in place to do this better, uh, working from here? Can I invite you to address that question, acknowledging the figures you gave us at the start of your introduction about prosecutions and animals protected? Mm. What do you want to say to us on that question about uh, why there shouldn't be an independent office of animal welfare that builds on the good work you've done to date? I say that based on what I understand to be the various positions taken as to how and or what an independent office would look like, and even last Wednesday, there were three questions about how that independent office would be framed. There, there is not respectfully consensus amongst those advocating for the independent office about what it looks like. So absent some specificity about how it would be arranged, where it would be located, who would have responsibility for budgeting it, things like that, to my mind, additional bureaucratic oversight is um, not it is not potentially going to address the harm that it tries that it that it claims to be trying to address. So um, it's from my perspective not a quote unquote hard no. It's a I haven't seen detail which would give me comfort that what we would that what it was a pr proposing to achieve would in fact for the money spent to achieve it do what it needed to do. If that decision was taken uh, to establish such an office, what role would you see for the RSPCA in an ongoing role? The same role we've played for 90 years. Uh, in that submission, which is back in December 2019, you identified the number of um, staff allocated to the inspectorate at the time it was 43, and the uh, funding allocated at, at the time $6.2 million. What are those updated figures as we sit here today? I don't have those, and, and I expect they'll be provided on Monday of next week to the ACO inquiry. Yeah, so you well, can I invite you for the purposes of this inquiry to take that on notice, uh, acknowledging you'll be providing it elsewhere? Yes. Thank you, Ms Boyd. Um, I just want to round out the, um, the discussions that we were having um, in our first hearing in relation to the surgical um, artificial insemination. Um, on page nine of your submission, um, sorry, of the RSPCA <coughs> submission, um, right at the top there, there's a quote, um, or it's a statement that I'll quote to you. It says, unwillingness of some veterinarians to acquire the skills or equipment to undertake transphagical artificial insemination is an insufficient justification for, for permitting the unnecessary procedure where expert opinion within the profession confirm it as outdated, end quote. Um, does that really sum up what this whole debate is about? Is it about um, vets not having the current sort of skills and procedures? And is there a way perhaps with a, you know, a, a sort of an implementation period or something else that we could get this prohibited in a way that might be more acceptable? I don't know, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know to what extent individual veterinarians are having trouble with this, whether it's just um, not keeping up to date with the science or whether it's concern about um, learning a new procedure. I have genuine um, sympathy reading the uh, uh, submissions by um, dog breeders about their interpretation of what this means for them because it is, it is not accurate. I, please stop me if I'm labouring on something you know. I'm happy to, um, to go on. But the focus on frozen semen and lack of genetic diversity is clearly driven by a belief that there is no other way to get com comparable uh, litter sizes and conception rates than surgical AI. We've tabled a paper that, um, well, it's a letter to the editor, but it I think is a good um, a synthesis of the information and references to the relevant um, studies that can assure you and dog breeders that 
the fertility rates and litter sizes are the same, if not better, than surgical artificial insemination. We can also provide you um, with a link of a one-minute video that demonstrates a dog undergoing um, a transcervical insemination, um, and it, it is well um, accepted and um, has caused uh, no concerns for that dog and is done in less than five to ten minutes. For those reasons, continuing to undertake an anaesthetic and a surgery whereby the results are no uh, greater but that you're subjecting an animal to an anaesthetic and a surgery, which is in, in several animals going to be repeated two months later by way of caesarean section, cannot be justified. I understand that uh, if veterinarians have not availed themselves with the um, ability or equipment to do the procedure, that it, um, it might justify some um, sort of um, implementation period. I would note that it's a statutory requirement for veterinarians under the Veterinary Practices Code of Conduct to um, make evidence-based decisions with their clinical practice, to stay, a, a, a bridge, um, stay aware of um, current standards of practice and to put animal welfare, um, keep animal welfare in mind during their practice. So if the advice from um, uh, perhaps the regulator is that that is not in fact the state of compliance, then I would defer to them on, on if that if that needed a period of introduction. Thank you. Can I ask on that issue, because a lot of animal hus husbandry involves breeding for an attribute, yes. um, and artificial insemination is certainly with cattle, which is, I grew up on a cattle farm, I know that that's one of its uses. Um, the dog, uh, one of the dog groups suggested to us that the police and the military are breeding are using artificial insemination to breed certain attributes um, in the, there's a certain type of dog. They're not just taking any puppy dog into this sort of work. So I just wondered um, <clears throat> if you could respond to that, because that does appear to be a reason. Um, it's a sort of suggested that there isn't any reason, but I'm assuming that they would say there are behavioural characteristics which also appear to have some sort of genetic... Yeah. So my PhD is in behavioural genetics of working dogs oh. and I have full respect of the... the right person. <laughs> <laughs> I have full respect for um, really selective breeding decisions because it ends up with good welfare. You get less wastage if an animal is fit for purpose. Uh, that is why some people want either for genetic diversity or um, for selection of a particular sire to buy interstate or overseas semen and for it to be transported it needs to be frozen. So totally accept that and um, that makes perfect sense. However, that semen can as successively be used with transcervical insemination. That seems to be the it's leap the that's not being, yeah, that's not being understood um, or agreed with. but. I mean, you've been provided with lists of um, peer-reviewed published literature. I mean, there was one specifically back in 2005 um, in 137 greyhounds. So we know it to have good results. Um, it actually, by all accounts of the registered specialists in um, reproduction, is something that can be easily learned in general practice. It's just that vets are very comfortable with that accessing of a uterus because we desex animals a thousand times a year. You know, we could do it with our eyes closed, but it doesn't. It doesn't mean that it has to continue like that necessarily. Thank you, and I really appreciate the clarification. And perhaps if we might provide the link to the committee members, it's 58 seconds. Dr. Arnott sent it to me last night, and I was astounded by it as a non veterinarian. Mm -hmm. The dog hops off the table at the end. But to the point of earlier questions, last week is if it is a, um, an act of veterinary science, then there's nothing stopping the um, provision of sedation, which is, um, you know perfectly acceptable if required. Thank you so much. Sorry, Ms. Hughes, I tried to ask one yes, final question. Um, goes to the uh, section 103 about annual reporting, and I note, um, Ms. Jurd, that the RSPCA said they support ACOs coming to Parliament, um, but you note additional administrative and personal impost um, in doing so, and specifically you mentioned the $500,000. Is it purely a financial thing or are there other factors when you talk about administrative and personal impost and how may the committee uh, secretary or how may this uh, parliament 
ease that personal and administrative impost? By personnel, I mean we have one administrative officer who has, is responsible for compiling the statistics necessary to report um, on a 12 monthly basis as it is pursuant to section 34B of POCTA. So it's not a personal objection, it's a personnel issue. Yeah, that's what I'm, yeah. Issue. So um, it's just a purely a it's, it's purely It is a just, costing. we have a single administration officer, okay. we're a charity and, and so it, it is what it is. Um, th there is an impost for additional oversight. But since December of 2019, I think um, Mr Graham referenced our reporting, we have evinced and we are attending today, we're attending next Monday, I was here for Greyhounds in December. It's a, we are very happy to assist the Parliament and, and individual committees this way. Can I thank the witnesses very much for your evidence today and also thank you for the very important work that you do. Um, often not fully understood and I appreciate uh, the time that you've taken particularly to assist the Parliament. Um, so. The Secretariat uh, will follow up with you uh, in relation to any questions that were taken on notice. Certainly. And um, I'll send the link to the Secretariat. That would be terrific. And they can then circulate to the members. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much. And uh, I might just begin by inviting each of you uh, to state your name and position and take the oath or affirmation. So from Dogs New South Wales, uh, Ms Lind Brand. Yes, Mrs. Lynette Brand. Lynette um, Brand, thank you. Oh no. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you, Ms. Crofts. Deirdre Crofts, Dodge New South Wales. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Mr Michael Donnelly. Yeah, Michael Donnelly, President, Animal Care Australia. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Mr Davis. Fabio Davis, Animal Care Australia, Vice President. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Do Dogs New South Wales have an opening statement? Yes, we do. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, to the Honourable Catherine Cusack and members of the Committee of Inquiry, Dogs New South Wales welcome the opportunity to reply in person today, giving continued support to the intent of the Draft Animal Welfare Bill 2022 to provide the highest standards of animal welfare in all animals. Since the days of Prime Minister Paul Keating and Professor Hilmer, there has been a concerted effort to reduce unnecessarily regulation by state and federal governments. We need to question the need for any increased government intervention and new legislation and ask what purpose does it serve? For example, regulation of the number of litters per bitch and the limits on breeding age, if there is no need to be served, there should be no legislation. In addition, Dogs New South Wales already does regulate as per many of these regulations. The key areas which Dogs New South Wales have concerns in this bill are providing feedback on a document which refers to regulations that are not provided or complete, clarification on determination of excessive heat or cold, exhibited animals as a definition that affects our particular organisation, the transporting of dogs as in the definition of vehicle, powers to enter premises particularly are of concern to us as how this can be achieved without a warrant which is required by police to enter premises. We do object strongly to this and the lack of provision of appeal, which we think is a complete denial of natural justice. The level of penalty most would not be affordable by many by legal representation. There is no provision for witness or support which could lead to our member being fearful, intimidated and confused at the least. The question of surgical insemination this question has arisen as to whether surgical insemination of bitches should be allowed. One might also discuss whether male children should be circumcised without anaesthesia. This discussion is outside the terms of reference of this inquiry. Surgical insemination is performed by registered veterinarians who are regulated already by a number of state acts, principally the Veterinary Practice Act 2003, Acts of cruelty are already covered under the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act 1979. Veterinarians are also governed by a strict code of conduct. 
it is inappropriate and outside the terms of reference of this committee to sit in judgment of specific procedures within a long list of acts of veterinary science. Dogs New South Wales is the primary recognised body of registered canines in New South Wales, spanning many decades in areas where our organisation maintains health, physical and mental educational areas, where our members' dogs are involved in confirmation showing sheepdog trials, earth dogs, agility, tracking, obedience, scent work and draft work, to say a few. Each of our members has a unique traceable membership number. All members' dogs have a unique identifying number. All members' dogs have an independent microchip number, which is verified in, in, in identifying a Dogs New South Wales registration mm. certificate. All our members must complete a written theory examination before being allocated a breeder's accreditation, and all premises are physically inspected by a Dogs New South Wales approved premise prefix inspector before a breeder's prefix is issued. A Dogs New South Wales Code of Ethics enforces restricted breeding of females with no more than two litters in two years and a minimum age of females to be bred for smaller breeds and larger breeds. Dogs New South Wales has a maximum number of litters that a female can have in a lifetime and an age limit on breeding. Excuse me, I, I do apologise for interrupting. Do you, I, it's just that, um, just in terms of the terms of reference and the inquiry, I was just wondering if you had any other brief comments in relation to an opening statement on the on the logistic framework. Um, the logistic framework, yep. Thank you. Sorry, I do apologise. We've only got 45 minutes. So. Okay, just in conclusion, we've demonstrated and actioned the intent of most areas of the above bill in its own regulations. There are, however, some incongruencies and Dogs New South Wales look forward to continued collaboration with the Department of New South Wales Primary Industries in the support of all animal welfare. Thank you. Thanks for your cooperation. Thank you. Uh, does animal care? Yeah, we do. Thank you. Yeah, yep, Chair. Um, I ask that first our statement be tabled, if that's okay. Yes, please. No problem. Animal Care Australia, or ACA, represents keepers and breeders of animals nationally. Our goal is to promote and encourage high standards in all interactions with the animals in our care. Firstly, to start off with, we have a new Animal Welfare Act with no definition of animal welfare. ACA has detailed recommendations in our submission, but some key points we'd like to highlight are education to me measurably improve animal welfare outcomes must be enshrined within the Act. The implementation of a companion animals welfare panel, similar to that of a stock welfare panel. Enforcement activities must be subject to strict <coughs> accountability and transparency provisions, which are currently missing from this draft. These matters must be resolved, particularly given we have no draft regulations. We recommend this committee insist both the final bill and regulations are provided together for consideration of the New South Wales Parliament. ACA encourages animal welfare education over restrictive regula regulation. Education must be legislated to measurably improve animal welfare outcomes in our uh, open and opinion that the draft does not currently do this. Education includes the continued promotion of animal welfare standards and codes of practice. ACA is disappointed there is no requirement within the bill for key stakeholder collaboration or inclusion in the development, management and promotion of standards or codes of practice. This must be included in the Act. History tells us it should not be presumed that we would be invited to collaborate. As key stakeholders, we haven't been included on the Animal Welfare Advisory Council either. A companion animals welfare panel will provide an opportunity to alleviate the intimidation experienced by pet owners and to educate and improve animal welfare. ACA is astonished the draft bill, despite its title, is predominantly void of strategies for improving animal welfare outcomes. A minimum standard of care, although supported by ACA, does little to improve animal welfare. In fairness, the opportunity for this may exist within the regulations, but how would we know that when we have no draft regulations? For example, as has been previously stated by other witnesses, what would be exempt from or included as exhibited animals? This draft bill removes liability of the authorised officers and their organisations while making very little effort to improve their accountability or transparency. How can the New South Wales Government or the DPI claim the enforcers will be held accountable if they are not being held liable for their actions? Charitable organisations should not have the power to act as the police, prosecution, judge, jury and media all at once. This is wildly out of step with all other legal structures in our society. And for this reason, ACA is calling for the prosecutorial powers to be removed from the charitable organisations. 
This should not come as a surprise to this committee, as several states have, or have or intend to remove the RSPCA as prosecutors of cruelty cases for a range of reasons. Additionally, we do not support previous suggestions of allowing third parties to prosecute. We also call your attention to the submission from the Australian Privacy Foundation, which we fully support. The ambiguity of section 66.2 allows for the breeding of companion animals to be classed as a commercial activity and therefore voids the requirements of entry outlined in section 67 for residential premises. This is of great concern, potentially allowing the chaos of the recent dog audits to be repeated, but on a broader scale. We would like to thank the chair and the committee for inviting us to appear here today and we welcome your questions. Thank you very much. Mr Veach is going to ask the first question. Thank you. Can I, um, Mr Donnelly, in the submission from Animal Care Australia, um, I think page five, bottom of page five going on to page six, you talk about um, the need to, uh, the separate legislation relating to the breeding of dogs and cats be united under one department and not split across the current three departments. You talk about the fact that there's the Department of Prime Ministries, Office of Local Government and the Department of Planning as it relates to zoning and planning laws. So I just, wh why is that a problem, having those three departments in that, in that process? <clears throat> and um, if it was to be brought under one department, then beg the question, which department? Uh, the, to answer your last question, it would be the DPI under the current, under our current uh, belief and understanding. They are pre predominantly responsible for animal welfare, um, and then all of the rest of these things do fall in under that thereafter. So even though the Companion Animals Act is supposed to be uh, in relation to councils and how they <coughs> behave and how they interact with approving DAs and things like that, there is no current reason why that can't be also taken over under, by, under the DPI. Our biggest issue is we're doing all of these consultation processes, including with the upcoming review of Companion Animals Act that we've already participated in for their review of their online pet registry. We get to a point, we ask a specific question about can this be done or why is this being done? And the first response we get, that's outside our purview, that's that other department. So we're trying to deal with an issue of puppy farming or we're trying to deal with an issue of dog breeding or cat breeding and we're only getting or being able to respond to a part of the issue because the rest of it falls under someone else's department. If it all fell under one department and it all was then able to be combined and we were able to be liaised with just one department and resolve a lot of these issues together, that way it would make a hell of a lot more sense. The DPI does prosecutions but it doesn't actually investigate. Uh, actually, DPI do investigate. They actually have inspectors that investigate exhibited animal licence holders and they'd carry out the full audits and they carry out all of the investigations and they'd also then pursue the prosecutions where appropriate. Okay. Um, anyone else want to jump there? Okay, okay. okay. Thank you. Can I just, your opening statement, you spoke about the need for a definition of animal welfare. Um, there's been lots of discussion around the objects of the bill over the last couple of days with this committee and, and in the submissions, but also within the, de the definitions provided in the bill. Um, what would be your definition of animal welfare? Um, and uh, I guess the second part of my question is actually to do with the objects of the bill. So if it's one of the definitions, do you not think the objects of the bill adequately def provide guidance around animal welfare? No, the objects don't provide adequate guidance um, at all. And if you'll, if you'll note in our submission, we actually recommend the changing of part of that, of one of those objectives to include more inclusion of that. And one of the biggest issues that we also find in, in relation to the objects is that they are, they're split. It's like there's an object for regulation, there's an object, there's no actual object to improve animal welfare. There's just an object that says we will protect animal welfare. There's a huge difference in just protecting what's there than improving it, which isn't that supposed to be the goal of a new act, of an Animal Welfare Act. It's, it's, we're supposed to be advancing our animal welfare. We're not supposed to be staying status quo. Okay. And, and so do you have a, a and As for the animal welfare uh, definition, Animal Care Australia is looking at a couple of different, defi have, has looked at a couple of different definitions. Last week, one of the witnesses before you actually recommended one of the internationally <coughs> recognised definitions. Um, so far, that probably would be the one we would be going with, but I can take that on question on notice and come back to you with one, which one we would prefer as a committee. I'd rather go back to the committee and lock that in before okay, answering you. you. Thank you, Chair. I've got Could I add to, um, on, the, on, on what you're talking about with the objects, um, I guess ACA's main um, push 
is that we should really be spending the money on educating the community in general to improve animal welfare outcomes. Um, and, and from our experience, I mean, a lot of DPI staff sort of say to us, well, that's for later. Um, later never happens. So we, we feel really strongly that that needs to be enshrined in the Act. Because um, at the moment, it's, it's one of the objects sort of, although it doesn't say improve, and yet there's, there's really very little that follows anywhere within the Act to actually improve animal welfare outcomes across. It, it all just becomes a compliance and enforcement document. Brian, do you have any views about these matters? Well, I do also. Deidre can talk on this too, because Deidre is our animal welfare and liaison community officer as well. Thank you. Uh, okay. With enforcement, um, I have to say, with, generally with the enforcement officers, they attend premises with the assumption of guilt and then a person needs to prove their innocence. That is in contradiction with Australia, well, with common law. There should be the presumption of innocence. So I think there needs to be a greater focus on when enforcement officers attend a premises that they're more open minded. Hopefully, if we can get further education out to the general public, there will be increased. Uh, animal welfare outcomes across the board, not just breeders uh, or you know companion animals, livestock, whatever. All animals, pets, breeding dogs, whichever class they fall into. We need to get that education out there. I see that that is lacking in the community. We do a lot of education within our organisation. That is mandatory. They, there needs to be this education. But we need to spread it far and wide. And I know that the main enforcement body, they do training of their staff, but as to what they're training them for, I'm not too sure. They don't share that information. But there needs to be more collaboration. There needs to be a, a fairer approach across the board if we want to achieve better animal welf welfare outcomes. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to Mr. Benasiak first, um, then to Ms. Hurst. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Um, just picking up on an issue that was raised in both your submissions, and that was about the, I guess, the issue with the definition of what the commercial breeding is, and and we tried to fix this, I think, last year or the year before, and the government's response was, well, now is not the time to do it. But now that we have an act before us, a whole new rewrite of an act is now the time. To, to get this right and and solve that, you know, I guess, clause that is being abused by uh, enforcement agencies where they're saying because you've bred one dog in three years, you're a commercial breeder. Hmm. It's now the time to get this right. Pretty simple. Yeah, I, I'd like to make a comment there. Definitely it needs to be addressed. In the, the draft bill, it references uh, agricultural purpose, industrial purpose, commercial purpose. There is no definition in the bill for those terms. So we need clarity on that, definitely. Um, how can we move forward and know the intent of the bill if there are no definitions and the supporting regulations so that we, we can get a, a full picture of what this is intended to do? And I'll tackle in on that. We were just recently um, consulted on investigating or looking to advise on the implementation of a breeding licensing scheme that was promoted as being for larger or commercial breeders only by the previous minister. And yet we were then also expected to define what that commercial breeder might be. The department didn't define that. The minister didn't define that. We as key okay. stakeholders were asked to define that. So. We, as Mr. Benazek has already pointed out, we tried to define that 12 months earlier. We were told by the department, we were told by parliament, it wasn't the time to do that. Suddenly, we're now being put on the spot. We're going to be made the scapegoat out of that whole process because whatever is actually determined as a commercial breeder, when other people that don't fit into that criteria come back and say, we don't agree with that, the immediate response is going to be, ah, 
but you do, because the stakeholders have all determined this definition. That's not how this should be working. We all should be working together. A parliament and the key stakeholders should be deciding what is what type of breeder. And that commercial breeder should not just be defined by a particular ideology or a particular belief. It needs to be based around some fact, around some science. And we need to be able to all come to some form of agreement on that. Right now, we don't even have that. We are we we're not even being advised by government what that is. Our, um, just looking at it from a slightly different tact and the way that the, the draft bill is at the moment. So, se Section 67 basically talks about entry into residential premises and it's, um, as, as I think Animal Care Australia recommended, that you either need a, um, a search warrant or you need extenuating circumstances, an emergency, or, or permission of the occupier for residential premises. And we've got in there in six, that, that a residential premises included all, all land for, used for residential purposes. So that's, that's great and that's a real positive. But then when we go back and look at section 66, which is talking about access for, for the, the inspectors um, on, on other property, um, there's so many get out of jail cards, it, it all becomes a little bit, well, where are we going here? Like, do, once you're commercial, does that mean you're not residential? I don't know, the whole thing needs, need to, oh, to yeah. be really locked down. I think, I think yeah. section 67, we, we like six, section 67. Section 66 then adds all these ifs and buts about what's a commercial premises that then creates so much doubt and, and provides the opportunity to then sort of, you know, renege on se section 67 in, in essence. And um, the, other, the other thing I was just going to mention too, sorry Michael, um, is in terms of how these in inspections are done, um, we see them, they should really be as a sort of a, well, well I think you, you talked about the stock welfare panels, a along that sort of line where people, the, 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 I don't think inspectors in uniforms with, with tasers are the right people to generally be the first ones that go in and do these inspections. It should be a little bit, I, I'm, I'm familiar with the plumbing industry where a plumber, you know, digs the hole, puts all the pipes in and then he, a, a, an inspector comes and inspects that. Now, if the guy's not compliant, he doesn't get a fine. He, he's he's educated, and and they and they sort of say, you know, no, you need to use this sort of pipe now, or the standard slightly changed, or whatever it is, and he fixes it, and and he moves on with his life, um, rather than going in there, sort of, you know, guns blazing a little bit, which is a, a little bit what we've got at the moment. So to me, that's what the sort of compliance audit should be, and I believe <coughs> that's what they are under the current exhibited Animals Protection Act for zoos and wildlife parks. There's an understanding that. The, the proprietors are working with those inspectors rather than the inspectors. I mean, ultimately, yes, they can find them, but that's not the, that's not the aim of the game. That's, that, that's, that's the, end, that, that's the end, end part for people who are recalcitrant. And if I can add, you're looking at, uh, the, currently, you're looking at a definition or an interpretation of the commercial breeder based on a preface within the current breeding code of practice. It's not based on anything else written anywhere in the Act or the regulations. It's based on a preface. That simply says this code of practice applies to anybody who owns and breeds dogs. And that, and that, and that can right, be sorry, can I just understand? Are you saying that the current situation in the current legislation is inadequate, and it's being put into the new act, and that's not acceptable? Is that the idea, that or I has it the, changed? I can't answer that because I can't see the regulations to say if it is currently being put into the new Act, because that is where it currently does fit or sit, is within the regulation schedule one, and then it refers you to that breeding code of practice, which then refers you to a preface that says, this code of practice applies to all dog and cat breeders. So until we see the regulations, I, I can't answer you, Chair. I don't know if that is exactly what we're saying. I guess what we are saying is that's our fear that that is going to carry through into the new Act. Okay, and so you see, um, again, sorry to be so no, you're right. about this, but you see the new Act as an opportunity to make those policy changes that you've been asking for for some time, and your fear is that it's not making those policy changes. Is that you, yeah, that, that's you probably think a very good that's a very good sum, summation. Yeah, oh, yeah absolutely. Oh, yeah. We'd be in agreement because there are no regulations. And at yes, the moment, I, I hear what you're saying. And I, look, please, um, please forgive me because there are so many issues in the Act that this committee isn't in a good position to actually 
review all of those individual issues, particularly art artificial insemination. So, I mean, we're not... Um, it's, it, is for, it is relevant, the fact that those comments are being made, but it's not a matter that we're not inquiring into artificial insemination. It's kind of more the bigger picture. So that was why... Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's just it was originally on the paper. It, it was, it, but it was never in the original consultation draft. Yes. And then it was put in there, and now we are seeing comment being made regarding artificial insemination. So it's either in the draft or it's not. But that is very relevant to our hearing as to whether or not this matter has been correctly handled. Yeah. So do you, would you like to talk about that? I'd like to talk about our original consultation draft where it was never mentioned. So then all of a sudden, when the paper comes out for our response to what's been spoken about, it was never mentioned. And now we are talking about it today, and yet it was never originally in the original consultation draft for all stakeholders to respond to. Okay. So it was never on the table, and then it came to the table, and now we're talking about it. So we don't know where we stand on this issue. On that issue. But if it does come into legislation, and we've had no a reply originally as an organisation, it has a great detriment to the breeding of purebred dogs in our country for our breeders because we live so many thousands of kilometres away from... Is it, is it your impression that it is still in the, in the legislation? Um, we have not been, in, vi in writing, been informed that it's been removed from the banned procedures. Okay, so we're hearing... I'm grey. Okay, got you. Mr Barrett, please. No, no, sorry, Karen. I, I guess I, I think this is an opportunity for you to expand more on why you feel it shouldn't be in there as a prohibited at least, is that? Yes, I'm, I'm certainly happy to expand on that. Uh, our our organisation basically is an organisation for breeders of purebred dogs and to connect, c complete... Sorry, can I just narrow the focus down? It's not necessarily the artificial insemination. I think we're not, we're not against that. It's the actual procedure. Okay. Surgical versus right. transcervical. Surgical versus transcervical, and I heard the end of your last person's comment. Uh, I'm not a veterinarian, but I did work within a veterinary practice for 20 years, witnessing both transcervical and surgical inseminations. In Australia, there are not that many uh, registered veterinarians who have done specifically transcervical inseminations. In Melbourne, there's one specialist. In uh, New South Wales, there's probably two specialists that I know of. In South Australia, there's one or two. So given the relevance of the distance in Australia for a person to travel to get a transcervical in, uh, insemination, as adverse to a frozen semen or a surgical insemination, um, the person is going to have to travel an awfully long way to find a person that is authorised or educated well enough to do a TCI. It's not just a matter of inserting a tube for two seconds. In my experience, some of the females that have had transcervical inseminations may stand there for 20, 25 minutes until the instrument can be inserted through the cervix. In many cases, those females have to be sedated and it's not that comfortable for them. When you do a surgical insemination, the whole process takes approximately 17 to 20 minutes maximum. The female has an incision about that long made and injected into her uterus is the, is the semen. So she is not, does not have her uterus cut open. The fact of the matter is also the amount of semen you have to use. Point five of a mil if you're doing uh, frozen semen, three mils if you're doing a TCI. Now we're talking about neutering and desexing dogs and cats. You're looking at 35 to 45 minutes to neuter a female or spay a female. That's a surgical process. So we're not going to neuter females anymore because it's a surgical process and we're worried that we're giving the dog an anaesthetic. We're also talking about neutering dogs at a younger age. If we do that, they're having an anaesthetic. We're also possibly suggesting spaying or neutering young animals, which ends up possibly in urinary incontinence and all sorts of other hereditary or other physiological problems. Sorry, um, Ms Brown, can I say, I will allow you to complete your answer, but I just need to emphasise to you and to the members on this committee, we're not going to be making any findings about this matter. Thank you. So it's just that there's only 15 minutes left, and so I Thank think you. it's in your own best interest that we... Thank you. Thank you. Chair, I've got some questions, if that's right. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go to Animal Care Australia. Um, this morning we heard from people within Animal Research and they said that they didn't want the Animal Research Act 
to collapse into <clears> one <throat> bigger act. They thought that it, it stood better on its own and it kind of got complicated putting it together. Um, and they were concerned about, well, some of them were concerned and some of them weren't so concerned um, about large parts of the act then becoming regulations um, and, um, and the fact that that can create some uncertainty. I wanted to ask for your opinion about the Exhibited Animals Act because the same thing's happening to that act as well as the Animal Research Act. Um, do you have concerns, first of all, with the Exhibited Animals Act falling into this one larger piece of legislation? And do you have concerns that the majority of that act is becoming regulations? When we originally submitted uh, two of the discussion papers on that, we are or we were in agreement on all of the acts being combined into one. Our assumption at the time, given the information we had at that time, was that we would actually be able to see how that was all going to actually happen. We, are, we aren't seeing how that is all happening. So yes, we do have concerns that uh, what, what will appear in those regulations and what won't appear in those regulations. We are also under the assumption that a vast part of both the <coughs> AR, uh, AR Act and the Exhibit Animals Act would actually have appeared in the Act, mm. not all of it being transferred into the regulations. So until we see those regulations and we see what has potentially been changed or not changed, yes, we have concerns. Will we afterwards? Oh, well, we hope not. <laughs> not sure. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Um, you also strongly oppose the minimum holding periods for charitable organisations um, and you'd like to see animals kept for a minimum of 21 days. Can you explain the concerns you have um, and how it could go wrong if the minimum holding periods are reduced? Yeah, minimum holding periods are being reduced for animals that are either unidentifiable, i.e. they don't have a microchip, mm -hmm. or they're deemed to be a young animal, or they're deemed to be a feral animal. Um, for the latter one, we, we have concerns about how they identify that animal to be feral because no, nobody within any of the shelters has animal behavioural training or understanding. So how they're making that determination within seven days is remarkable and, and phenomenal. Can you just explain for the benefit of the committee what, what you mean by that? Like I, I, I think I know what you mean with a, with a cat in a cage sort of panicking, but just to kind of give us that real example of how can you not know if an animal is, is wild or not? Well, I won't use your cat because you just use the cat. I'll use a pet rabbit as a prime example. Now, most pet rabbits are not microchipped, so strike one against the pet rabbit before we even start. Most rabbits only respond to their owner. So if you've now had a rabbit, pet rabbit brought into a shelter and it's in a small cage, that rabbit will retreat and it will continue to retreat. It will not respond. To, to the, any person that's approaching it, it will actually react in fear, strike two against that rabbit. That rabbit is now marked as being euthanized within the next seven days. If it's not microchipped, nobody who has lost their pet rabbit has the opportunity to actually get the time to come back, announce they've lost their rabbit and receive their rabbit. I'll go back to the dogs, the cats, and then all of the animals. With COVID right at the moment, we have had people hospitalised with COVID for up to a month, three months. How are they supposed to be able to know their animal has disappeared, has been lost, if it was not microchipped, and they're unconscious or in ICU in a hospital to be able to respond within seven days? 21 days, there's a better chance of someone declaring or seeing a lost and found ad and saying, oh, hang on a minute, I recognise that rabbit. The other issue that we have with all of this is that we've already had scenarios from our members who have lost a dog or lost a cat, have contacted a shelter, continued to contact that shelter, to be told by reception that that animal is not on our records, only to come back a week and a half, two weeks later, and be told, oh yeah, that animal was here, sorry, it's now either been adopted out or we euthanized it last week as per the end of it's the, the 14 days or 21 days that we were, ha, had to hold that. It's because the system's not structured correctly to actually allow proper and appropriate tracing of animals, particularly those that are not microchipped. And not all animals are microchipped. And I just want to nut in on that. I, I see you've got a question too. Because some we did talk about microchipping and mandatory microchipping, I think, yeah. in our last day. However, I think in your submission you talked about birds and, and reptiles and other animals. I'm assuming that there's no mandatory microchipping for those animals because you can't microchip. You can't. That's right. You have a gecko that you know is no thicker or longer than your finger. 
um, who sheds twice a month or, 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 or constantly sheds, that microchip's not going to stay under that skin very bloody long at all. It's going to shed out and you've now got an animal no longer microchipped. Mm. Sorry, was that... Yeah, my question was just about the cats and dogs. I think by law they have to be microchipped. Do. So I don't get where there's the... Where's the breakdown of people... Members of your organisation are not microchipping <laughs> No, I, I, I actually... my car as well, Yeah, I still have to do it. And if I don't do it, I don't get the privilege of owning a car. Isn't it the same with a pet? If you don't microchip it, you don't get the privilege of owning a pet? Yes and no. Um, and the, the reason I say yes and no is because I, I call back on... And I agree with Ms Hurst that it is expensive, but also more to the point, we, I come back to ACA's thing, education over regulation, you can go out there and you can ask the general public. They don't even realise that the Companion Animals Act requires them to do that. There are a lot of people who will purchase animals and they don't realise that they actually have a legal obligation to have that animal microchipped or, for that matter, to have a collar and tag on their animal when it leaves their property. If we go back to Should education... Should we be requiring the seller to do that rather than the buyer? It should be both, shouldn't it? It's your responsibility it when you buy an animal. microchipped once, so should yes, but we allow it, animals that are not microchipped to be sold? Well, no, that's not supposed to be happening, but it is. So we need to then cover what the alternative when it's not happening. The buyer should be equally aware that the animal that they're purchasing should be carrying a microchip. <clears throat> I guess there's, there's, there's obviously limited funding in this area. And, and it needs to be targeted at the most appropriate way that, that improves animal welfare outcomes across the state. Chasing people to, you know, directly, having officers chasing people to check their animals are microchipped is probably not the best use of, 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 of the funds. Um, educating the public so that they realise these sorts of things and also the stuff that's in either the prescribed standards or we're asking that, you know, even, even the, that the government sort of accepts standards that, that our clubs already have in place um, as a defence to, to, to crimes, you know, that, that's a better, you know, promoting that so that we raise animal welfare standards, I think, is a better use of, of funds than, than running around chasing well, people. Can I just interrupt? Can I just interrupt there? I think, I think we're chasing the people that uh, are doing the right thing. We're not chasing the people that aren't microchipping. And the people that aren't microchipping are the people that are providing the bad animal welfare outcomes. They're the people that are breeding the dogs and the cats that are not microchipped. They're the people breeding multiple animals that are living in animal welfare issues. You're talking to people here that are part of organisations that do microchip. I was actually yeah. going to ask you that question. Isn't it all the people who are not in yes. your association? So, so we're here talking today about legislation where we can find fault in that we don't have regulations that we can necessarily yes. come to grips with. But I think the bottom core of the whole matter is we're chasing people that you cannot identify. Their animals aren't identified, they don't microchip them, they sell them in car parks, they sell them for bags of cash money and we have to somehow find those people. Can I um, just, both organisations have suggested we need more education. Do you have any specific ideas about how that might happen? I think it could start at a council level in our area, particularly where our Dogs New South Wales uh, premises are, is Penrith Council. I, th I think we should be inviting schools and we should be inviting veterinarians to come and talk about the fact if you own a pet that you purchase that's not microchipped, that is uh, illegal. It's unlawful to sell a pet without a microchip. I don't think the general community really understand when they buy a pet, it's, a, it's not optional, it has to be microchipped. Do you have I'd, a... I'd like to add to that, yeah. yeah. Um, definitely within all of the current breeder associations you could commence your education. I agree with Dogs New South Wales that count local councils could also do it. But I think we need to go back and we need to start at the very beginning. We need to be educating our children. We need programs within the Department of Education in a primary and tertiary and secondary levels that actually educate our children on basic animal welfare and the basic requirements of keeping a pet. Animal Care Australia has currently been in discussions with the Animal Welfare League to do just that. And the Animal Welfare League, I'm very aware, is already proceeding and pr continuing with that and has done for the last 12 to 18 months. And we're, we're happy to support them on that. That's where we need to be educating the most. We need to get our children to understand you own a pet, these are your responsibilities. So I don't want to put words into your mouth, but, but you seem to be saying that for the law to be effective and for the reforms to work, people actually need to have awareness of what they are. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And 
that there will be more compliance just by having more awareness of the law. <coughs> Absolutely. Exactly. And, and, and in terms of the Act itself, um, when it comes in, it, the, we've only got standards and guidelines mentioned once as the prescribed ones. And I understand that for, you know, for rodeos and maybe for breeding dogs and cats and so on, um, that you need some prescribed ones that are actually the law. But you also need to, with those prescribed ones, you have to get it out to the community so they know it even exists. We found that with this Puppy Farm Task Force thing. People didn't even know that, 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 that those documents existed. And in my area, they don't, which is birds primarily, people don't know that there's a, there's a, a breeding keeping a birds code under DPI. Most people don't even understand that. But we have our own. We have our own internally within our systems. So, so there's, there's an opportunity here to promote the minimum care standard that, that, that are, that's, that's in, the, in the draft bill, to promote the prescribed standards, yeah, it might be for rodeos or whatever it is, whatever area it is, and, and also to accept the standards and codes, not as law, but as recommendations and, and, and perhaps as a defence to any cruelty charges as well so that they get some status, to, to, to encourage people and get that message out there to the, to the public that these are the animal welfare you know, codes of practice, standards, guidelines, etc., that, that the community expects you to abide by. And, and, and I really think it's critical when this Act is called an Animal Welfare Act, it's no longer a prevention of cruelty, it's an Animal Welfare Act, that that is enshrined in the Act, that that must happen, that DPI must consult with all the stakeholders, that we must promote these prescribed standards, we must pro even promote the ones that, that, that clubs and other organisations such as Dog New South Wales have, mm. to, to improve animal welfare across the state, rather than just trying to thump the odd people Make the that resources have to be more accessible. If I may, I can give yeah. you an. If I may, I can give you an example. Sorry, just for inter Sorry, just very quick example. During the inquiry into the circuses and exotic animals, uh, two years ago, uh, it was revealed that in 2019 the DPI actually released a new code of practice for circus. Now, that's a very small group. Circus were not aware that that code of practice had been released oh. six months after it had been published. So if we're talking about a very small group there of circus, we're not made aware. How are we supposed to expect the entire public to understand these acts exist if we don't tell them? Very good point. Can I just ask Ms Crofts, yes? Um, I just want to say that there is a responsible pet ownership program conducted in schools and it's conducted at all levels. And that has been really valuable in getting responsible pet ownership message, microchipping laws, etc., to kids of all ages. Um, so who where conducts it, that? Sorry? Who conducts that? That's the state government. The state the department yep, of South, um, Office of Local Government. Office of Local Government, thank you. Yep, yes. Office of Local Government. Um, it, they adopted the program that was created in Victoria probably 20 years ago or more now. Um, I actually worked as an instructor in that program for a short while and it was very beneficial to the kids. The education needs to expand to their parents. We would provide material that the kids could take home to the parents, but whether it actually got there, who knows. So it's getting the message to the adults in the community about responsible pet ownership. So there is that responsible pet ownership program conducted in schools. It has been on a hiatus because <clears> of <throat> COVID, um, but they are recruiting again at the moment. So it's still continuing. But it does sound like yeah. local government were well placed to be yeah. delivering that program to yeah. the community. They, they were driving the education side of it. So Thank you. It, That's really yeah, it was very good. But um, I'd just like to make a, a quick comment on the exhib exhibited animals um, section in this draft bill. It is a big concern to us. Currently under the existing legislation and the regulations, um, companion dogs and cats are exempted from any licensing or permit holding. We haven't got any regulations with this draft bill. We don't know what the intent, what the future will be. But I can say if we are reclassified and are required to have permits, licensing, etc., it will decimate Dogs New South Wales purebred breeders and any other purebred organisation as we won't be able to show our dogs and cats at agricultural shows. 
Those shows bring huge business into the towns that they're conducted in with accommodation, cafes, restaurants, uh, supermarkets. They, they bring in a lot of business to the local communities around the state. Um, everyone looks forward to the show coming to town, basically. And if the, the exemption that we currently have is removed, it's game over. Mm. Thank you. I was actually just camping in uh, Bermagui <laughs> campground and um, all these dogs came in and I thought, oh no, there must have been hundreds and hundreds of dogs. Yep. And there was mm. not one peep out of one animal the entire time. It was It's huge every year. But I mean, just the care that those yep. dogs get was... Oh. Absolutely huge. Mm. And, and can I relay that? I know other, other animal groups too. There's, um, I know there's something like 500 odd um, events, competitions and so on in the bird area and obviously every every animal area has the same. Um, the exemptions that are all listed at the start of the Exhibited Animals um, Act at the moment, um, surely we have to ensure that those are carried over um, so that so that all those sort of competitions are not, not dragged into, into um, the same regulations as zoos and wildlife parks and so on. It's a message we're hearing loud and clear. And we'll have an opportunity this afternoon. You've really helped us to know what questions, good questions to ask the government on that particular topic. Um, look, I'm afraid our time has expired. Can I just uh, say to Animal Care Australia, I note that you had a closing statement, but can you please uh, accept that that is going to be taken on board and noted sure. in the report? Sure. Um, are you... Did, did, you, did you have any other issue that you felt that we've missed that you'd like to refer to? Just briefly, um, I'm a bit concerned about um, Section 89 where a public service employee can be nominated to be an enforcement officer. That is just too broad. There's, and it can be unconditional. So. We need to see the regulations, what the criteria of the expanded role of enforcement bodies, what's that that's going to encompass. Um, it seems that they're bringing in all these extra classes of uh, people to do enforcement and I'm just very concerned that it's leading to overreach. So, and whether these people would have any animal related experience. Thank you very much. Okay, we will pursue that. And can I thank all of you for your evidence uh, and your care for animals. Um, it's very obvious and very greatly appreciated and you've really assisted this committee to know what questions to ask as, as we pursue the inquiry. If any questions have been taken on notice, the Secretariat will be in touch with you after the transcript becomes available uh, and there is a 21 day period, plenty of time. So thank you uh, and I'll adjourn this hearing now. Thank you. Thank you. I'll reopen the hearing. Thank all of our witnesses for being here. We have one witness in person and we have four witnesses via WebEx. Um, and we also have the Honourable Peter Paulus uh, by WebEx as well. So I'm sure this will go well. Just bear with us for a moment. Um, I'd like to I guess begin by welcoming you all. Uh, it, it is representatives of the Australian Vet Veterinary Association, Sentient, the Veterinary Centre for Animals Ethics and Humane Research Australia. I will begin by inviting each of the witnesses to state their names, their organisations and positions in them uh, and take the oath or affirmation. So we might begin with the Australian Vet Veterinary Association. Um, Ms. Diane Ryan. Um, good afternoon, Chair. Uh, my name is Dr. Diane Ryan. I am the President of the New South Wales Division of the Australian Veterinary Association. And I will take the oath. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. Ms. Geems, or James, some apologies for my pronunciation. <laughs> no worries at all. Good, good afternoon, Chair. Um, my name is Elizabeth James. I am the Senior Advocacy Officer at the Australian Veterinary Association. 
and I'll do the affirmation. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Dr Elliott, who's here with us now. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Rosemary Elliott and I am the President of Sentient and I will take the oath. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. Dr Van Eckhart. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for having us. Um, my name is Dr Catherine Van Eckert and I am Vice President of Sentient the Veterinary Institute for Animal Ethics. I'll take the affirmation. So I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Ms Smith. Good afternoon. I'm Rachel Smith, the Chief Executive Officer of Humane Research Australia, also known as HRA. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you so much. I might begin by asking the Australian Veterinary Association if they have an opening statement. Uh, yes, we do, Chair. Please proceed. Thank you. As I reiterate, my name is Dr Diane Ryan and I've been a veterinarian for the past 43 years. And I am President of the New South Wales Division of the Australian Veterinary Association. And I'm joined today by our AVA Senior Advocacy Officer, Liz Gems. I would like to begin by thanking the committee for the opportunity to contribute to this inquiry and congratulate the government for its ongoing dedication towards improving animal welfare in New South Wales. The ABA has over 8,500 members made up of veterinarians across Australia working in all areas of animal science, health and welfare. Veterinarians are key experts in animal health and welfare so it is important for our views to be heard when any animal welfare legislative or policy amendments are discussed. The ABA's key policy priority is animal welfare and to acknowledge its ethical dimension. It has adopted a statement of principles that articulate the ethical basis for all of our policies and advocacy on animal welfare matters. This includes the following statement. Humans have a responsibility of duty of care to protect animals. Where a person does not meet his or her obligations to animals in his or her care, animals may suffer. When this happens, the law must be able to adequately intervene, intervene to enforce compliance and prevent suffering. The ABA submission has made a number of recommendations to this inquiry. But I would like to emphasise the difficulties in commenting on a proposed bill where there is little detail available about the regulations that will be critical to the bill's application. It is essential that broad and comprehensive public consultation is undertaken in the development of the accompanying regulations. <coughs> the ABA strongly believes the objects of the bill should include the reference and definition of sentiments. As an example, the Australian Animal Welfare Strategy definition states that a sentient animal is one that has the capacity to have feelings and to experience suffering and pleasure. Sentience implies a level of conscious awareness. Fish, cephalopods and the majority of crustacea should be included in the New South Wales Review of Animal Welfare Legislation. The ABA supports the bill's inclusion of minimum care standards and we have made several suggestions for refining these requirements. The ABA has been in consultation with the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries about the animal welfare reform process since October 2019. Over that time, we've had a number of face-to-face -face meetings and have made several submissions concerning the review of the Animal Welfare Bill. We are pleased that many of the ABA recommendations have been included in this draft bill. Thank you again, Chair, for providing the opportunity for the ABA to participate in this inquiry we welcome any questions from the committee. And thank you very much for that opening statement. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Sentinent, the Veterinary Centre for Animal Ethics, to make an opening statement, if you wish. Thank you, Chair. I'll do that. The true purpose of animal welfare is to protect animals, not those who benefit from their use. 
Since 1979, when the New South Wales Prevention of Cruelty to Animals legislation was enacted, our understanding of the needs of animals has evolved due to advances in animal welfare science. We have seen a conceptual shift from the five freedoms model of animal welfare, which was essentially about what to avoid, towards the contemporary five domains model, whereby an animal's overall welfare is determined by their mental state. The focus is now on affording animals a life worth living. Animal sentience is being acknowledged in the legislation of other nations and already in Australia in the ACT. Due to the animal movement, the public now has a more sophisticated understanding of how animals should be treated and supports the idea that animals deserve a good life, regardless of how we use them. New South Wales has long been ready for a revised Animal Welfare Act that will reassure the community that the scope of laws and their enforcement will meet its expectations of what is reasonable. And yet despite its inclusion of psychological suffering in the definition of harm, the Animal Welfare Act 2022 makes a mockery of its purported intent to prevent cruelty to animals. Through an extensive list of exemptions that safeguard the vested interests of the agricultural industry, where painful husbandry invasive husbandry practices and intensive confinement are the norm. The sporting and entertainment industries, animal research and environmental management, the Act maintains the subordination of animal welfare to profitability and convenience. Its presumption of what is reasonable is out of line with community expectations and, and instead is informed by existing husbandry practices and outdated traditions. Where is the scientific underpinning that we should rightly expect in the 21st century? Where is the acknowledgement that, like us, non-human animals are sentient beings who should not be considered or treated as property? There is nothing progressive about this legislation. Countless animals will continue to suffer treatment that in other contexts would undeniably be considered cruel. Rather than window dressing our current laws, we should be tackling a much broader issue. Our animal welfare regulatory system is broken. It fails the majority of animals because the Department of Primary Industries has a conflict of interest arising from having as their core business aims the promotion and profitability of the industries they are attempting to regulate. It is not appropriate for the DPI to hold responsibility for animal welfare at the state or national level. Those who care about the welfare of animals have had enough of the lack of independence, science and transparency in how animal welfare standards are developed and likewise of the failures in oversight and enforcement. Sentient joins other animal organisations in calling for the establishment of an independent animal welfare commission to oversee the development of standards, assess the effectiveness of regulation and promote community understanding of best practice in animal welfare. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, does the Humane, does Humane Research Australia have an opening statement, Ms Smith? Yes, we do. Please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I note that much of the detail relating to animals in research and education we set out in subsequent regulations and therefore our feedback is somewhat limited until that detail becomes available. Okay. We also encourage further consultation on the regulations and assume that the current Animal Research Act will not be repealed until the regulations are passed. In terms of the reform, HRA is neutral about the intention of having one Animal Welfare Act. However, this act must strengthen the protection currently afforded by the Animal Research Act. Maintaining the status quo whether that be via incorporating the current Animal Research Act within a combined act or via regulations, will not, in HRA's opinion, ensure high standards of animal welfare or research integrity. This is to a large degree due to the system of self-regulation via institutional animal care and ethics committees, with limited regulatory oversight or public accountability. Not noted in our submission, but a query I would like to raise today with the draft act is, related to 161, Disclosure of Information, which reads, 1. A person must not disclose information obtained in connection with the administration or execution of this Act, unless the disclosure is made, a. with the consent of the person with whom the information was obtained, or b. in connection with the administration or execution of this Act or another Act, 
and a number of other exemptions are listed. A could be subject to misuse and B is unclear and appears contradictory. From HRA's perspective, information related to the administration and execution of the Act is essential for reasons of transparency and to hold the regulator to account, and therefore we are concerned at any obstacles which may prevent this. <clears throat> the current process of reform presents opportunities to, one, strengthen the powers and competency of the New South Wales Research Review Panel, the continuation of which HRA supports, for example, in broadening complaints initiation criteria or mandating expertise on non-animal research methods amongst the panel. Two, increasing transparency and clarity of reporting, one example being through clearer defining of recognised research purpose. Three, prohibit procedures known to cause intense suffering with questionable scientific validity, such as the forced swim test or forced inhalation research. Four, counter conflict of interest by the appointment of an independent office for animal welfare. Five, mandate rehoming for dogs and cats used in research. And finally, expand the three R's to add rehoming, relevance, redirection of funding and retraining. Additionally, HRA supports the Australian Veterinary Association recommendation that the Australian Code for the Care and Use of Animals for Scientific Purposes, that's from 2013, the last update, be reviewed. Our communications with the NHMRC suggest that this will not happen unless there is pressure from state and territory governments to initiate a review. This is an apt time to do so. In response to a question asked this morning, there is no federal body taking responsibility for oversight of implementation of the code. We would also wish this to be raised. I'm happy to discuss any of the above or answer any other questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that statement. And I will ask um, my colleague, Mr. Beach, to ask a question first. But I, I just wanted to clarify, Ms. Smith, do you support incorporating um, the research bill into this legislation or do you prefer it to stay separate as standalone? Well, really, we are quite neutral because it would depend on how that previous um, draft is amended. We don't think it will make that much difference whether it's in the regulations or in the, um, the main act. It will be the content that would, I guess, inform our opinion. Obviously, the regulations could be updated more frequently than the if it was in one act, but um, it's really the content rather than the structure. Um, and regardless of that structure, we think there are systematic issues that need to be addressed, um, which which would operate independently of whichever structure was adopted. Thank you. Mr Veach. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my question uh, is to the AVA, but then I'd like to ask um, Dr Elliott as well to respond. <clears throat> in, your, in the AVA submission at the bottom of page eight, you talk about um, uh, new offences and, exist and enhancing existing offences, offences, but then you go on to talk about um, some acts are escalated as aggravated cruelty. Uh, and you, you say that it would, this would assist interpretation by enforcement of legal agencies and assist in education of animal owners. Can you um, just talk through with the committee uh, why you would suggest that this would be beneficial to have in the outlined in the Act, the, the phrase aggravated cruelty, and just some examples of what that escalation would look like? Um, I suppose with uh, aggravated cruelty, um, <clears throat> there hasn't it's very hard when you're just looking at the definitions of the President of the Act, um, what would be a more severe offence. And aggregated cruelty is a severe offence. And it would be leading to the death or the... Um, I'm trying to think of the word... Uh, affects the, the animal uh, severely enough so that it would be too cruel to actually keep that animal alive. And that could include uh, issues such as psychological suffering. Um, and I suppose it's we haven't really considered that in the present act of psychological suffering being an act of cruelty. And I think it's something now we do. We have seen animals, and I suppose most veterinarians have seen animals which cannot survive, cannot have what you would say a satisfactory life because of their mental status. And I think that if you actually force an animal to have that, that would be a sign of aggregated cruelty. Um, it's, as I said, I have um, 
this act has been in the Prevention of Cruelty to Animal Act has been existing as long as I've been a vet. <laughs> so it's been existing for a long time. And I have always been critical about the act, especially in its definitions. It's a very hard act to define. <clears throat> and you can actually identify, I know they identify certain things which are acts of cruelty, but there's going to be more along the horizon which we will um, come in contact with, which I know that the enforcement agencies will have to be aware of. Um, we have to give, I suppose, instruction or education of what those acts might be. One thing I find with this act is that there, oh, the previous act, there is no facility for education. Um, and education doesn't form, should form a very strong component of this Act. I noticed that in the Victorian Animal Welfare Code, um, it has four objectives of which education is one of them. And I would like to see that in this Act as well, especially um, when so people are aware of what is cruelty. Yep, thank you. Um, and Dr Elliott, do you, do you agree that there should be um, I guess a, a capacity for um, escalating in, um, offences to aggravated offences? I do, um, and we didn't actually comment on this, and I'm just thinking on the spot here. I agree with Dr Ryan about the importance of an act having an educational component. Pull your microphone oh. a bit. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Oh, that's much better. Just pull it. You can pull the whole thing forward. My problem is getting back support and getting access to this. I'll pull it forward. Thank you. Um, I agree with Dr Ryan about the importance of an act having an educational component. I think to do that, there needs to be an acknowledgement of animal sentience in the act. Um, and hopefully with people uh, having clearer understanding, because a lot of animal, animal abuse is neglect. Mm. It's not aggravated or intentional cruelty. And so I hope that with better education about the needs of animals, both behaviourally and physiologically, we would have fewer offences committed. Regarding aggravated cruelty, I, I do think that that needs to um, have stronger penalties. What concerns me about ag aggravated cruelty is um, it's not just going to be that animal or those animals. That person can go ahead and commit the same crimes on to other victim, animal victims. And we do know that there's, through the link between animal abuse and human abuse, these people are dangerous people. And I actually would argue that they should be having, having a forensic assessment. It is not safe to have people out there committing acts of aggregated, aggravated cruelty to animals and then just getting off with whatever they get off with because they will, what they're motivated by it's quite different from what you see in institutionalised animal cruelty. So uh, I'm not sure whether I've answered your question correctly here. Yeah, I, and could I just then maybe ask you to supplement your response by, so I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I, I, in my own mind I have some ideas about what aggravated cruelty would look like, but it's the escalation to aggravated cruelty that, what... what oh, what are the... What are the um, some examples that we might be able indicators. to... Indicators. Yeah. Mm. Um, I agree with what, what Dr Ryan said, that, that some animals are so severely um, injured they may not be able to be saved. I think that there will also be animals who can be saved and it's an individual assessment. So I'm not sure whether, it, whether you base it on the state of the animal, the actual act. Um, I mean, look at human aggravated cruelty. What do they look at there? They must look at the intent. People have gone out and purchased or created poisons. Um, I think it's... It's the intent, it's the lack of remorse. It, it's, a lot of it is in the person as well as in what the state of the animal is. You could get animals in a terrible state who just, who'd been neglected because they hadn't had enough water or, or shade or, or whatever in a farm. Um, it's a very difficult one and I think I'd like to take the rest of it on notice because I feel like I might hold up the proceedings here. But I, I do believe that it's in the act, in the state of the animal, and also in the psychological makeup of that person and, and the proof that they were actually intending to cause this harm. It could be premeditated, for instance, could be a yes. situation factor. Yes. Mm. Yep. Okay, thank you. What about mental illness? And I'm talking about things maybe an elderly farmer's got dementia, for example. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Where I does think. Does that fit into yeah. cruelty? 
It doesn't change cruelty if it occurs. I agree. Yeah. Um, it, it, it would probably change whether you help somebody or prosecute them. Um, the majority of people with a mental illness are not cruel to animals. Um, and it depends on how you define, I mean, if you look at antisocial personality disorder, that's not really a mental illness because they are actually, mental illness is like a legal term in, in some ways. I mean, they are actually aware of what they're doing. So, um, they're not out of touch with yes. reality. Sorry, Dr. Um, Dr. Van Elken, did you have comments you Yeah, yeah if, if, if I may just supplement my colleague, Dr. Elliott's um, response and also yeah. enhance um, Diane Ryan's. We will, of course, get back to you with some of those um, questions on notice, as Dr. Elliott mentioned. But I wanted to just um, further the point that Dr. Ryan made about um, psychological harm and that potentially being an act of aggregated cruelty mm -hmm and um, make a note that we should could be considering that within the context that the animal is in. For example, uh, intensive farming of animals and uh, the use of or the keeping of wild animals in captivity often lives, leads to stereotypical behaviour that could potentially be remedied if that animal was removed from the context. But normally, the removal of that animal from the context is just not within the realm of possibility. For So, for example, I'm speaking of a lot of zoo animals, elephants, for example, you think of the elephant swaying um, in captivity, um, crib biting, there's a lot of um, examples of pigs kept in intensive, um, intensive confinement, uh, unable to move, unable to express normal behaviour um, that develop a lot of stereotypical behaviour as a result. I would um, I would say that that is an act of aggregated cruelty if you're not able to remove that uh, the psychological suffering from that animal. So if that animal endures something for a day or something, that is different from them experiencing that for a lifetime. So context and duration should be taken into consideration when considering aggregated cruelty. Thank you. Thank you. Chair? Yes, certainly. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Elliott, um, at the moment, um, this might sound like a silly question, I apologise, but at the moment the bill requires uh, anyone that hits an animal with their car accidentally um, to take reasonable steps to alleviate the animal's suffering, mm. um, except for birds. Mm. Um, so I'm wondering, it, do birds have the same capacity to suffer harm if hit by a vehicle? Definitely. And if so, um, if there's any justifiable reason to exclude them from this provision? Um, no, I was perplexed by that um, exclusion of birds, actually. Um, we know they're highly intelligent animals. They have the same capacity to feel. They're fully sentient. They, um, you know, um, I could talk at length about bird intelligence, the tool, you know, using tools. Um, there's no doubt about their sentience. Uh, they have the cognitive, cognitive capacity. They have the same nerve fibres that transmit pain. They um, exhibit social behaviour, emotional behaviour, um, learning, problem solving. They're not, they're not animals who function, who does. They, they don't just uh, have a reflex, they have a response, and an adaptive response to situations that are harmful. Uh, I have no idea why birds are excluded unless it's because, unless it's because, uh, well, one, a devaluation of birds, because you know there are a lot of jokes, bird brain, etc. People still don't fully understand uh, about birds. Secondly, so they're a little bit uh, uh, minimised. The other reason might be because sometimes birds will fly in front of a windscreen, and people are on a on a freeway. You can't really stop on a freeway, but you can still ring a number. I think the Act actually says to take reasonable steps. Yep. So I suppose yes. if you hit an yes. any animal yes. on a freeway where it's not safe to stop, yep. you'd, you'd ring a number. Be, it will, you would have yep. an excuse to say that I reasonably could not stop. Couldn't stop, but you could ring wires or you could ring... Uh, yeah, and give a location. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I, I'm really perplexed by it, so yes. Uh, thank you for that answer. Right. Um, last week we heard um, evidence um, that was put to us that an animal that's been poisoned with 1080 will look as though they are in pain, um, but they're actually not experiencing pain, was what was put to us. Um, for the benefit of the committee, um, are you able to give your response to this and um, your view as a veterinarian whether those animals do experience pain who are poisoned by 1080? 
My understanding is that they do experience pain and that when they're having seizures and in between the seizures, they're aware of what's happening. I, would you mind if uh, Dr Van Eckert joined me in this because I know that she's very well up on, okay. on poisons and yeah. including, t is that okay? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, I, I will take over. Thanks, Dr Elliot. Um, so yes, yeah, 1080 is not a nice poison, um, and we argue that it should be um, prohibited. Um, there are, I would argue, there are no ethical poisons out there, but 1080 is a particularly awful one. Um, it depends on the target species as to their degree of suffering, um, but. In general, you could think of it that 1080 causes suffering or causes an animal to suffer for about three days. So um, it, it's normally how long it, it sits in their system with an onset of action anywhere from half an hour to you know, up to 12, 15 hours or so. Um, again, it depends on the species as to what, um, t what, what types of body systems you'll see um, suffer the most, but uh, in general it's cardiovascular, respiratory and or neurological systems. Um, yeah, so as, as Dr Elliot was mentioning, they do suffer convulsions if they're having a neurological experience from it and they're not unconscious during those convulsions um, and they're not com um, unconscious between the convulsions. Um, so that in itself is uh, as stressful, I've, I've not had a convulsion myself, but um, from what we know, convulsions are very stressful um, for the animal. They don't know what's happening to them and they can risk um, serious injury during those, um, especially if they're, they're so out of it, that their body's out of control and they you know, can hit themselves on, on the ground, on rocks and so forth. Um, I can send you the, a link to this study, but there, there was a study done in 2010 um, that found yeah, that not only were they conscious during during those um, the seizures, but they were able to per perceive pain and experience fear and distress. Other observed signs were manic behaviour, such as running into uh, objects, which they're again risking injury, vomiting, whimpering, and muscle spasms. I'm sure it doesn't take a, a veterinarian um, or you know an expert to know that. Uh, whimpering is a sign of an animal being distressed. Um, manic behaviour, not a not a normal um, sign. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I think does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, can I just jump in there? Um, perhaps this is to you, Dr. Van Eckert. We've heard um, again yesterday some people arguing that perhaps the idea of psychological suffering was too vague and, and was too hard to identify. Um, can you tell us from the perspective of a veterinarian um, what, what behavioural traits or, or what you would be looking for in identifying whether something was causing um, psychological suffering? That's a really great, great question and a great point, and I would like to take some of that on notice because mm -hmm. uh, it's such a broad scope. Um, it depends on the species. Um, I'd, I'd like to give you some um, links to uh, articles and so forth. But in general, I mean, it's 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 hard for even us as humans to identify suffering in fellow humans. It, it is such a, a subjective thing. Um, and we will never we'll never be able to be inside the minds of an animal, another animal, another human. But um, yeah, broadly, again, this depends on the species. But broadly, we look at behaviours. So how what are their body postures? Um, their um, willingness to eat, um, their willingness to drink, um, mm. facial expressions. So they you know they display similar facial expressions to us, like grimacing. I mentioned in the context of 1080, whimpering. Um, so I'd actually argue it's, it's generally pretty easy for a lay person to identify most forms of psychological suffering. Um, thankfully, um, a lot of animals have been so well domesticated that um, I think that we've, they've evolved or we've, we've ourselves adapted to understanding them well. But I will note that a lot of animals that we interact with are prey animals and they're very good at hiding suffering, they're very good at hiding their pain. Um, so again, that's why I'd like to um, get back to you on specifics if this is something you really want to investigate Thank properly, you. Do, do service to. Yeah. 
I have a question for the Australian Veterinary Association. Um, last week we heard from the Shooters Union who are advocating for a special exemption specifically for pig dogging, um, so the practice of using dogs to fight and hunt wild pigs. Um, I'm just curious as a veterinary organisation what your stance is on the practice of pig dogging um, and whether you think uh, that pig dogging is actually a form of animal fighting or not. Very interesting question, which I think I will have to take on notice. We have a number of policies, and I suppose that is one policy I would have to check that we have. Um, if we have, then I will um, present it to the committee. Thank you. I might throw that to Sentient as well, maybe Dr. Elliot. Yes, thank you. Um, look, I had a bit of a look at a recent review of uh, the welfare of pig hunting dogs. So this focus of this review and this was by uh, Bronwyn Orr et al. 2019 published. Um, the focus of this review is actually on the welfare of the dogs, but she highlighted also the welfare issues for the pigs. And it's absolutely barbaric. Um, she talked about for the dogs, a little bit like greyhound racing, you had breeding surplus to requirements. Um, some of the dogs have retired early due to behavioural issues. Punishment-based training techniques involving shock, electric shock collars, which should be banned. Um, keeping them isolated on tethers. Um, they were exposed to numerous infectious diseases, high rates of traumatic injury, poor transportation um, methods, and high mortality during the hunts. Um, the hunted pigs are exposed to, and this, this is, I would definitely call this aggravated cruelty, these pigs are exposed to absolute terror. The dogs uh, restrain them by biting their ears. Um, I mean, that's after they've been chased. And then, and then what happens is the hunters stab them. So they are stabbed to death, and the time that it takes, they are fully conscious during exsanguination, and the time it takes to die depends on which organs are lacerated. So it's the most barbaric thing that could happen. Um, it's it's not good welfare for the dogs or the pigs. Um. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, I've got some questions uh, for for Miss Smith um, about about the animal research. Um, we, we heard this morning um, from um, research institutions that they felt that the current um, act was robust, um, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on whether you agreed with that statement. Um, and if not, what protections you think are missing under our current regime? Well, I, and I know that that's probably a really long answer, so maybe just sort of maybe the top uh, things that you think might be missing. Mm. Well, I think firstly, it's a bit difficult to really assess how robust it mm. is because there's so limited information available. Oh, so I meant the current, the, the current act. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so in terms of the current act, even in, in assessing the robustness of the current act, I think there's some limitations due to lack of transparency. So it's very difficult to assess mm -hmm. if you don't receive the information as to how many license holders there are or how many infringements have no, or notifiable incidents have been reported or mm -hmm. unable to receive um, annual reports from the research institutions to make that assessment. But the information that we receive from members of animal ethics committees or those associated with the research review panel or sometimes from the research community anonymously suggest that the that it isn't a robust system and that really having the system where an institution is approving its the research that its own conducting itself um, may mean that it isn't um, of the highest quality or maybe um, infringing upon animal welfare, so there may be practices that are permitted by New, Su New South Wales research institutions, such as um, inhalation research that wouldn't be approved by other institutions, so very inconsistent because it's down to the discretion of that individual institution and the pressures that may be placed upon the members of that committee to approve or not approve that research. So I think to improve the system, really greater accountability, greater trans trans transparency and I think retrospective assessments of the research to see if it's meeting the claims that are, that are made would definitely be an improvement. And really, the, legis the legislation doesn't 
really enable bans of specific procedures because it's left at the discretion of individual institutions. So I think that that is a, a real weakness of the current legislation that could be addressed, actually having bans on rest or restrictions on, on specific procedures. Uh, the, currently, there is some restrictions on the DRAIS test and LD50 test, but I think that it's time to ex expand that list of restrictions or prohibited um, and what should be on that list? Sorry to interrupt. What what, what procedures mm. do you believe should be prohibited? The the primary three that we listed on our um, submission would be forced inhalation research, particularly the nose only exposure method used by Centennial and University of Newcastle, um, the forced um, forced to swim test, and antibody production using animals. Thank you. Um, this, this committee will make recommendations to the Minister from this inquiry. Um, what, what would you specifically like to see in those recommendations, particularly regarding animals in, used in experimentation? Ooh, um, I think that the, specifically the main recommendation would be the, the prohibition of those particular procedures. They would be our, our first one. And I think increased transparency. So. We would like to see very clear reporting on the number of animals that are used, which institutions are using them, what the results are, the funding, um, because if that information isn't, isn't available, then I don't think that the public licence that was mentioned this morning can really be expected if people don't have that information upon which to make, a, make an informed um, opinion. Thank you. Uh, Dr Elliott, um, we, we've talked a little bit about poisoning today. Um, but there's, there's an offence of poisoning an animal that's listed as a domestic animal. Um, is there any veterinary basis for excluding wild or even native animals from protection of poison? No, no, there's no veterinary basis at all. They'll all experience the same suffering if they're poisoned by the substances, whether it be 1080 or, or whatever. I, I think the reason that it's... I, I think most of the poisoning is geared towards uh, trying to get rid of feral animals. Um, but feral, feral animals, uh, domestic animals who went wild years ago, or they may not be considered really domesticated now, but they have the same physiological makeup, the same response to pain, the same response to suffering. So these these poisons would would create the, exactly the same impact on all animals. Um, so I mean, I guess what concerned me about that section was, and I don't really think when we think about um, the protection of the prevention of cruelty to animals we should just be thinking about um, <clears throat> bad people who deliberately harm anim domestic animals most animal harm is actually legalized and that includes our treatment of feral animals and I think we are shooting and poisoning and shooting and poisoning and we never actually get on top of the issue um, and and look at other alternatives, whether it be immunocontraception or or fencing or or, or whatever the the other strategies are. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm quite concerned that um, this would only apply to domestic animals, as in com companion animals. It also or, or farm animals. It also I only interrupt. A bit. Oh, Mr. Just can, can I want to talk about poison as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is a follow up just yeah. on that, and then I'll and then I'll yeah. throw to you. Um, um, it also only applied only to um, to intentional poisoning, um, and I wanted to get your thoughts around the, the the idea of reckless poisoning because obviously if people are thoughtless or reckless in how they're laying poisons and then it accidentally kills domestic animals or other animals, um, you know should should we only be focusing legally on people who have intentionally poisoned a domestic animal or should we be looking at the recklessness of poison being put down. Yeah, so you're talking about people who are, are putting out rat poison, for instance. Mm. Yeah, say somebody but, puts rat poison near their fence line and the neighbour's cat eats it. And they didn't mean to poison the neighbour's cat, but they hadn't thought that maybe the neighbour's cat would be very close to that fence line, for example. Yeah, and it comes into uh, the responsible use of chemicals, responsible pet ownership, etc. Some people could poison their own animals mm. through, through leaving, leaving out baits. Um, and, and usually an animal's too far, I mean often an animal is too far gone by the time they get to a veterinarian. Um, so look, I think that's quite innovative, I hadn't thought of it um, and I do agree with it. I think what you would need is a, a long period of education um, around the risks of, of, of having poisons around. I mean because poisons could be things like um, antifreeze, you know, children can be 
can leave things out. So you'd have to be have a really, really good education campaign about this. So, Mr. Yeah. Yeah, just, just on the poisoning stuff, um, we look back to last year when we saw plagues of mice literally eating people's incomes um, in children's bedrooms, in kitchens and that sort mm. of stuff. You mentioned community expectations before. Mm. In lieu of any alternative other than poison, do you think community expectation is that we do nothing in that scenario? No, and that's a very difficult scenario you raise. Um, and it's something, it's almost like um, a, a sort of a, a natural disaster. <laughs> it's, um, I, I think, uh, where people for the reasons of their own children's health, their own health, had to kill those animals, what I would always argue is that it be humane. How should that be regulated, I guess, is in terms of our inquiry? How would you regulate mm. all that? For example, which poisons get approved? You know, yeah. yeah. Certain um, types have to be, you have to license. Oh, sorry. I, I, I will. I'll take it on notice, but what I will say here, um, because I'd like to look into all the poisons available, but I don't think poisoning is, um, I mean, you can't shoot mice, obviously, they're too small. All I would say is that we need to make sure that if they do have to be killed for, for in such a, an extreme mm. situation like that, um, and that other methods of, of uh, removing them or preventing them from getting in have failed, that it's a humane death. And a humane death is an instant death. It's not taking uh, a poison that causes you to bleed internally, which is what essentially rat sac does. Dr. Van Eckert? Yeah, I might. I mean, as Dr. Elliot said, we, we will take that on notice. But just to um, supplement that, um, you know, we're, we're revising a, a big act here, the Animal Welfare Act. Um, this calls for an innovative, innovative approach. I don't want us to be dragging in um, un, undesirable aspects of the past here. So we know that there are a lot of poisons on the market that currently we don't see good alternatives to, but we are a smart bunch. We're capable of doing some pretty amazing things reference to the current pandemic response. Um, let's find alternatives. Um, as Dr. Rosemary said, there. For some species, there are um, more preferable alternatives like shooting. Um, for mice, um, we agree with the RSPCA Australia's assessment that snap traps are appropriately humane, um, where it's deemed appropriate to kill pest animals. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not gonna happen overnight, but we would like to see an end to inhumane poisons like 1080 and um, any, any warfarin-based rat sack style um, anything that causes prolonged suffering. Um, so we we do have already on hand um, uh, devices that should be used prefer preferentially, but we would like to see this legislation push for research into alternatives. Where there's a will, there's a way. There just hasn't been a will. Um, but I, I have the utmost faith that we can do that. We were able to create vaccines in record time to stop a pandemic. I understand, as, as Dr. Rosemary said, Dr. Rosemary Elliott said that um, that mouse plague was um, unprecedented. Well, I guess we had the plague a while ago, but I myself live on rural New South Wales and I, I suffered an, an over um, abundance of mice here too. Well, it wasn't pleasant um, and I sympathise with anyone that was affected by that. Um, I was right there with you. But, you know, let's know that that could happen again. So let's stockpile traps, like my, mice traps, snap traps. Um, let's stockpile humane things so that we're not caught off guard. And let's set up a structure that says that um, alternatives like, you know, setting up those big pools um, for mice to drown in en masse, not acceptable, not appropriate, ca absolutely cannot happen. If that's a framework that we're operating in, we know that they, those are not options we can reach for. We're going to have to find more humane alternatives. So, um, okay, look, thank yeah, you. I Dr. think in the time that we might need to move on and um, Ms Hurst has another question, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, I have a question for the Australian Veterinary Association. Um, your submission argued that you, in regards to the provision of dogs in hot cars, 
um, that it should be mod modified to either reduce or remove the temperature requirement of 28 degrees. Um, and I just wanted to get a bit more understanding about why you'd like to see um, that changed and also whether you believe that um, the provision should be limited to dogs or whether it should include, uh, include other animals as well. Um, the reason why we would say that that would need to be changed, and I think I was reading the information provided by the RSPCA that looked at the range of temperatures that could be raised in the car um, when the environmental temperatures were actually changing and how that if you, I think it was around about the lower, I mean, it, five minutes at 28 degrees, you can get a massive jump. If it gets up to 33 degrees, it's going to affect the animal's welfare. And so I think there's, um, after looking at the research done by the RSPCA, I think that the people who are looking into this bill also look at similar research to say that um, that is much too high a level, much too high environmental temperature, and they in fact need to lessen it a lot more. You're probably looking at close to 21 degrees or whatnot. <clears throat> because when you're saying for five minutes, who's going to count five minutes? I mean, it's a, it's a nonsense thing. Mm. So we need to have an environmental temperature, which in fact um, actually gives a bit greater leeway for protecting those animals inside the car. Um, did you ask another question or have I just sort of roved on? Oh, no, that was really good. Um, I think the other one was, oh, and did you think that it should, the provision currently only specifies dogs. Um, do you think it should expand? For all animals. Uh, Yes, I think it should be all animals. Like you have some, and also because when you look at dogs, uh, a dog is not a dog. You've got dogs of different ages, different breeds. Um, brachiocephalic breeds in particular are very adversely affected by temperature because they just can't cool themselves because of the structure of their mask. Mm. Um, so they would be highly susceptible to temperature in, in cars. So you need to actually look at the range of um, dogs Cats, again, they can be sensitive to temperature. Birds, whatever you keep in the car that's an animal would need to be determined when you look at this legislation. Thank you. Abigail Boyd. Thank you. Just one final question, um, I think, to you, Dr Elliot. Um, in your submission, you talk about um, rodeos and the prohibition or well, the, the desire to prohibit rodeos. Could you just explain to the committee, um, I guess, the cruelty that's involved there and why you would... Um, advocate for it to be prohibited? Yes, definitely. And um, I, I was concerned that there was an exemption made for rodeos. Um, rodeos are a form of cruelty that we would ideally be an example of why this bill has brought in psychological harm as, um, uh, well, psychological harm as a, as a part of animal cruelty, as part of the definition. It's physically dreadful um, and I will focus particularly on calf roping because these are young animals, sometimes they haven't been weaned long, sometimes they're 100 kilograms. Um, it's fully legal in New South Wales. They are released from a chute, they're chased by somebody on a horse, they're lassoed, they're dragged to the ground and then the, the rider gets off and ties their three legs together. Now there's been a lot of research particularly on the um, I mean, we've, you've only got to look at them to see that they're terrified. Rodeos in general can expose animals to terrible injuries, often fatal injuries. Only I think the year before last there was something down at the, was it Darling Harbour or somewhere where a bull had a broken um, hip and had to be, had to be euthanised. Um, the injuries are shocking, um, the, the, particularly for the young calves, they can end up with damage to their windpipe or broken ribs, etc. The psychological damage, though, is prolonged. Um, it's absolute terror, and they've done some very good research that sort of moved beyond looking at just you know, elevated blood cortisol levels, which could be for other reasons, to looking at the... Um, Catherine spoke earlier about how we can tell an animal is suffering. So we've got lots of validated measures now, like grimace scales, etc. 
Um, there's a really good technique that they're using now in animal welfare science which is non-invasive and it's called qualitative behavioural assessments. And so in a recent study, and I can, I can send the um, link on notice, um, but it's, it's looking at, uh, you've got observers who are blind to the conditions of the, of the animals and they're rating different aspects of their, their presentation, their effect if you call it. And they were reliably, reliably able to distinguish between calves who'd been in a calf roping uh, event and those who hadn't. So, you know, expressions that indicate ag agitation. A big one is white eyes. So they'll roll their eyes and you can see 50% of the white of their eye. Um, so, so we know that it causes psychological suffering. We know that it causes uh, injury and potentially death. So why on earth is it legal? Why on earth would this be, along with many other examples, exempt from animal cruelty provisions. Thank you. Do you mind if I just ask a couple of questions of Dr Ryan? Um, just in terms of vets, often you might encounter what appears to be cruelty and I just wondered, um, do you have a, do you have a uh, procedure that vets would follow in terms of reporting that and how you'd manage that? Um, up to recently we possibly couldn't because of the confidentiality in our code of conduct. So the AVA actually um, approached the Veterinary Practitioners Board to actually, it was a time when they were looking at exemptions to the code of conduct confidentiality to do with the Biosecurity Act. And we said, well, we also need to give vets the ability to report animal cruelty and not be and not that be um, contrary to the Code of Conduct. Now, those have been recent changes to the Code of Conduct to allow vets to do that. Because we also have, and I think it's also been mentioned, about the link between domestic abuse and animal cruelty. Yes. And so we um, have given vets the ability to report to um, authorised officers with the RSPCA if they suspect animal cruelty. The statement was and made I earlier that most animal cruelty is neglect. Do you, would you agree with that? And is that something that needs additional measures to address? Yeah, well, neglect is really because of improper uh, education. Um, I have dealings with the Responsible Pet Ownership Reference Group. And part of that, um, Ambit, and I know that you've had um, Katrina Vesk from the Cat Protection Society, is looking at providing information to people on how they actually look after their animals, on how they provide care to their animals, because I think um, that is deficient. But some people don't understand what animals actually need. They think they're doing the right thing, but they're not. And they actually do need that education, which is why I said before, education needs to be a major component of this act. And do you encounter, so encounter mental illness as an issue? Um, there's a lot of anxiety in our present um, pet population. Um, animal behavioural issues, um, I think, is, I don't know, it has been increasing, especially in during the pandemic. Um, we have seen um, increase in aggression in very young animals, and it may be due to um, inefficient or not being exposed to socialisation at a young age, and it could just be a, a fault of during this pandemic, or now that owners who have been constantly at home are now leaving to go to work, and so we're seeing anxiety. So we are seeing a number of behavioural issues occurring in animals. Mm. Um, How big is this problem? Is it widespread or is it confined? Well, we have discussed it and I think we're seeing more and more of it. I see a lot of online chat between veterinarians and some of them are asking for uh, animal behaviour uh, assistance because of animals they have seen. So whether or not it is something which is occurring um, all the time or it's something which is a side effect of our pandemic. We're not certain, 
Um, we do see animal behavioural issues in animals which are kept in confinement, especially for intensive breeding, and this is dogs and cats. Um, and so that is where we do, and we have put in a submission um, for the um, inquiry for the puppy farms um, based on that, because we are concerned about the psychological status of these animals which are kept under those conditions and not given the ability to express their own natural behaviours. Thank you. Look, um, we're approaching um, the end of our time available for this session. I just might ask everybody uh, if you had anything that you felt that we'd missed um, or anything that you wish to add. Um, please don't summarise because just a brief opportunity to make a comment. Um, Dr Elliot, I might start with you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've talked about the exemptions. Uh, I think I've tried to make that point, but I guess what I would like to add, which we probably didn't write in our submission, everybody's thrilled to hear about you know, uh, minimum uh, care requirements. Um, I'm starting to think of this in a more negative light. I think you know, the, the dictionary defines minimal as the least the lowest amount. I think we should be aiming higher. I think we can be aiming for gold standards of animal welfare, not the basic. And when I look at the current standards and guidelines and codes of practice, if we have more of the same, minimum will be minimal. Thank you. Um, Dr Ryan? I agree with the statement just said about minimal requirements. I need think that we need to actually have input and again this is where I push the education that um, I suppose they need to have a lower standard where they can say that um, we need action but we need to aim for a higher standard of care for animals. Thank you. And, and I have actually stated and I know it's stated in our submission that um, the veterinary, Australian Veterinary Association would be very keen to be involved in formulation of standards or care standards for all animals. Thank you. And Ms Smith. Yep, I just had two very quick points to make. The first was just in relation to the discussion on psychological suffering. And um, in terms of animals in research, that may be almost a byproduct of life in a laboratory, or it may be inducing a negative psychological state to study um, depression or anxiety or different um, psychological conditions. So I'm hoping that this legislation will not just make an exemption that that's acceptable when it's animals used in research, because obviously they have the same capacity to suffer. And the second point was just in relation to a question that was raised this earlier, earlier this morning about whether um, the Department of Agriculture is the best um, department to oversee animal research. And I think if it, if, if it does continue with the Department of Agriculture, there needs to be greater collaboration with the Department of Health and the Department of Education because mm. it isn't just the case of assessing the animal welfare, it's assessing the merit of the research and the educational value. So if it does remain within the current portfolio, then I think there needs to be greater, greater collaboration to be able to evaluate research. Thank you very much. And I, I do sincerely thank all of the witnesses um, for this expert evidence that you've been giving us today and the questions that you've answered. It's been incredibly helpful. And uh, so with that, I will close the session and I thank you again. Thank you. Uh, and we'll reconvene at 10 past three. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, New South Wales Government, thank you very much. We're really looking forward to this evidence and note that many of the witnesses have, have recognised the difficulty of these reforms and congratulated the government for uh, making that effort. And so um, the witnesses before us, um, we thank you for doing that and for being here to help us. Mm -hmm. And also the Veterinary Practitioners Board of New South Wales are here uh, via video conference. So we have seven witnesses. We thought we might um, do this session a little differently. I will ask for opening statements, of course, and then every member will be given an opportunity to ask some questions and then reviewing which witnesses have had an opportunity to speak, we'll, we'll sort of move into different witnesses at that point, if that's okay. So uh, step one is for everyone to state their name and position and take uh, an affirmation or an oath.
So I will move through this uh, according to the list that I have before me and ask Ms Tara Black to begin. Thank you. Um, Tara Black, Deputy Director General um, of Strategy and Engagement within the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Uh, Ms Harris. So, Ms. Clem Harris, uh, Director of Policy and Industry Insights in the Department of Primary Industries. Um, and I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Ms. Robinson. Suzanne Robinson, Director of Animal Welfare with the Department of Primary Industries. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Mr. Greentree. Good afternoon. Brett Granger, Assistant Commissioner in New South Wales Police. I'm the commander of the Western Region and the corporate sponsor for rural crime. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Mr Tutt. Matthew Tutt, Director of Compliance, Policy and Legal Services, the Greyhound Welfare and Integrity Commission. And I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Dr. Korish. Juliet Korish, Senior Manager of Policy and Registration, Greyhound Welfare, Welfare and Integrity Commission. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. And from the Veterinary Practitioners Board, Mr Bagley. Bagley. Bagley, Registrar of the Veterinary Practitioners Board. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Is there an opening statement from the New South Wales Government? Yes, thank you, Chair. Oh, thank you. I'm so relieved. <laughs> I think we're all hoping for that. Thank you. Um, DPI really appreciates the opportunity to provide the committee with some further information about the draft bill and the process that we've followed so far in developing it. Our current animal welfare laws are 40 years old and they've been amended many times over that period. They've now become very complex and quite prescriptive. The aim of this reform project is to reduce the confusion and complexity in the existing framework and to address the known gaps in the laws. And that's been informed by current science and evolving community expectations. We started with a review of our legislation um, and looked at what other jurisdictions were doing and then undertook consultation on an issues paper. From there, we developed a proposed framework for the new laws and undertook a further round of consultation on a discussion paper. The feedback on that discussion paper has informed the draft bill that is before the committee. We know that there are a range of views uh, amongst stakeholders and the community about what good animal welfare means. So consultation has been a really important part of this process so far. We've received almost 6,000 submissions through the two rounds of public consultation that we've undertaken to date and this inquiry is a further opportunity for us to seek feedback on the draft bill before we finalise it for introduction into Parliament. We know from the consultation processes that our animal welfare laws need to change. There are parts that need to be clarified and simplified and there are some important gaps that need to be closed. The bill seeks to address the confusion and complexity around the core components of our animal welfare laws by updating the objects and definition of cruelty introducing a minimum care requirement and clarifying powers of entry. These changes are intended to clarify the existing requirements. The bill also seeks to strengthen our existing laws and improve welfare outcomes by updating the definition of animal and responsible person, implementing a new penalties framework, introducing new offences, increasing enforcement powers, and improving oversight of the approved charitable organisations. The New South Wales Government is committed to maintaining high standards of animal welfare and to ensuring that the draft bill is fit for purpose for all people who care for and work with animals. We're open to feedback on the draft bill and we appreciate the opportunity to provide some further information on that today. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Baguli, do you have an opening statement? Um, no, thank you. No, that's, that's fine. Thank you very much. 
Uh, I might move to uh, Mr Veach for the first question. Yeah, thank you, and thank you all for your attendance. Um, it's been a, an interesting um, couple of hearing days, and no doubt you've been tuned into uh, what people have been raising. Um, so I'll start out with the, the obvious one that's been raised in the majority of the submissions, and uh, I think we've heard just about every witness before us. It has to do with the, uh, the requirement that the draft regulations be presented at the same time as the, uh, as the bill to the House. Um, I know our terms of reference have got us listing, looking at the, considering the draft regulations uh, as a part of a final report. But um, are there difficulties, or what are the difficulties in presenting the draft regs at the same time as the bill for the consideration of both chambers of the parliament? Thanks. Um, and I'm sorry, are we directing our questions to you, Ms. Blake? Is that um, what? You can. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> and you can you redirect can. them. That yeah, would be very that. easy for us. Thank you. Um, so look, we do recognise that there's a fair bit of interest in what will be in the draft regulation. Um, the Act itself focuses on the high level principles um, and expectations and offences. So it's intended to be a single point of reference for people to understand what's broadly expected of them. Um, we do fully intend to undertake thorough targeted and public consultation on the draft regulation, um, and that will include a regulatory impact statement. And in addition, as you um, just mentioned, um, it's part of the terms of reference for this committee as well. So there will be um, plenty of opportunity for people to see the draft regulation and provide feedback on it before it is finalised. Um, there are some challenges with developing a draft regulation in advance of finalising the bill. So um, we are, I suppose, our intention had been to um, finalise the draft bill and, and have that settled and through the parliament before we started consultation on the draft regulation so that there was some certainty about what the principles in the Act said before we go into the next phase of the project. Um, also very conscious of the risk of stakeholder fatigue and confusion. So we do know already stakeholders are a little bit confused about the various private members' bills and inquiries that are active at the moment. Um, and so one of the challenges of consulting now on a draft regulation before the Act is through is that risk of stakeholders becoming confused about where does this fit in to the scheme of things. Um, so probably the other point to make on this is just that the Act itself won't commence until the regulation is finalised. So I think there was a comment um, from one of the other witnesses about um, asking for certainty about that, and that's definitely our intention, that we would have the Act passed by the Parliament and then we would finalise the regulation through that consultation process I outlined. And only once that regulation was finalised and made would um, the, the new framework commence. Now, can I um, just clarify, so are you looking at one large uh, draft reg or are you looking at a number of draft regs to, to apply to certain aspects of the bill? Um, I think at this stage the intention is a single regulation um, and the types of things that will be in the regulation is probably important to clarify as well. So um, the idea is that some of those um, more administrative matters that we might want some flexibility with um, so that we can adapt to evolving science, new process improvements, community, changing community expectations, we can do that with a little more agility. Um, so. The regulation will include things like the licensing application and assessment process, conditions, fees, um, membership of the advisory committees, and then some pretty specific um, details around the circumstances in which certain restricted procedures can be performed, what the mandatory standards are and who's required to comply with them, um, and things like the content that needs to be in the reports that we'll be requiring from the approved charitable organisation. So it is a level of detail that is um, in modern legislation and the modern approach is to include that type of detail in a regulation rather than in the Act. So that's the approach that we've um, been intending to follow. Okay. Um, so clearly, clearly there is still a long journey for us to follow um, to get to the point where the regs will be ready to turn on the Act. Uh, once, the act, once it's all processed, you're looking, still looking for a fair way down the track? Um, I think it depends to a large degree on um, what the committee's interim and final reports say um, and how much further consultation we might need to do to test um, what the final package looks like. Um, we have, and I think this was in the evidence from budget estimates last week, we have started work on the regulation, but there, we can't finalise it without doing targeted consultation in the first instance to check that there aren't any unintended consequences from what we're proposing to put in there. Um, 
and that's in, in advance of doing a full public consultation process and regulatory impact statement process. So um, yes, there's, there's a fair bit involved in ensuring that we get it right, but we're not starting from square one. We're, we, are, we are working on that in the background as the committee process continues. Okay, thanks. I just want one other thing that I'll, I don't know if we can hand over, but I just want to just um, put out the bushfire around cat, dog, cat, and agricultural shows being required to have a licence to exhibit. It's pretty clear from the evidence from the committee that people don't want to don't want that to happen. My reading of the bill is it's actually silent on that, that it's not listed. I think that may well be fertile ground for that to have developed. That's not the intention. Am I correct in saying that? No, so I might let Sue's um, speech the detail on that. But our, what we're proposing to do with exhibited animals requirements is broadly just roll over the existing framework and requirements into the new new bill and regs. That's correct. So that would be the intent. So currently some of those exclusions from is in the exhibited regulation. Um, so the intent is at this stage to carry those over. Okay. So ag shows, dogs and cat shows? I'll not just ask you to pull your microphone forward a bit if that's okay. Thank you. That's correct. Okay, good. We can all head back to our country shows now and we're not going to be beaten up in the chook shed. Um, thanks. Problem. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> um, Proposed sections 38 and 39 in regards to animal cruelty material. Um, I presume these were actually drafted before a similar offence was actually passed um, into the Crimes Act in November. Um, is the intention to retain these sections in the bill or remove them given, given the changes that have just happened in the Crimes Act? Uh, so to retain it? Um, so we're aware obviously of the Crimes Act um, amendment that went through in uh, late last year and I think our, our view is that this uh, provision at section 39 complements what, what is, will be in the Crimes Act. I suppose the difference between the Crimes Act offence which includes that um, sexual perverted gratification element um, and this, this proposed offence is that there's no mental element in, in our uh, proposed offence. Um, so that would mean, for example, if material didn't meet that test the, of that sadistic sexual perverted interest uh, threshold, it possibly wouldn't trigger that Crimes Act offence, but it could still trigger this offence. Um, and an example of a video that might fall into that category would be something like a video of dog fighting. So um, in the way that this provision is drafted, it's only material that would be considered an animal cruelty offence, and then it's um, obviously footage or footage of that offence with the idea being to deter I guess making and spreading those sorts of videos. I, I guess I mean something that's obviously come up at this inquiry is the concern around um, it having a real muting effect for the authorities to actually be able to prosecute um, and then the problem um, well, you know, one example that, that was brought to me was um, you know somebody intentionally ran over some emus um, and somebody else filmed it and then they shared it on social media and then other people on social media shared it and then obviously it came to the authorities' mm. attention. Um, but that means that the person on social media that shared it, even if they were horrified by it, is open to being prosecuted. Um, and, and I'm wondering why we would consider that a crime, just sharing videos and information. I, I, and I, the concerns, I guess, that have come was is that it is so broad um, that anybody sharing these videos um, and it will have a massive gagging effect, I suppose. Yeah, sure. So, so that's obviously not the intent of what we're going for with this provision. And we've um, got specific exemptions in there to uh, hopefully mitigate unintended consequences like um, the one you've just described. So we have, um, for example, it wouldn't apply if uh, capturing that video was necessary in the assistance of administering or forcing the law. So that's intended to capture where somebody uh, captures a video of an animal cruelty. But offense. I'm talking about them sharing it, which isn't an exemption. Um, so capturing a video for, for law enforcement was an exemption, but if it was just somebody who shared it on social media, they, I saw it and shared it and said, Have, has anyone seen this? I'm not exempt under the current Act. Uh, possibly not, no, as it's currently drafted. So um, Very broad. Yeah. Yes. I, I would say, so in circumstances like that, um, I think the, the preference would always be, of course, as, as you know, to, if you have footage of animal cruelty, is obviously to, to go the RSPCA or at least what Animal Welfare League is the first pass rather than um, social media, but I take your point. 
Um, and will that be reviewed given the criticisms across the board that we've received in this inquiry? Uh, well, this provision you mean, the exemptions? Yes. Uh, well, yeah, not course. the exemptions, the, the, well, the entire the provision. provision. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, we, I haven't had anybody supporting it. Yeah, so of course, as, um, as Tara said, we're you know, using this process to get feedback on the draft bill and happy to take any feedback on board. Thank you. Um, Section 530 of the Crimes Act criminalises the in intentionally torturing and killing an animal um, with the intention of causing severe pain. Um, but there are going to be exemptions. Um, probably aware um, of a, a case recently, um, Brighton versus Will, where the judge was actually very critical of the fact that there are exemptions in the Crimes Act for this provision, um, given that it, 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 the, the bar is the intention of causing severe pain. Um, will there, will there, uh, you know, has that, was that, was those, was that court case taken into account? Um, where there was a proposal to in retain um, exemptions for animal cruelty when there was an intention to cause severe pain? Um, yes. So uh, in the draft bill um, at the back, there's a consequential amendment to the Crimes Act, which removes the exemptions uh, from applying to that serious cruelty offence that has that uh, intent element. So there will be no um, exemptions available for the Crimes Act. So there's not going to be any exemptions in Crimes Act? Not, not for the uh, intentional part, so they'll still be available for the reckless offence, but not for the, with the intent of um, serious animal cruelty. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask as well, we've, we've had a lot of um, concerns raised in regards to why birds have been excluded from um, the proposed Section 29, um, where injuries to animals struck by vehicles. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any rational basis for excluding specifically birds. Um, and I know that that's possibly also historical because it's been in the Act for quite some time, um, rather than something that's been drafted in now. But um, noting um, the, the feedback we've had, is that something that um, is, will, will be considered to include birds given the feedback that we've had? Yeah, that's right. So um, the provision around um, birds that you're talking about um, is a carryover from existing POCTA requirements and that's actually been something that's been really interesting through this project is that a lot of the, the feedback that we're getting is actually on um, provisions that are in existing legislation that maybe people just weren't aware of. So um, today I think was the first time that we've heard um, feedback about that specific issue so definitely happy to go away and have a look at that and provide some further information back to the committee about what the historical reasons might have been um, and whether um, we believe that needs to change. Thank you. Um, I've just got a quick question about um, the bill creates a division between the exhibited animals and the research licensing provisions um, that can only be enforced by the Department of Primary Industries and other animal cruelty provisions that can be enforced by the, the three authorities. Um, I just want to check how that will work in practice. Um, so if somebody runs a petting zoo um, and commits an act of aggravated cruelty against an animal, would the RSPCA still be able to enter and charge that person or would it be left to to the DPI because it's an exhibited animal facility. Has that made that a really solid distinction going forward? So um, Suze can probably provide a bit more detail on this, but um, I would just say that, again, that's the existing arrangement. So DPI is the um, administers and enforces the Animal Research Act and Exhibited Animals um, Protection Act. So um, that is the... But I understand that RSPCA can still go and, yes. and act at the moment. So um, that's carried over. So the intent will over. be that um, if you have an exhibited licence that you would fall under the Exhibited Act, but POCTA could also apply. There's no exemption from POCTA for exhibitors. Thank you. As is the, currently the case. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Great. Um, can I ask firstly, um, in your opening statement, Ms Black, um, you talked about the consultation process and the number of submissions that were received. Um, and it sounds like that consultation was quite extensive. Um, there appears to be two major issues that were raised in that consultation that haven't made their way into the bill, and that's animal sentience being explicitly recognised and also the Independent Office of Animal Welfare or, or something of that nature. Why were neither of those 
um, issues taken up in the bill? Um, so on sentience, um, so we absolutely agree animals are sentient. That's why we have animal welfare laws in the first place. So since 1979 in New South Wales, we've had laws that um, acknowledge the fact that animals are sentient. And we do have explicit reference in the bill um, recognising sentience through um, cruelty provisions around pain, distress, physical and psychological suffering. So no debate about the fact that animals are sentient. I suppose the question of whether that's necessary to include in the objects. We've deliberately tried through this process to streamline and uh, make the laws really clear. And so I think the evidence even last week um, from one of the witnesses that was proposing this acknowledged that it was unlikely to have any actual practical impact if we included that in the object. So um, it's not that we don't recognise that animals are sentient, it's more that we didn't believe it was necessary um, and potential risk to cause confusion if we've got language in there that doesn't actually relate to anything else that's in the bill. But I, sorry, just before you move on to the Independent Office of Animal Welfare point, um, today we heard um, from uh, the, hang on, I'm going to get the, the organisation right, the, um, the Sentient Animal Law Foundation, um, who were arguing that actually having sentience explicitly acknowledged it, it does have a practical impact in terms of guiding interpretation um, and that it pr produces a, you know, a positive duty of care um, more in line with the five domains and the five freedoms. Having listened to that evidence, will you review or, or reconsider the stance on sentience? Um, I'm happy to take on board the, the committee's views and, and I suppose deliberations on that matter. We know it's, um, you know, like all things animal welfare, there are a range of views about it. So definitely happy to consider it. Um, as I said, we've, we've tried to craft a set of objects and definitions that we believe are uh, modern and easy to understand. Mm. Um, but happy to, happy to take on board that I, feedback. I guess given that you know, we have academics and, and others who are arguing that actually um, including animal sentience recognition in legislation um, in line with some of the more progressive um, other jurisdictions is a positive thing. Even if you were to believe that it was unnecessary or didn't make any particular impact, I guess there's no harm from your perspective in including it then. Um, so yeah, again, I guess why, why not? Um, what, what people are asking for, I guess. Yeah, no, that's right. So um, our view is that it's not necessary, not that it would be harmful. Okay, so which I would is, say put it in. This is our big chance to make that important. <laughs> Do you want to um, ask about the office? Yeah, so the Independent Office of Animal Welfare was the other one that kept coming up. What yeah. was the views around that? Why was that not included? Um, so I think we've got a, a pretty strong framework already in New South Wales that includes DPI, GWIC, um, RSPCA, Animal Welfare League and the police. Um, and that's a pretty unique mix of expertise, um, experience in enforcement and um, animal care infrastructure. Uh, so I think the RSPCA New South Wales as evidence earlier today um, spoke to the fact that we haven't actually seen a proposal put to what that would look like. So it is a bit difficult to, to comment exactly on um, how an independent animal welfare office would look mm -hmm. and how it would function. Um, but we believe that we've got a good framework here that works well. Um, and it does take, does include those unique skill sets, experience and infrastructure that the various enforcement agencies have. Um, the, the people who were consulting, who were consulted though disagreed on the basis of that and, and I guess this is your opportunity to frame that Office of, of Animal Welfare in line with what people thought was missing. Sure. You've missed that opportunity. I, I wouldn't agree that that was the overwhelming feedback in the submissions um, to the discussion paper or even the issues paper. So it's no, certainly I didn't come say up it was the overwhelming issue. I said it was, it was something that was mentioned a lot by a lot of people and we've heard a lot about it um, in the last two days of hearings as well. Yeah, so I... Do you as mind a, if I just ask it something specific? Please. The allegation was made that there's a conflict of interest in having DPI, and that's why there should be a separate office. And I just wondered if you could respond to that. 
Um, so I don't agree um, with that with that um, comment. Um, you know, DPI, we've got um, significant expertise in animal use industries. We've also got significant animal welfare expertise. And so those two functions work really well in bringing together, um, I suppose, our administration of the laws. Um, don't agree that there's a conflict of interest at all. Thank you. So I hope you don't mind. Did you know that keep a, going? I will just pick up on that point then. I think it's less of a um, explicit conflict of interest than it is a conflict of um, interests maybe. But if you're looking at um, the, the, the idea of animal welfare from a, as you put it, animal use perspective, um, clearly that's more designed to be around the quality of a product um, than it is when we're looking at the community's expectations on what animal welfare should look like, which is far more in line with the five domains. So um, it's in that context that DPI is seen as not being the appropriate um, organisation to administer both, whereas an independent office of animal welfare would ensure that um, you know the community's attitudes were actually considered. Um, so our view is that those functions are complementary rather than conflicting. We'll have to agree to disagree. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Mr. Vanessiak. Thank you, Chair. I might just go to two completely separate items. The first one is game parks, and this is an existing provision under POCTA. Given the definition of game park, um, the way it's defined, means any person that goes and gives a farmer a box of beer, a, 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 you know, a couple of kilos of prawns for access to property, is essentially committing, making that farmer commit an offence so they can get access to the property to shoot feral goats or shoot wild pigs or shoot deer. And given that there's existing exemptions for hunting, why do we have game parks when clearly it's an unenforceable part of the law because no farmer's being pinned for yeah. essentially leading people on their property um, and it actually delivers no animal welfare outcomes because there's already guiding principles about how animals can be hunted according to you know unnecessary harm or unreasonable harm why does that ex why can that why does that still exist if it's an unenforceable part of the law and delivers no animal welfare outcomes so our understanding with the intent of that it has been carried over from mm. the existing laws is that it was designed for um, what's sometimes termed like canned hunting. So animals are contained in an um, area that they can't escape from and um, people are paying to come in and hunt those animals. So it ensures they have a higher um, ability to take or kill an animal. So that is the intent of that when it's talking about game parks, not normal hunting on a farmer's property. Um, and that was the intent in carrying it over. Given but noting that there's some confusion, um, yes, we've heard that as well, and we'll look at whether there's, um, how we might look at that to yeah, clarify to, to that. Confined well. is a fairly vague and broad term, because if a farmer's got a fence around a property, you could argue, you could argue that some animals would be confined, but we know deer can, deer can leap six foot fences without even, you know, breaking of sweat. Um, so yeah, thank you for going back and looking at The other issue that has come up, and it came up probably 12 to 18 months ago, is this um, complexity about what is considered a commercial breed, dog breeder or a cat breeder. And uh, you know, RSPCA were given a, a sum of money um, to, to crack down on puppy farming, but all they seemed to be doing was targeting the hobby breeders. That was the reports we were getting. Um, and we tried to move amendments 12 to 18 months ago to try and provide some clarity as to what is a commercial breeder, what's the difference between you know, someone that does it as a hobby, doesn't make a huge amount of money, it's not their primary purpose to make money from breeding dogs, they just love the dogs, they want to extend, you know, keep the breed going in this country. Um, and we were sort of told by the government, now's not the right time, let's look at it when we do the animal uh, welfare reform. Now we have it here, it doesn't seem to be seem to have appeared or been clarified. And there was concerns from uh, Animal Care Australia that they, you know, are sort of wishing and hoping it might be clarified in regulations, but they know there's an existing code of practice that is quite vague. So where are we at with that? Are we going to get some clarification about the difference between, you know, what is someone that's not doing it primarily for profit and someone that is a, a proper commercial breeder? 
Um, so the approach we've taken in the draft bill is not to define commercial, so it just um, takes its common meaning, which is consistent uh, with the approach in other New South Wales legislation, such as Protection of the Environment Operations Act and the EPNA Act. We're aware of um, the concerns that you mentioned. We've, we've had meetings with Animal Care Australia about this issue. Um, I think the challenge with trying to develop a more a, a narrower definition of, of what is commercial is a risk of unintended consequences. So um, I, I know the um, amendment that you're referring to for last year on the animal animal trade definition, and there was some concern at the time about you know that might unintentionally exclude activities that may be commercial, plus um, challenges around giving the um, definition that an inspector or an enforcement um, agency can confirm on the ground before um, taking a decision uh, to act. So um, yeah, I think, I think the crux of the issue from, from the conversations we've had with Animal Care Australia and probably conversations that you've been having as well <coughs> is about how it links to the powers of entry and, and whether um, the enforcement agencies can uh, enter a residential premises if it's being used for, for a commercial purpose. And so um, I'd just like to take the opportunity to clarify that our intent in drafting the bill and the instructions that we gave to the Parliamentary Council on this issue is that the residential protections will override. So it's a narrower set of powers available on a residential premises, uh, not the broader commercial um, powers in that setting. I appreciate that might be your intent, but quite often intent gets lost between drafting and enforcement. So what will we see in regulations or the codes of practice that clarify and cement that intent, I guess, is what I want to get to? Yeah, sure. So I think on on the, the term commercial and whether it has additional guidance in the regulations, it's probably something that <coughs> we would consider feedback to come out of this process as well as consultation on, on the draft regulations. Um, at the moment, we don't have a specific working definition or you know, sub clauses that we'd be putting in there to um, further constrain the definition of commercial. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barrett. Can I just stay on the powers of authorised office for a second, Ms. Blake? And I know you touched on it in your opening address and we got pretty close to it then. There has been a little bit of confusion about it, and in, or maybe Assistant Commissioner Greentree as well. Um, about a sudden increase in powers for authorised officers, particularly in reference to accessing homes and someone suggested they were being afforded less rights than murderers and criminals. Um, can we just touch on that again, just to clarify it a bit, and also the language used in the bill, which I think is consistent with other language in other legislation, such as the Biosecurity Act, as far as access to residents and premises? Thank you. Um, so. In terms of um, powers of entry, you're right. Um, we're just seeking to clarify existing powers that are in POCTA. So um, currently those powers are sort of a bit confusing. They're in different parts of the Act. So this is trying to bring them together for the first time and make it really clear. Um, the only additional power that we are proposing to give to the enforcement agencies is to allow them to provide pain relief in certain situations. Otherwise, it is a carryover from existing powers, no changes. Mm. Um, but police may want to add something to that. Yeah, thank you. All I will add to that is that um, depending on the situation, we have a number of other powers, as we know, which we would use depending on the, the allegations, whether it's under the Search Warrant Act or um, you know declaring a crime scene, depending on what it is. So this just forms um, one of many, I suppose, powers for us as an enforcement agency to use depending on the situation. And the, the language in this legislation reflects other similar legislation? Question mark? Um, do you want to answer that in yeah, yes it does. So um, it's been, as Tara said, the old approach was a bit sort of convoluted and you had to compare a couple of separate sections of POCTA to figure out what the powers were. And so this is an approach that's consistent with um, other modern legislation such as the Biosecurity Act. Um, touching on the poison issue again, which I've done a couple of times, but it's been suggested that the use of poison should be <clears throat> a restricted action in, in this Act. Um, can we touch on why that is and what would be the ramifications? Sorry, why it isn't a restricted Act and what would be the ramifications if it was? So the 
current um, poisoning of domestic animals has been carried across from the existing POCTA. So the intent... So specifically with feral animals? Oh, for feral animals. Um, so currently also the case is that pest control um, is not covered by that poisoning definition because it's specifically designed for um, people essentially purposely trying to poison domestic animals. Um, for instance, if someone had a parking dog next door and you have situations like that where people are trying to take um, the situation into their own hands. In terms of um, lethal baiting, um, the, in the intent is to continue to allow poisoning as a way of control of feral animals, um, mostly to pick up on the fact that they have a big impact on livestock and wildlife as well, so it's important to be able to manage those to mitigate those risks. Um, in terms of 1080 and other lethal baits, the um, APVMA registers those and the usage. Um, you need to follow them in um, line with labelling and with permits. The EPA is responsible for regulating that, including um, investigating any situations where there's um, off-target um, impacts. And it, I guess it's really important at this stage, until there's more effective means of control of those um, pest animals, that we continue to be able to have access to to lethal baiting as an option, along with a range of other options, particularly when you're looking at situations where these animals can be spread across large areas and difficult to access areas as well. So things like 1080 baiting are important in those situations. I'm happy to pass it on. Thank you. Got no. um, Honourable Peter Poulos, do you have any questions? I'm fine, Chair. Fine? I've got more. Okay. I might ask a couple if that's okay. Um, one of an item in our terms of reference is uh, relates to reducing and removing unnecessary regulation. Oh. We actually haven't had a lot of evidence on that particular matter. And I just wondered if you could um, let us know what what has been done in the draft that tries to achieve that. Um, so Clem might be able to give a little bit of detail on this. I will say that's um, absolutely our intent with this reform project is to reduce the complexity, reduce the confusion, um, have really clear provisions in there that are easy to understand and enforce um, in terms of specific things that might have been taken out or um, reduced duplication, I presume. Yeah, so I think it's more along the lines of reduced um, duplication and, and streamlining. So, um, so for example, cruelty, the proposed cruelty provision in the draft bill consolidates, I think, maybe about eight separate offences that are currently under POCTA into a single cruelty offence. So that sort of approach, as we were saying before, with the powers currently spread out all over the place, but bringing them together, <coughs> yeah, with, with the intent that um, it's more streamlined and it's easier for people to understand their obligations and easier to enforce as well. Uh, just in relation to compliance activities, this is, I do understand it's about gathering things from different places and pulling them into one act, but is there an actual kind of strategy behind how compliance should operate um, with one act? I'm talking about there are different agencies with different roles, and has that actually got a kind of strategy that underpins it all? Um, so I, I don't know if I should ask the police that, or. Yeah. Uh, well, um, Assistant Commissioner Greentree might like to add, but if, if your question is going to, um, are we intending on changing the enforcement arrangements? My answer would be no. So um, under the current arrangement, so this POCT obviously enforced by the um, enforcement agencies that Tara mentioned before, and then DPI does um, animal research and exhibited, and those are carried over um, in the same sort of status quo arrangement into the new draft bill. So they're pretty much, the, the current, the status quo is pretty much replicated in the draft bill? Yes, that's correct. Yep, and if I can just add to, add to that, um, Police, Animal Welfare League, RSPCA, they all work really well together. Um, so there's, you know, um, always improving their information sharing um, and uh, probably best for the police to, to speak to this point, but, um, you know, that is um, an arrangement that works well from DPI's perspective. Is it, uh, I mean, just taking that as an example, is it, would it be fair to say that arrangement is not 40 years old, it's just been evolving over 40 years? Yeah, that's right. It's not broken, so it's carried forward into the new 
skill. Yeah. And um, I mean, both DPI and the enforcement agencies are always looking at ways of improving the way that we all work together. Um, we talk very often, um, and you know, they've been a, a critical part of the targeted consultation that we've undertaken up until this point to ensure that we're developing laws that are actually enforceable um, and yeah, that there aren't unintended consequences um, in the draft bill. I will just say on that point um, that this is a first draft of the bill. Um, so this is a, a slightly unusual process in that we've provided a draft, the first draft of the bill to the committee and we didn't have the opportunity to do the, the normal targeted consultation that we would do before we published a draft bill for public consultation. So. Um, we're, we're aware that there's been some evidence around some possible unintended consequences or issues that we might need to have another look at um, and refine the proposals. And that's that's certainly what our intention is here, that um, you know this process has been a good way to elicit feedback from stakeholders. And we'll definitely be looking at the feedback that's been provided on the draft bill, and in particular, ensuring that any unintended consequences that have been identified are addressed in the next version of the bill. Can I say thank you for this innovative approach that you've taken um, because I think the committee appreciates being able to play a role in this um, and it might perhaps become clearer to members as we're sort of working our way through this that actually it's not a bill in Parliament to be attacked in the way that you might normally do it but we're actually having the privilege of being involved at a much earlier stage. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so over the last couple of days, one of the issues has, that has been raised regard, relates to the objects of the Act. It's actually to do with, um, and the objects as I see, to promote the welfare of animals and to prevent cruelty to animals. People talk about uh, education actually is quite a critical element in um, uh, better uh, welfare outcomes for animals in New South Wales. And Section 4 talks about how, how objects are to be achieved. So if I could just ask, those three and four, is there a, a view that we should include something around education and, um, and just how would you see that or envisage that happening? Um, so definitely agree that education and also training are important parts of ensuring um, the continuous improvement in animal welfare um, as well as compliance with the laws. So um, yeah, definitely agree that education is important. I think it would be unusual to prescribe anything about education in legislation. Like that is definitely part of DPI's role and the enforcement agency's roles and a number of other players in the animal welfare space. Um, it's very important and it's something that we'll continue to do, um, particularly off the back of hopefully soon having new animal welfare laws that we fully intend to have a, you know, a community education and awareness campaign to make sure that people do understand what the requirements are and why and how they can I suppose, comply with those requirements. So certainly important, um, but I'm not sure that we would support having that prescribed. I'm not sure what that would look like um, if it was inserted into the bill. Uh, Ms Blake, do, do you know of any other jurisdiction that would have that in uh, the objects, or have um, education and training in the objects? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, you're testing my memory. I'll have to take that on notice. Take it on notice, that's fine. I like to test people's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, Just a quick uh, question of clarification that the bill that we're, the draft bill that we're looking at is 2021. Uh, there's one that's been posted on your website that is 2022 and I guess we just wanted to confirm that that's the same version. Yes, uh, yeah, it's the same one. Um, I think one, one was a product that was um, provided to the committee, I think at the very end of last year. Yes. Um, and then uh, the Parliamentary Council just updated the year for publishing it um, this year. It's the same bill. So uh, would it be helpful if we think of it as the 2022 bill? That's your advice. Okay, yes. thank you. Right. I was just going to pick up, and then I'll leave it to Emma, I'll just pick up on the education thing. There is an act that prescribes education. Um, it's the, the, tra the Transport Act actually prescribes education to other uh, local councils who are doing the, the maintenance of roads. So that might potentially be a way that you actually describe that you know, regular updates, regular education needs to happen to RSPCA, Animal Welfare Lead, or even the breeding associations or peak bodies. That might be a way of, I guess, cod codifying that there needs to be a regular I guess, education. So that might, not a question, but more of a, a, 
a comment to maybe assist how that might work. Um, probably also just worth, worth mentioning that the bill and the regs and the standards even aren't silent on education and training. That is a really important part of um, requirements for, um, and that is codified for certain um, people who work with animals in different contexts. So it's not entirely silent. Um, difficult though as, at a high level, but happy to have a look at what Transport have done. Um, thank you. Um, I've just got another follow-up question uh, for Ms Harris um, in regards to proposed sections 38 and 39 with the animal cruelty material. Um, I guess I'm just trying to understand if you're aware that it will have that sort of real muting effect um, and stop um, cases actually coming to the attention of the authorities, what the actual legal benefit would be if if it actually closes an avenue of animal cruelty becoming publicly available and aware? Um, so I would say that obviously it's not the intent to close close that avenue and as... as well, it'll have that effect. Yeah, it's just sure, the unintended sure. consequence yeah. of it. Yeah, no, don't understand. Um, so as, as Tara said, we didn't get the chance to sort of do targeted consultation on this and explore any of the unintended consequences. So. Um, if, if that issue was addressed, if that was provided for somehow in an exemption, um, I do still think there's value in having the provision. Um, as I said, there's uh, it would hopefully act as a deterrent for people making, at, so separate to the example that you gave, but people who do um, film examples of animal cruelty um, for, you know, we've, we've heard some strange examples from the RSPCA, but people like swallowing goldfish and spreading videos and that as sort of a trying to incite other people to do it. So again, um, if it was if the suspected offence didn't meet that uh, mental element that's in the Crimes Act offence, then um, the, the intent is that this, there's an alternative verdict provision and that this, this offence could be relied upon. I'm just wondering if, um, like I suppose, and, and, and I guess this is sort of me hypothesising rather than sort of having the evidence, that the act of filming it may not necessarily be the legal issue. Um, that, that that person may swallow the goldfish anyway if they're at a party and they're drunk and that the act, the fact that they filmed it and the RSPCA now has this footage means that they got caught. Um, whereas, and so if we're using that as an example to say, well, we want to stop them from filming those videos, um, is the actual filming themselves committing acts of animal cruelty the problem? And if we make it illegal, for the, if people then get the word out, don't do like do what you're go, going to do at your party or whatever, but don't film it. That that will again have that muting effect. And I'm just wondering, is the act of cruelty the issue? The fact that it was filmed in and of itself. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm just trying to understand yep. the reasoning behind the provision when there's no sort of. Um, yep. Hmm. Um, so I think that obviously, as, as I think you're pointing out, the, the cruelty offence is a problem. But if people are um, making videos of themselves doing such acts of cruelty and, you know, they go around on TikTok and could inspire other people to, you know, pick up the same TikTok challenge or, or something like that. So that's definitely something that we would want to deter as well as, you know, obviously the initial acts of cruelty. Clearly the intention is important. Yeah, that's right. And I think we understand the line of your questioning. So happy to have a look at that and um, see if there's some amendments that we might need to make to, to clear that up. Thank you. Um, and my other question um, was just about the further draft of this bill. Um, I mean, we've sort of been talking about how much work this is a, as a committee as well. Um, and I know that um, I think, uh, Ms. Buck, you mentioned that you are going to go away and create a further draft. Um, is that sort of also going to consider something that was brought up a lot by a lot of different groups. There was the concern about the fact that they hadn't seen the regulations, but there was also um, certain groups that were saying that even if they saw the regulations, that they still have those concerns because regulations can so easily change. And that was kind of across the board as well. There was animal protection groups, but also New South Wales Farmers Federation and other groups that were talking about the uncertainty of moving a lot of the legislation to regulations. Um, and that even in the future, even if they've seen the regulations and people are happy with them, that in the future they could change very, very easily. Um, and so I'm just wondering how that will be addressed and whether the further draft of this legislation will include some of that feedback and maybe 
add some of the legislation back in where it used to be? Yeah, um, I suppose the only answer I can give to that at this point is that um, we'll welcome the committee's feedback on that um, and consider your advice on that matter. Obviously, um, we've been working on this project for a few years now, so we are very keen to see it through to fruition um, and to make sure that stakeholders understand it and are comfortable with it and we've addressed any unintended consequences. So I suppose it depends on um, We'll have to consider you know, the feedback that's come through this process um, and the submissions that have been made to figure out um, what further amendments might be needed and then what further consultation on those amendments might be needed. So that's going to be one of the challenges here is that some stakeholders have suggested that we change things to go in one direction and we need to test that with other stakeholders as well. So. I suppose it depends on how much changes are needed that will drive how much time is needed um, and how these things line up. Um, and as I said, we're very committed to seeing this through. Um, it's, it has been a few years in the making and we can see the finish line, I suppose. But um, yeah, important to get it right and to make sure that stakeholder input and public consultation um, is taken on board um, before we, we finalise this project. Can I just on that? come back to this issue of the name of the bill again because in our terms of reference we're reviewing the proposed exposure draft animal warfare bill 2021. It is going to be confusing that your website now has changed it to 2022 and could also ask you to consider that when you do update it, it will be 2022 so I don't know what you'll call it but you'll end up with two 2022 bills and maybe it would be easier not to update the name and just stick with where we were. If you could think about that anyway, you don't have to answer that, that now. That, that makes sense. We might just have to check with Parliamentary Council's office what their advice is, but I, I think that is a good suggestion. Thank you. Um, can I just go to a couple of, couple of other issues that were raised in relation to sort of over, overlaps or duplications? Um, or lack of, do, no, I'm not going to try and, and put these two issues together. I'm going to do one at a time. The first one is the GWIC code. Um, potential duplication with some of the provisions in the new bill. Um, there was some concerns expressed that that was either unnecessary or confusing or could actually have a different um, meaning in the context of the bill than it does in the code. Um, can I ask GWIC what your views are in relation to um, how they interact and whether there is that, whether it is a problem, I guess? Um, well, GWIC as the regulator for the greyhound racing industry um, does so through a, a number of different instruments, whether it be the, the greyhound racing rules, the greyhound racing act or the code. It's um, the case that the participants to whom we regulate are aware of our rules, they're aware of our code. Um, we don't um, consider there any issues with the duplication. Um, it's been the case that with our rules, with our regulations, with our code, we've gone through a fairly rigorous consultation phase with our participants. So we see mm. our um, legislative instruments or policies as complementary to the, to the current suite of, of other parts of legislation. Okay, thank you, that's really helpful. And the second thing, was in relation to the um, Animal Research Act and the witnesses we had this morning who were saying that they would prefer and it would be much simpler for them if they just had the Animal Research Act as a standalone um, and further that the, um, I guess, the incorporation of provisions from the ARA into this bill were not comprehensive or didn't perhaps left some things behind. Um, what's your response to that? Um, so I think we might have mentioned that with both exhibited animals and animal research broadly, our plan is to roll over the existing requirements uh, into the new laws. So um, appreciate that that also means that we are moving some information from the Act into the regulation. Um, as I said, that will be things like licensing conditions and fees and those more administrative matters that um, our intention there was to just make it a bit more flexible so that, um, yeah, that those types of administrating, administrative um, provisions can be changed you know, as, as needed. Um, 
In terms of um, you know the merging of three three acts into one, um, I'm not sure that I heard any evidence this morning that was specifically about that that would um, cause confusion or um, sort of diminish any of the the existing requirements as long as they were rolled over. But um, I think there were there were two concerns. One was that. It hadn't necessarily been all brought over, but as you say, maybe some of it's now going to be in regulation. That's right. Yeah. The second point um, that at least one of the witnesses made was it's good to have a single point where you can go to find everything you need to know. Um, so I guess in terms of this whole legislative project being about simplifying and making it easier for people to understand the legislation, if something that is quite standalone in animal research would you reconsider perhaps leaving the Animal Research Act as it, as it is? Yeah, I think interesting too that um, that was actually our intention was to have it all in one place and um, the evidence this morning was actually having it in, I suppose, two separate places does make it easier um, and yeah, I suppose clearer to understand. Um, again, I'd probably point to happy to take on board the committee's views and feedback about that um, and obviously we heard that evidence this morning as well so that is something that we can have another look at but our intention in combining it into one bill was to streamline and modernise and make the requirements consistent where they can be um, but yeah happy to, to take on board that feedback and have another look at that as well. Thank you. If I just on that one point that was made was that having it in one bill means that you need to be a series of exemptions for, for general clauses. Um, would those items need to be exempted anyway if it was a standalone bill, or would you just exempt um, sort of accredited um, research facilities? Yeah, that's right. Um, Suze might be able to expand on this, but there is currently an exemption under the Animal Research Act from POCTA, and so that, that kind of arrangement would continue. That would be would the continue. way of avoiding having to go through each provision doing an exemption. Yes, yeah, so it was essentially carrying over what's existing provisions in the current legislation in terms of the exemptions, particularly between Animal Research and the Pre Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. So the, uh, coming back to um, streamlining and re reducing and removing, I guess the suggestion was from them this would actually have the opposite effect. It would make things more difficult. So anyway, but we'll um, obviously be looking at how we can give that feedback. I just wondered if, from your perspective, if it made things any easier, if there was any benefit. Uh, I'm not sure what the enforcement agency's views on this were. They're obviously an important stakeholder and, and having it all in one place, I think you could argue, makes it easier for them um, and to have a consistent set of powers. Um, but I'm not sure if police would like Did, to comment. I don't think the um, RSPC officer breaking into the puppy farm is also tomorrow going to be going into Sydney University Medical Research. And compliance activities surely aren't being done by the same people. They're not, but I think also the aspect of it is around getting a consistency of approach because the three different acts have different powers and um, different uh, compliance. So for instance, I think in the Animal Research Act at the moment, it doesn't, uh, they don't have um, penalty infringement notices there. So it was to get consistency of approach around the powers and the compliance tools available to compliance officers so that they're consistent um, across animal welfare, whereas at the moment, they're not. So we've had um, evidence from people who uh, object to certain practices in research and would like to see those practices kind of um, eliminated. Um, but we actually haven't had evidence of accredited programs that are being oversighted by ethics committees committing any offences. Um, and I guess I just wondered, is that your experience too, that there is actually quite good compliance? Or are you aware that Medic, not medic, um, the use of animals in, in research, accredited programs, is that, is, is there an issue with them breaching and committing offences or is it? It's my understanding not, so the department has a, does the compliance and enforcement including 
So I guess I then have audits. to ask, are we solving a problem that doesn't exist? Well, I think, and I think the evidence this morning was that it's the Animal Research Act and is very strong and it's very supported by the industry. Um, and I think it's because it has a strong set of rules. So the department uh, accredits establishments. Um, it also accredits the use of um, supplying animal research. Yep. Um, generally, the establishments are required to have an, have an animal ethics committee. Um, the legislation prescribes how the ethics committees are structured so that there's a good balance of people sitting on those. And it's the ethics committees that then um, assess and approve the research authorities and they also have a responsibility to, to investigate issues and monitor the research. So it's a co-regulatory framework really that the department as the enforcer and, and compliance but also the establishment and the Animal Ethics Committee have a role as well. I do understand. I just can't see what the benefit is of consolidating it into bigger act. Okay. I can't see the benefit. So just. Um, I can't see that compliance activities are at all the same people or the same kind of type of activity. I don't know. So yes, in terms of who would be undertaking the compliance, that's the case. I think, as I said before, I guess in terms of bringing it all together was um, to consolidate the aspects of um, the powers available and the different compliance areas. Okay. But as Tara mentioned, I guess we can have a look at is yep. there benefit in moving it into a separate piece of legislation and carrying over those um, benefits of the review and the um, sure. getting no, the consistency you. of approach across the different animal welfare areas. Thanks to giving your perspective. Well, can, I, can I just follow on that? So, I guess for clarification, so did, you, did we bring a bit with POCTA, we carried across into this new bill, the whole heap of the elements. We, how much of the animal research legislation did we carry across the whole lot, or were there bits that we didn't bring across to this new, new framework? We've carried across the substantive areas around um, the requirements for licensing for animal research mm. and um, for committees, um, and then some aspects that would, are currently sitting in the Animal Research Act will be in the intent is to have them carried over into the regulation. Just one more on that. University of Western Sydney specifically raised the issue that they didn't want to have any gap if there was a change in Act. Do you have thoughts about that? Given that our intent is to carry over, the, 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 unless there's room for improvement, we don't think there'll be a gap. Also, because as Tara mentioned earlier, the intent is that we'll be initiating the Act when the regulations are in place as well. So the whole legislative framework in terms of the Act and the regulation will come on at once. We're also looking at carrying over the existing mandatory standards that sit within the three different pieces of legislation as an interim measure um, to carry those over so they'll remain mandatory standards as they are now and then we'll be reviewing that standards framework um, is the sort of phase three after the regulations to look at um, that framework and what other standards may need to be considered to be mandatory and reviewing those existing standards as well. Is there any um, Sorry, if I can just add, I think I think this is one that we'll need to take away and have another look at, and then perhaps provide some further information to the committee on just to check um, that reflect on the feedback mm. that we've heard this cool. morning. Obviously, as we said, our intention here is to streamline and modernise things. If it's going to have the opposite effect and it's going to cause confusion or unintended consequences, then that is not what we are aiming to do. So, um, but I just would like the opportunity to just take that away and reflect on that a little bit and perhaps provide some further information back. Yes, no, that's fine. Can I, can I, one of the things, and I, I'm not wedded to this, this is just something that's come through my own mind. Um, they seem pretty convinced this morning, the researchers, that I just like to have that legislation very clear in the title, that's what they go to. I mean, one of the other options is you have a division of the bill just for animal research or you have a, a reg just for animal research, so they still go to the animal research regulation of this particular bill. What, there's pros and cons of that, and I know it might sound a bit messy, but look, that's something if it's part of the, part of the streamlining process, maybe that's why you're doing it. Yeah, I think that's something we'll take a look at and come back to you on. In relation to the regulation and the idea that it, it could be one piece of work, which is, which is great, uh, just in terms, though, of enacting it, um, I guess, 
is it, is it your fault that the whole thing happens at the same time? Because it just means that the slowest is the slowest sentence in that massive document is going to determine the timing for the entire rest of the regulation. Um, so I'm not sure if we've got an idea of how long the regulation is going to be, but it is. Um, it's this could it be proclaimed in in seriatim? I mean, I know that's a bill, a clauses of the bill. I don't know how you. So we are planning to do that with the standards. Obviously, if we were to sort of review and remake all of the standards that sit below the reg, we would never turn this act on because that's exactly. a continuous process. So um, we can definitely have a look at it. I think. Um, there are some things that we can sort of just refer as a, you know, transitions and savings. Then we can we can have a look at that as well. If if that's going to save time, probably we just need to think about whether that would actually save any time. If it is just a repli replication of what we have now, we can probably move those parts forward pretty quickly. But happy to consider that um, as part of the process as well. Thank you. Can I just um, this morning um, we tested. Well, Discussed uh, the aggravated cruelty provisions within the bill, um, and there were I just can't like for the life of me, I can't remember really which submission, but there was um, discussion around the escalation, the process of escalating to aggravated cruelty. Also, uh, people who intentionally, so premeditation, for instance. Um, if, is there any reason why we didn't include those elements in the bill? And are they something that could be considered as a part of, it, particularly in this morning's evidence? Yep. Um, so. The offences that are in the bill, as is the case in Pocta, are mostly strict liability offences, so they don't have that mental element nor the requirement to prove it in court. Um, I would just point out, though, the Crimes Act is where the more serious animal cruelty offences sit, and that's um, a reckless animal cruelty or with the intent, um, intent element that you're talking about there. So the way that we've structured the offence provisions in this bill is um, to escalate, so from you know you have a minimum care requirement offence. If the impact on the animal is more severe, then it's cruelty, and it's aggravated cruelty, and it's uh, reckless animal cruelty, and then intentional animal cruelty. Can I just clarify, uh, just just from from that um, mental element, adding a mental element to aggravated cruelty would be very difficult to prove in court. Mm -hmm. Is that your understanding as well? Like it would actually make aggravated cruelty even more difficult and, and obviously and I'm sure I'm assuming this would have come across your table is how difficult it is already prosecute for animal cruelty because animals can't speak they're not witnesses um, and so it's always going to be a difficult court case to have but adding more difficulties such as a mental element to aggravated cruelty would make that even yeah. more difficult is that right yes yes that's right so the conversations we had um, with RSPCA obviously around enforceability of the provisions and <laughs> yes um, I think their advice was uh, with the strict liability offences in Procter, that, that's what works well for them. Um, and as I said, we'll have the alternative verdict provisions. So, provisions. so if... Um, yeah, so things can go down. Yeah, which is really good. I'm really happy with that element. Without getting into a big discussion about different methods of artificial insemination, <laughs> it does seem to have spent a lot more time on it than I think we imagined that we would. And I just wondered if you could give us your take on what's going on with all of that and why this is, and because what's happened now is stakeholders have seen that we've been discussing that and so now people are going to make sure that their views on it isn't. Can you just put us in the clear about where that is and if that's still in the bill or not? Sure. After exposure bill. Yeah. So happy to talk through the process and maybe the timeline a little bit of how that has appeared and um, into the draft bill, so... Can I just, sorry, can I just clarify? Only to the extent that we need to know about it. Sure. We're not inquiring into how this happened. Okay, not, sure, sure. We're um, not so, obsessed with this issue at all. So this wasn't a proposal that we specifically tested in the discussion paper that we put out, but it did come up through a number of the stakeholder submissions to the, to the discussion paper. So we um, put it into the draft bill because those submissions sounded like they had merit and so we put it in there to test it. As I said before, this is a bit of an unusual process where ordinarily and with more time we would have done the rounds of um, some further stakeholder consultation. We just didn't have the opportunity to do that. So, And on top of that, a, a number of the stakeholders were pretty keen to see a draft bill. You know, Commenting on draft discussion papers and proposals um, is good, but people want to see what 
is spelled out in draft legislation. So um, it appeared for the first time to some stakeholders in the draft bill. Um, and so there was a fair bit of um, social media attention and some concerns from stakeholders raised about that. So that's the point at which the minister um, met with a range of different stakeholders and, and formed the view that um, that provision, which was to change cervical AI from being a restricted act of veterinary science, which it is currently, to being banned, a prohibited act. So that was the proposed change. Um, what the minister has said is that we will not be making that change. So surgical AI will remain a restricted act of veterinary science and that position is supported by um, a number of stakeholders. Okay, I think I'm getting this. And so, of course, that's the current position. It's been easier just to take it out because as long as it's there, it's going to give the opposite impression. That's right. And so this draft bill that's now on the website perhaps reflects that change. So the draft bill that's on the website, is there is only one version of the draft bill that exists. Yep. So the version that is before up, the committee up, and on the website version. proposes to um, change it from a restricted act to a prohibited act. What we're saying is we will not be making that change and it will remain a restricted act of veterinary science, which is the status quo. Right. So the, just for us, um, would we say that the draft bill that we're reviewing has it in it mm. or doesn't have it in it? Or do we, I mean, that's fine it, if it's in it, we just note that it's going to be right. removed. That's so, very easily dealt with. So the change has been made since we published the draft bill and we haven't updated the draft okay, bill. So we might treat it in that manner if you're happy with that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, further questions? From... So the next version of the bill will clarify what we're proposing to, yes, right. to do going forward. Absolutely, absolutely. And we, we know where we stand in relation to all of that. Is there any chance of, and you can say that if you like, but is there any chance of taking on notice and giving us a very rough guideline of a timeline for those regulations in the next draft? Um, yeah, definitely happy to provide you with any additional information that might be helpful. We can have a go at a draft timeline and um, at the very least a process. Um, that would be really useful. Yeah. To a certain degree it does depend on what the interim report says and how the government might respond to that. But yeah, definitely happy to, to give you our best estimate of what the process would look like from here. Thank you. So the evidence we've taken so far um, reflects the stakeholders that made submissions to our inquiry. Do you think that there are issues in the bill that we should be looking at but they haven't actually come up? Um, matters that the government feels that it could be a benefit for the committee to look at? What are we missing? Um, so I'm not sure if Clem has any thoughts on this one, it, but I do agree that the evidence that's been provided to the committee at the hearings at least is um, a slice of the feedback that we've um, heard on the discussion paper and through the submissions on the draft bill. So I wouldn't say that the, the kind of evidence in the hearings is, a, is the full picture of, um, of everybody's feedback on, I mean, the, the bill is, I'm not sure how many pages long. It's pretty long. There's a lot in there. Yes. As I said earlier, a lot of the comments and feedback that we've received on it are actually raising issues with the existing laws rather than the changes that we're proposing, which has been an interesting and I suppose surprising um, feature to us. Is there a guide to what the changes are? Um, so the discussion paper that we put out last year is a very good plain English overview of what is what at that point was proposed to be in the bill and why. Um, as we just spoke about surgical AI, there are a small number of um, new things that were added between the discussion paper and the draft bill as a result of stakeholder feedback. But broadly, the discussion paper is a really good kind right. of, yeah, guide to what's in the bill. And as I said, if there's any further information that would be helpful, we're very happy to provide that to the committee um, in terms of plain English explanations or um, additional information to, to help understand what's in there. Can I just add to that? So, um, as Tara said, you've heard a, a lot, a lot of different views in the hearings, and also you've got some comprehensive submissions made to the um, inquiry web mm. website. Um, we also did publish a consultation and outcomes report last year, um, or this this year, sorry, early this year, which summarises the feedback that we had on those twenty key proposals that 
um, other key changes that have gone into the bill. So um, as part of the consultation, the public consultation on that, we had uh, I think about 4,800 submissions. Um, you know, lots of them said, said the same sorts of things. So we've drawn out the themes, the types of feedback um, in that report, and that's on the DPI website. That's on the website. Thank you very much. Is there anything in relation to the evidence that we've received that you would want to add comment to? Might let the others go first on that one. No. 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 I think so. Thank you. No. Okay, sorry, did you want to ask another question? There might have been someone. Anything further? That is. That is time to a T. Um, well, on that basis, can I thank all of your witnesses for coming forward? Say, as a committee, we really value this opportunity um, to be to be involved in reviewing legislation before the concrete has hardened. Um, and I think there are many views around this table, and we're all appreciative of that opportunity and trying to be constructive in our approach. And, and look forward to putting some thoughts through to you by the end of May. Thank you for the challenge. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'll close the hearing for today. If there are any